Chapter 15, Part 5 of A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Sutton. A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 2 by John Bagnell Burry. Chapter 15, Part 5. First Punic War of Dionysus. When his preparations were complete, Dionysus went forth to do what no Greek leader in Sicily had ever done before. He went forth, not merely to deliver Greek cities from Phoenician rule, but to conquer Phoenician Sicily itself. Marching along the south coast, he was hailed as a deliverer by the Greek dependencies of Carthage, both by the tributary towns Gela and Camarina and the subject town of Acragas. Thermot on the northern coast likewise joined him, and of the two Elemian towns, Eryx received his overtures, while Segesta remained faithful to her Punic mistress. At the head of a host, which for a Greek army seems immense, 80,000 foot, it is said, and more than 3,000 horse, Dionysus advanced to test his new siege engines on the walls of Moitia. This city, which now for the first and for the last time becomes the center of a memorable episode in history, was like the original Syracuse, an island town. But, Though it was joined to the mainland by a causeway, the town did not like Syracuse spread to the mainland. It was surrounded entirely by a wall, of which traces still remain, and the bay in which it lay was protected on the seaside by a long spit of land. The men of Moitia were determined to withstand the invader to the uttermost, and the first measure they took was to insulate themselves completely by breaking down the causeway which bound them to the mainland. Thus they hoped that Dionysus would have to trust entirely to his ships to conduct the siege, and that he would be unable to make use of his artillery. But they knew not the enterprise of Dionysus, nor the excellence of his engineer department. The tyrant was determined to assault the city from solid ground, and to bring his terrible engines close to the walls. He set the crews of his ships to the work of building a mole far greater than the causeway which the Moitians had destroyed. The ships themselves, which he did not destine to play any part in the business of the siege, he drew up on the northern coast of the bay. The mole of Dionysus at Moitia forestalls a more famous mole, which we shall hereafter see erected by a greater than Dionysus at another Phoenician island town, older and more illustrious than Moitia. While the mole was being built, Dionysus made expeditions in the neighborhood. He won over the Sissons from their Carthaginian allegiance, and he laid siege to Eleman, Segesta, and Campanian, and Tella. Both these cities repelled his attacks, and leaving them under blockade, he returned to Moitia when the solid bridge was completed. In the meantime, Carthage was preparing an effort to rescue the menace city. She tried to cause a diversion by sending a few galleys to Syracuse, and some damage was caused to ships that were lying in the Great Harbor. But Dionysus was not to be diverted from his enterprise. He had doubtless foreseen such an attempt to lure him away, and knew that there was no real danger. Himilco, the Carthaginian general, seeing that Dionysus was immovable, sailed with a large force to Moitia, and entered the bay, with the purpose of destroying the Syracusan fleet, which was drawn up on the shore. Dionysus seems to have been taken by surprise. For whatever reason, he made no attempt to launch his galleys. He merely placed archers and slingers on those ships which would be first attacked. But he brought his army round to the peninsula which forms the western side of the bay, and on the shores of this strip of land he placed his new engines. The catapults hurled deadly volleys of stones upon Hamilco's ships, and the novelty of these crushing missiles, which they were quite unprepared to meet, utterly disconcerted the Punic sailors, and the Carthaginians retreated. Then Dionysus, who was no less ready to treat earth as water than to turn sea into land, laid wooden rollers across the neck of land which formed the northern side of the bay, and hauled his whole fleet into the open sea. But Hamilco did not tarry to give him battle there. He went back to Carthage, and the men of Moitia were left unaided to abide their fate. As the site of the island city required a special road of approach, so its architecture demanded a special device of assault. Since the space in the city was limited, its wealthy inhabitants had to seek dwelling room by raising high towers into the air, and to attack these towers, Dionysus constructed siege towers of corresponding heights, with six stories, which he moved up to near the walls and wheels. These wooden belfries, as they were called in the Middle Ages, were not a new invention, but they had never perhaps been built to such a height before. And it is not till the Macedonian age, which Dionysus in so many ways foreshadows, that they came into common use. It was a strange sight to see the battle waged in midair. The defenders of the stone towers had one advantage. They were able to damage some of the wooden towers of the enemy by lighted brands and pitch. 
But the arrangements of Dionysus were so well ordered that this device wrought little effect, and the Phoenicians could not stand on the wall which was swept by his catapults while the rams battered it below. Presently a breach was made, and the struggle began in earnest. The Moitians had no thought of surrender. Dauntless to the end, they defended their streets and houses inch by inch. Missiles rained on the heads of the Greeks, who thronged through, and each of the lofty houses had to be besieged like a miniature town. The wooden towers were wheeled within the walls. From their topmost stories, bridges were flung across to the upper stories of the houses, and in the face of the desperate inhabitants, the Greek soldiers rushed across these dizzy ways, often to be flung down into the street below. At night, the combat ceased. Both besiegers and besieged rested. The issue was indeed certain, for however bravely the Moitians might fight, they were far outnumbered. But day after day, the fighting went on in the same way, and Moitia was not taken. The losses on the Greek side were great, and Dionysus became impatient. Accordingly, he planned a night assault, which the Moitians did not look for, and this was successful. By means of ladders, a small band entered the part of the town which was still defended and then admitted the rest of the army through a gate. There was a short and sharp struggle, which soon became a massacre. The Greeks had no thought of plunder. They thought only of vengeance. Now, for the first time, a Phoenician town had fallen into their hands, and they resolved to do it as the Phoenicians had done to Greek cities. They remembered how Hannibal had dealt with Himera. At length, Dionysus stayed the slaughter, which was not to his mind, since every corpse was a captive less to be sold. Then the victors turned to spoil the city and its wealth was abandoned to them, without any reserve. All the prisoners were sold into slavery, except some Greek mercenaries, whose treachery to the Hellenic cause was expiated by the death of crucifixion. A Sicil garrison was left in the captured city. After this achievement, the like of which had not been wrought before in Sicilian history, Dionysus retired for the winter to Syracuse. Next spring he marched forth again to press the siege of Segesta, which was still under blockade. In the meantime, the fall of Moitia had awakened Carthage into action. She saw that she must bestir herself if she was not to let her whole Sicilian dominion slip out of her hands. Himilco was appointed Shafet and entrusted with the work of saving Punic Sicily. He collected a force, which seems to have been at least as large as that which Dionysus had brought into the field, and set sail with sealed orders for Panormus. A small portion of the armament was sunk by Leptines, brother of Dionysus, who was in command of the Syracusan fleet but the main part disembarked in safety, and then events happened in rapid succession, which are hard to explain. Hamilco first gains possession of Eryx by treason, then he marches to Moitia and captures it, and then Moitia is lost. Dionysus raises the siege of Segesta and returns to Syracuse. The loss of Eryx could not be provided against, but it is hard to discern why Dionysus should have made no attempt to relieve Moitia, whose capture had cost him so much the year before or why he should have allowed the Carthaginian army to march from Panormus to Eryx and Moitia without attempting to intercept it. He could not have more effectually pressed the siege of Segesta than by dealing a decided check to Himilco. Not knowing the exact circumstances, not knowing even the number of the two armies, we can hardly judge his action. But it may be suspected that Dionysus was by nature a man who did not care to risk a pitched battle unless the advantage were distinctly on his own side. It is to be remembered that he won nearly all his successes by sieges and surprises, by diplomacy and craft, and that the names of his great military innovator is not associated with a single famous battle in the open field. When he had once allowed Moitia to be taken, his retreat is not surprising, for he had no base in the western part of the island, and we are told that his supplies were failing. He had now lost all that he had won in his first campaign. Moitia, however, was wiped out as a Phoenician city though it was not to be a Greek or Sicil stronghold. Himilco, instead of restoring the old colony, founded a new city hard by to take its place. On the promontory of the island, which forms the south side of the Moitian Bay, arose the city of Lilybium, which was henceforth to be the great stronghold of Carthaginian power in the west of the island. The sea washed two sides of the town, and the walls of the other two sides were protected by enormous ditches cut in the rock. The history of Lilybium is the continuation of the history of Moitia, but it was not destined to be taken either by a Greek or a Roman besieger. Having driven the invader from Phoenician Sicily, and having laid the foundation of a new city, Himilco resolved to carry his arms into the lands of the enemy, and to attack Syracuse itself. But he did not go directly against Syracuse. Before he attempted that mighty fortress, he would try the easier task of capturing Messena. The fall of this city would be a grievous blow to Hellas, and it would be no mean vengeance for the fall of Moitia. The walls of Messena had been allowed to fall into decay, 
and the place was an easy prey for the Carthaginians. But the greater part of the inhabitants escaped into fortresses in the neighboring hills. The Carthaginian general had to wreak his vengeance on the stones. He raised the walls and the edifices, and the work was done so well that no man, we are told, would have recognized the site. If the triumphant demolition of the Sicilian city, which watched the strait, was a sore blow to the Hellenic cause, Himilco sought at the same moment to deal another blow to that cause by the foundation of a new Sicilian city in another place. It was his policy to cultivate the friendship of the Sicils and to foment the dislike which they felt towards the lord of Syracuse. Dionysus, too, had sought to win influence over the native race, and we saw how he gave them the territory of Naxos. The Carthaginian general grasped at that idea of erecting a new town for these very Sicils of Naxos, on the heights of the Taurus, which rise above the old site. Such was the strange origin of the strong city of Torimenian, with its two rock citadels, one of the fairest sites in Sicily. It was the second foundation of Himilco in the same year, and both his foundations were destined signally to prosper. Lilybium became more famous than Moitia, and Torimenian has had a greater place in history than Naxos. As a founder of cities, Himilco was a high title to fame. He was, like Dionysus, a creator as well as a destroyer. The creation of new cities and the destruction of old by Greeks and Phoenicians alike was a characteristic feature of this epic. Dionysus was preparing in the meantime to protect Syracuse. He committed the command of the fleet, which appears to have been now about 200 strong, to his brother Leptines, and fleet and army together moved northward to Catane. In the waters near the shore of Catane, a naval battle was fought, and the Greek armament was defeated with great loss. It was indeed far outnumbered by the fleet of the Phoenicians, who also used their transport vessels as warships. But the cause of the disaster was the bad generalship of Leptines, who did not keep his ships together. The rout was witnessed by Dionysus from the shore, and it might have been retrieved by a victory on the land. Hamilco and his army had not yet arrived on the scene, for an eruption of Etna had made the direct road impassable and forced them to make a long detour. Dionysus again shrank from risking a battle, though the men of Sicily were eager to fight. He retreated to the walls of Syracuse. This city was the last bulwark of Greek Sicily, and with it the cause of Greek civilization was in jeopardy. It was a moment at which the Siciliots might well sue for help from their fellow Greeks, beyond the sea. Dionysus dispatched messages to Italy, to Corinth, and to Sparta, imploring urgently for succor. It was not long before the victorious Carthaginian fleet sailed into the great harbor, and the Carthaginian army encamped hard by, along the banks of the Anapus. The mass of the host encamped as well as it could in the swamp, but the general pitched his tent on the high ground of Polycna, within the precinct of the Olympian Zeus. This insult to the religion of Hellas was followed up by a more awful sacrilege when Himilco pillaged the temple of Demeter and Kor on the southern slope of Epopoli. When the barbarians began to perish in the plague-stricken marsh, the pestilence was imputed to the divine vengeance for these acts of outrage. The besiegers must have sat for no brief space before the walls of Syracuse. The messengers of Dionysus had time to reach the Peloponnesus and return with Sikor, 30 ships under a Lacedonian admiral. Hamilco had time to build three forts to protect his army and his fleet, one near his own quarters at Polycna, one at Descon on the western shore of the harbor, and one at Plamirion. After the arrival of the auxiliaries, the capture of a Punic corn ship was the occasion of a small naval combat in the harbor. Only a few of the Carthaginian ships were engaged, and the Syracusans were victorious. Within the town, there was deep dissatisfaction with Dionysus and his conduct of the war, and the citizens thought that they might reckon on the sympathy of their Peloponnesian allies with an attempt to cast off the tyrant's yoke. At an assembly, which the tyrant convened, the feeling of dissatisfaction broke openly forth, and the lord of Syracuse could not only read in the faces, but hear in the words of the citizens the depth of their hatred. But the movement of the revolution was checked by the Peloponnesians, who said that their business was to help Dionysus against the Carthaginians, not to help the Syracusans against Dionysus. So the danger passed over. But the tyrant had a warning, and he put on winning manners and accorded popularity. The deadly airs of the swamp in the burning heat of summer were doing their work. The army of Hamilco was ravaged by pestilence. Soon the soldiers fell so fast that they could not be buried. The hour had now come for the men of the city to complete the destruction which their fens had begun. It was just such a case as called forth the energy and craft of the ruler of Syracuse, and showed him at his best. He devised his attack with great skill. Eighty galleys under Leptines and the Spartan captain were to attack the Carthaginian fleet, which was anchored off the shore of Descon. 
He himself led the land forces, marching by a roundabout road on a moonless night, and suddenly appeared at dawn on the west side of the Punic camp. He ordered his horsemen and a thousand mercenaries to attack the camp here, but the horsemen had secret commands to abandon the hired soldiers once they were in the thick of the fight, and ride rapidly round to the east of the camp, where the true attack was to be made. The attack on the west was only a feint, to distract the attention of the enemy from the other side, and for this purpose Dionysus sacrificed the lives of the hirelings, whom he did not trust. The real attack on the east was made on the forts of Discon and Polygna. Discon was assailed by the horsemen, along with a special force of triremes, which had been sent across the bay. Dionysus himself went round to lead the attack on Polygna. The plan was carried out with perfect success. The thousand hirelings were cut to pieces, the forts were captured, and the victory on the land was crowned by the destruction of the Carthaginian fleet. The Syracusan galleys bore down upon the enemy, before they had time fully to man their vessels, much less to row well out to sea, and the beaks of the triremes crashed into the defenseless timber. There was slaughter but hardly a fight, and then the land troops, fresh from their victory, rushed down to the beach and set fire to the transports and all vessels which had not left the shore. A wild scene followed. The high wind propagated the flames, and the cables were burnt asunder, and the Bay of Descon was filled with drifting fire ships, while amid the waters, despairing swimmers were making for the shore. Fate had indeed delivered the barbarians into the hands of the Greeks, and the Greeks were determined to wreak their vengeance to the uttermost, and extirpate the destroyers of Messana. Dionysus had approved himself the successor of Gelen. The double victory of Descon was worthy to be set beside the victory of Himera, but Dionysus was not capable of absolute sincerity in the part he played as the champion of Hellas. He could not act to the end as a Syracusan patriot with singleness of heart. This was the fatality of his position as a tyrant. Conscious that his autocracy rested on unstable foundations, he fought against Carthage, but it was always with the resolve that the power of the Carthaginians should not be annihilated in Sicily. The Punic peril was a security for his tyranny by making him necessary to Syracuse. The Syracusans must look to him as their protector against the ever-present barbarian foe. This was another secret of tyranny discovered by Dionysus. The Punic subtlety of Himilco, enlightened by passages of the tyrant's past career, formed no doubt a shrewd idea of this side of his policy. The Carthaginians saw that his hope of safety lay in bargaining with Dionysus. Secret messages passed, and Dionysus agreed to allow Himilco, along with all those who were Carthaginian citizens, to sail away at night and payment for this collusion, he received 300 talents. Dionysus recalled his reluctant army from their assault on the camp, and left it in pieces for three days. On the fourth night, Hamilco set sail with 40 triremes, leaving his allies and his mercenaries to their fate. It was an act of desertion, which was likely to repel mercenary soldiers from the Carthaginian service in the future, and this was doubtless foreseen by the crafty tyrant. But the squadron of fugitive triremes did not escape untouched. The noise of their oars as they sailed out of the harbor was detected by the Corinthian allies, and they gave the alarm to Dionysus. But Dionysus was purposely slow in his preparations to pursue, and the impatient Corinthians sailed out without his orders and sank some of the hindmost of the Punic vessels. Having connived at the escape of Himilco, the tyrant was energetic in dealing with the remnant of Himilco's host. The Sicil allies had escaped to their own homes, and only the mercenaries were left. These were slain or made slaves, with the exception of a band of strong and valiant Iberians, who were taken into the service of the tyrant. Thus ended the first struggle of Dionysus with Carthage, and it ended in a complete triumph for the Greek cause. The dominion of the African city was now circumscribed within its old western corner, and the greater part of the rest of Sicily was subject, directly or indirectly, to the rule of the lord of Syracuse. Both from Greek and from barbarian Sicily, a famous city had been blotted out. But Moitia had been revived in Lilybium, and Masana was soon to rise again upon her ruins. End of chapter 15, part 5. Recording by Paul Sutton. A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 2, by John Bagnell Burry. Chapter 15, part 6. Second Punic War and Sicil Conquests of Dionysus. The equivocal policy of Dionysus and his hostilities to Carthage was manifested clearly enough in the course which he pursued after his great victory. It was the most favorable moment that had yet come in the struggle of centuries, for driving the barbarians out and making Sicily a Greek island from the eastern to the western shore. Carthage could not readily gather together such another armament as that which had been destroyed, 
No patriot leader who was devoted to the Greek cause, heart and soul, with singleness of aim, would have failed to follow up the great success by an invasion of western Sicily. But the preservation of his own precarious despotism was the guiding principle of Dionysus, and he saw in the barbarian corner of the island a palladium of his power. The next Punic War broke out five years later, and part of the meantime had been occupied by Dionysus and extending his power over the Sicils. He annexed to his dominion Morgantina, Cephalodian, and Henna itself. He made treaties with the tyrants of Agirion and Centuripa, and with other places, but among all the Sicil towns, that which it was most important for him to win was the new foundation of the Carthaginian on the heights of Taurus. He laid siege to Tarimenium in the depth of winter. Operations of war in the winter season are one of the features of the reign of Dionysus, which separate it from the habits of older Greece and link it to the age of the Macedonian monarchy. The tyrant himself led his men on a wild and moonless night up the steep ascent to the town. One of the citadels was taken, and the assailants entered the place. But the Syracusan band was outnumbered and surrounded. Six hundred were killed, and the rest were driven down the cliffs. Of these, Dionysus was one. He reached the bottom, barely alive, after the precipitous descent. In the course of the extension of his power, on the northern coast, Dionysus had advanced to the limits of the Phoenician corner, and had won possession, through domestic treachery, of Solus, the most easterly of the three Phoenician cities. Of the circumstances we know nothing, but the conquest would seem to have been rather a piece of luck than part of any deliberate plan of aggression on the part of the Greek tyrant. No treaty appears to have been concluded between Carthage and Syracuse after the defeat of Himilco, so that the capture of Solus was not a violation of the peace, but only an occasion for the reawakening of hostilities, which had been permitted to sleep by tacit consent. At all events, it must have had something to do with the renewal of the war, a renewal for which our records assign no causes. At the opening of the Second War, we find a Carthaginian general commanding the Phoenician forces of the island but without any troops, so far as we know, from Africa. The general was Mago, who in the previous war had been commander of the fleet. His army was doubtless considerably inferior to the forces which Dionysus could muster. Certain it is that on this occasion Dionysus did not hesitate to give him battle, and did not fail to defeat him. Carthage saw that she must make a more vigorous effort, and she gave Mago a large army, 80,000 men, it is said, to retrieve his ill success. To meet the invader, Dionysus entered into a close league with the strongest Sicil power in the land, his fellow tyrant, Agirus of Agirion. This is a special feature of the Second Punic War. The cause of Europe is upheld by a federation of the two European powers of the island, Sicil and Greek. The Carthaginian army advanced into Sicil territory, seeking to win the Sicil towns, but Agirus and his men waged a most effectual manner of warfare, cutting off all the foraging parties of the enemy and thus starving them by degrees. This they were able to do from their knowledge of their native hills, but it seems that the Syracusans were dissatisfied with this slow method, which was thoroughly to the taste of Dionysus. What happened is not clear, but we learn that the Syracusans marched away from the camp, and that Dionysus replaced them by arming the slaves. Then the Greeks and the Sicils must have won some unrecorded success, or the Carthaginian host must have been already terribly deplenished. Then the Greeks and the Sicils must have won some unrecorded success, or the Carthaginian host must have been already terribly displenished by the want of the food, for we next find Mago suing for peace. This peace, although it is said to have been based on the treaty which Dionysus had made twelve years before, was in truth altogether different, for the parts of the two powers were reversed. All the Greek communities of Sicily were now placed under the direct or indirect power of Syracuse. The Carthaginian power was confined to the western corner. Nothing is said of Solus. It must have been now handed over to Carthage, if Mago had not already recovered it by arms, but the most striking provision of the treaty is that which placed the Sicils under the rule of Dionysus. Nothing is said of Agirium, and we are almost driven to wonder whether there was here any treachery to Agirus, of whom we hear nothing further. But there was a special clause touching Torimenium, and acting on this clause, Dionysus immediately took possession of the town, expelled the Sicils, and established the fortress of those mercenary settlements which were characteristic of his age. Such was the end of two Punic Wars, which were in truth rather but a single war broken by an interval of quiescence. End of chapter 15, part 6. Recording by Paul Sutton.
Chapter 15, Part 7 of A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Sutton. A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 2 by John Bagnell Burry. Chapter 15, Part 7. The Empire of Dionysus Having made himself master of all Greek Sicily, the lord of Syracuse began to extend the compass of his ambition beyond the bounds of the island. He began to plan the conquest of Greek Italy. Hitherto, the Sicilian cities, though they had constant dealings with the colonies of the Italian mainland, had never sought there, or anywhere, out of their own island, a field for conquest or aggression. The restriction of Siciliot ambition to Sicilian territory was the other side of the doctrine preached by Hermocrates, that the Siciliots should not allow Greeks from beyond the sea to interfere in the affairs of Sicily. We are reminded of the policy which has been followed on a greater scale by the United States on the American continent. Here, as in other things, Dionysus was an innovator. He set the example of enterprises of conquest beyond the sea. Into the enterprise of Italian conquest, he was naturally led on by his dealings with the fellow cities of the Strait, Masana, and Regium. For Masana was a city once more. It had been rebuilt by Dionysus himself. He settled in it colonists from Locri and Medma in Italy, and 600 Mycenaeans from Old Greece, who had been wandering about homeless since Sparta had driven them from Napoctus. But this favor to the Mycenaeans displeased the Spartans, and as Dionysus claved to the friendship of Sparta, he yielded to their protests. He removed the exiles from Masana, but he made for them a secure, though less illustrious home. He founded the city of Tindarus on a high hill to the west of Mile, and fortified it strongly. The walls and towers, which still remain, are a good specimen of the fortifications of Dionysus. The restoration of Masana and the foundation of Tindarus were no pleasant sight to the Ionian city across the strait. These new cities seemed to Regium, a Syracuse and menace. The men of Regium sought to make a counter-move by founding a city themselves between Tindarus and Masana. They gathered together the exiles from Catane and Naxos, and settled them on the peninsula of Mile. But the settlement lasted only for a moment. Almost immediately, the town of Mile was captured by its neighbors of Masana, and the exiles were driven out to resume their wanderings. Apart from his political hostility to Regium, Dionysus is said to have borne it a private grudge. He had asked the men of Regium to give him one of their maidens to wife, and they had answered that they would give him none but the hangman's daughter. Locri, Regium's neighbor, then granted him the request, which Regium refused. Locri was his faithful ally, and now, when the conclusion of peace with Carthage had left him free to pursue his Italian designs, it was Locri that he made his base of operations. The first object was to capture Regium. Its position on the strait dictated this apart from all motives of revenge or hatred. Accordingly, starting from Locri with an army and fleet, he laid siege to Regium by land and sea. But the confederate cities of the Italian coast came to the assistance of a member of their league. The Italian armament worsted the fleet of Dionysus in or near the strait, and Dionysus escaped with difficulty to the opposite coast. Regium was thus relieved, and Dionysus now directed his hostilities against the Italian federation. He made an alliance with the Lucanians, to the intent that they and he should carry on a war in common against the Italiot cities, they by land and he by sea. In accordance with this treaty, the Lucanians invaded the land of Thurai. The men of Thurai retorted by invading Lucania in considerable force, but they sustained a crushing defeat at the hands of the barbarians. Most of the Thurians were slain, but some escaped to the shore and swam out to ships which they described coasting along. By a curious chance, the ships were the fleet of Syracuse and Leptines, the tyrant's brother, was once more the commander. He received the fugitives, and did more. He landed and ransomed them from the Lucanians. He did even more than this. He arranged an armistice between the Lucanians and the Italiots. And acting thus, he clearly went beyond his powers. He had been sent to cooperate with the Lucanians against the Italiots, and he had no right to conclude an armistice in such circumstances, without consulting his brother. It is not surprising that Dionysus deposed him from the command. In the following year, Dionysus took the field himself. He opened the campaign by laying siege to Colonia, the northern neighbor of Locri. The Italiots, under the active lead of Croton, collected an army of 15,000 foot and 2,000 horse, and entrusted the command to Haloris. 
a brave exile of Syracuse, who burned with hatred against the tyrant who had banished him. The federal army marched forth from Croton to relieve Colonia, and when Dionysus learned of its approach, he decided to go forth to meet it. For his own forces, 20,000 foot and 3,000 horse were considerably superior. Luck favored him. Near the river Eleporus, which flows into the sea, between Colonia and Croton, the tyrant heard that the enemy were encamped, within a distance of five miles, and he drew up his men in battle array. Haloris, less well informed, rode forward in front of his main army, with a company of 500 men, and suddenly found himself in the presence of the Syracusan host. He did not quail or flee. Sending back a message to hasten the rest of his army, he and his little band stood firm against the onset of the invaders. Haloris fell himself, and the main army, coming up company by company in haste and disorder, was easily routed by Dionysus. Ten thousand fugitives escaped to a high hill, but it was a poor hill of refuge, for there was no spring of water and they could not hold out. The next morning they besought Dionysus, who kept watch around the hill throughout the night to set them free for a ransom. Dionysus refused. He would accept only unreserved surrender. But he was cruel only to grant them a greater mercy than they could themselves have dared to ask. When they came down the hill, Dionysus himself told their number, with a wand as they filed past him, and each man deemed that his doom would be bondage, if not death. But Dionysus let them all depart, even without exacting a ransom. This act of mercy, which was notable as compared not only with other acts of the tyrant, but with the ordinary practice of the age, produced a great sensation. There is no reason for imputing it to a magnanimous impulse. It was a deliberate act of policy. Dionysus did not wish to be generous, but he wished to be regarded as generous and win over the Italiot cities. For this purpose, he made up his mind to sacrifice 10,000 ransom. His wisdom was soon approved. The communities to which the captives belonged gratefully voted him golden crowns and made separate treaties with him. In this way, he accomplished his purpose. With Regium, Colonia, and Hipponian, he still remained at war. But these states were now isolated, and the league was broken up. Regium bought off his hostilities for the time by surrendering its fleet. Colonia was captured and abolished, and its territory given to Locri. Hipponian was likewise taken and destroyed but the peoples of both these cities were transplanted to Syracuse and became Syracusan citizens. But Dionysus had not yet finished with Regium. He created a pretext for renewing hostilities, and he laid siege to the city. The men of Regium had now no friends to help them, but under their general, Phaeton, whom the tyrant vainly endeavored to bribe, they held out for ten months and were reduced to surrender in the end by starvation. Dionysus accepted ransoms for those who could find the money, the rest of the inhabitants were sold. Phaeton was selected for special vengeance. He was scourged through the army and then drowned with all his kin. Thus Dionysus gained what hitherto had been one of his most pressing desires, possession of the city, which had so long hated and defied him. He was now master of both sides of the strait and held the fortress which was the bulwark of Greek Italy. Eight years later he captured Croton and his power in Italy reached its greatest height. But in the meanwhile, the unresting lord of Syracuse had turned his eyes to a region of enterprise further afield. The needs of his treasury, if nothing else, bent his attention to commerce. We touch here upon that side of ancient enterprise which has been persistently and provokingly withdrawn from our vision, because the writers of antiquity never thought of lingering on the ordinary business transactions which were happening every day before their eyes. Many things that are now dark would be cleared up if we had more knowledge of the operations of Greek trade. Dionysus saw an opening for Sicilian commerce along the eastern and western coasts of the Hadriatic Sea, in whose waters the ships of Corsera, Athens, and Taras hitherto had chiefly plied. He set about making the Hadriatic a Syracusan lake by means of settlements and alliances. He founded settlements in Apulia, which he probably hoped ultimately to incorporate in his dominion. He settled a colony and fixed a naval station in the island of Issa, whose importance as a strategic post has been more than once illustrated in subsequent history. He took part with the Pereans in colonizing Pharos, on an island not far from Issa. A Syracusan colony was planted at Ancon, and even if the colonists were, as they are said to have been, exiles and foes of Dionysus, we may be sure that the merchant ships of Syracuse were welcome at the wharfs of Ancon. The northern goal of these merchant ships was near the mouth of the Po, 
at a spot where there was already a mart for diffusing Greek merchandise into Cisalpine Gaul and beyond the Alps into northern Europe. This was the Venetian Hadria, city of marshes and canals, which was now colonized by Dionysus, to be in some sort, as has been aptly observed, a forerunner of Venice itself. It was in one of these outlying posts of the Hellenic world that the historian, to whom we owe our best knowledge of the Sicilian history of this time, probably wrote his works. Philistus had held posts of high trust under Dionysus, and had even been the commandant of the Syracusan citadel. But in later years, he incurred his master's displeasure, or suspicion, and chose as his place of banishment some city on the Hadriatic, possibly Hadria. In connection with these Hadriatic designs, touching which we have only the most fragmentary records, Dionysus formed an alliance with Alcetus of Molossia, whose unstable position in his own kingdom made him willing to be a dependent on the strong ruler of Syracuse. Thus Dionysus made his influence predominant at the gates of the Hadriatic. The Syracusan Empire, we may survey it when it reached its widest extent, consisted, like most other empires, partly of immediate dominion and partly of dependent communities. The immediate dominion was both insular and continental. It included the greater portion of Sicily and the southern peninsula of Italy, perhaps as far north as the River Crathus. But this dominion was not homogeneous, and the relations of its various parts to the government of Syracuse. There was first of all the old territory of the Syracusan Republic. There were secondly a number of military settlements, an institution of Dionysus which has been compared to the military colonies of Rome. Such, for example, was Croton on the mainland. Such in Sicily were Henna and Messana. Such was Issa in the Hadriatic. Outside these direct subjects was the third class of the allied cities, which, though absolutely subject to the power of Dionysus, had still the management of their less important affairs in their own hands. To this class belonged the old Greek cities of Sicily, like Gela and Camarina, new colonies like Tyndarus, some Sicil states like Agirium and Erbita. Beyond the sphere of direct dominion stretched the sphere of dependencies. The allies, whose bond of dependence was rather implied than formally expressed, here belong the cities of the Italian League, Thurii and the rest, north of the Crathus River. Here belong some of the Iapogean communities in the heel of Italy, and here the kingdom of Melosia beyond the Ionian Sea, and some Illyrian places on the Hadriatic coast. The Crathus may be regarded as the line between the two, the outer and the inner, divisions of the empire of Dionysus, but it is remarkable that at one time he planned a wall and a ditch which should run across the isthmus from Scalation to the nearest point on the other sea, a distance of about 20 miles, and thus sever, as it were, the toe of Italy from the mainland, and make it a sort of second Sicily. The acquisition and maintenance of this empire, the building of ships and ship sheds, the payment of mercenary soldiers, the vast fortifications of Syracuse, both of the island and of the hill, all this, along with the ordinary expenses of government and the state of a despot's court, demanded an enormous outlay. To meet this outlay, Dionysus was forced to resort to extraordinary expedients. In the first place, he oppressed the Syracusans by a burdensome taxation. He imposed special taxes for war, special taxes for building ships, and he introduced an honorious tax on cattle. It is said that the citizens paid yearly into the treasury at the rate of 20% of their capital. In the second place, he had recourse to a various expedients affecting the coinage. Thus, he issued debased fordrucum, pieces of tin instead of silver. And in one case of financial need, he paid a debt by placing on each coin an official mark, which rendered it worth double of its true value. But such expedients were not enough. Dionysus was an unscrupulous rifler of temples. Thus, when he took Croton, he carried off the treasures of a temple of Hera. In an earlier year, he sailed like a pirate to Etruria, swooped down on a rich temple at the port of Agila, and bore off booty which amounted to the value of 1,500 talents. The plunder of a sanctuary on distant barbarian shores might seem a small thing, but no awe of divine displeasure restrained Dionysus from planning a raid upon the holiest place of Hellenic worship. He formed the design of robbing the treasury of Delphi itself, with Illyrian and Melosian help, but the plan miscarried. It is little wonder that the tyrant had an evil repute in the mother country. End of chapter 15, part 7. Recording by Paul Sutton.
A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 2, by John Bagnell Burry, Chapter 15, Part 8. Death of Dionysus, Estimate of His Work It was only for a moment that the dominion of the Syracusan despot reached its extreme limits. He had hardly won the city and lands of Croton when his borders fell back in the west of his own island. A new war with Carthage had broken out, and this time, if Dionysus was not the first to draw the sword, he at least provoked hostilities. He entered into alliances with some of the cities dependent on Carthage, possibly Segesta or Eryx. Of the campaigns we know almost nothing, except their result. First we find Carthage helping the Italiots with whom the tyrant was at war. Next we find a Carthaginian force in Sicily commanded by Mago. In a battle fought at Kabbalah, a place unknown, the Syracusans won a great victory and Mago was killed. While negotiations for peace were proceeding, Another battle was fought at Cronion, near Panormus, and fate reversed her reward. Dionysus was defeated with terrible loss, and compelled to make a disadvantageous peace. The boundary of Greek against Punic Sicily was withdrawn from the river Mazaras to the river Helesus. This meant that the deliverer of Salinas and Thermae gave back those cities to the mercies of the barbarians. At the mouth of the Helesus, the old Greek foundation of Heraclea Manoa now became under the corresponding Punic name, Ras Melkart, one of the chief strongholds of the Punic power. Just ten years later, ten years in which the history of Sicily is a blank, Dionysus essayed to retrieve the losses which the disastrous Battle of Cronion had brought upon him. He made war once more upon Carthage, and for the second time he invaded Punic Sicily. He delivered Greek Salinas, he won Campanian and Tala, and captured Elemian Eryx, along with its haven, Drapanon. He then attempted, we may almost say, to repeat the great exploit of his first war. There was no more a Moitia to capture, but he laid siege to Lilybeum, which had taken Moitia's place. But he was compelled to abandon the attempt, the fortress was too strong, and his ill success was soon crowned by the loss of a large part of his fleet, which was carried out of the harbor of Draponin by an enterprising Carthaginian admiral. It was the last undertaking of the great ruler of Sicily. He did not live to conclude the peace which probably confirmed the Helesus as the boundary between Greek and Barbarian. His death was connected with a side of his character which has not yet come before us. The tyrant of Syracuse has a place, though it is a small place, in literary history. He was a dramatic poet, and he frequently competed with his tragedies in the Athenian theater. He won third, he won even second prizes, but his dearest ambition was to be awarded a first place. That desire was at length fulfilled. His failure at Lilibium and the loss of his ships at Draponin were compensated by the tidings that the first prize had been assigned to his ransom of Hector at the Linnaean festival. He celebrated his joy by an unwanton carouse. His intemperance was followed by a fever, and a soropific drought was administered to him which induced the sleep of death. Dionysus did not stand wholly aloof from the politics of elder Greeks. His alliance with Sparta and the help which he received from her at the siege of Syracuse involved him in obligations to her, which he fulfilled on more than one occasion, and in the regions of Corsera his empire came into direct contact with the spheres of some of the states of the mother country. But these political relations are an unimportant part of his reign. His reign, as a whole, lies apart from the contemporary politics of elder Greeks. Yet, from some points of view, it possesses more significance in Grecian and in European history than the contemporary history of Sparta and Athens. In the first place, Dionysus stands out as one of the most prominent champions of Europe in the long struggle between the Asiatic and the European for the possession of Sicily. He did what no champion had done before. He carried the war into the enemy's precinct. He well nigh achieved what it was reserved for an Italian commonwealth to achieve actually. The reclaiming of the whole island for Europe. The complete expulsion of the Semitic intruder. In the second place, he stands out as the man who raised his own city not only to dominion over all Greek Sicily, but to a transmarine dominion which made her the most powerful city in the Greek world, the most potent state in Europe. The purely Sicilian policy is flung aside and Syracuse becomes a continental power. Laying one hand on that peninsula to which her own island geographically belongs and stretching out the other to the lands beyond the Hadriatic. And thirdly, this empire, though it is thinly disguised like the later empire of Rome under constitutional forms, is really a monarchical realm, which is a foreshadowing of the Macedonian monarchies and an anticipation of a new period in European history. 
Again in the Art of War, Dionysus inaugurated methods, which did not come into general use till more than half a century later. Some of his military operations seem to transport us to the age of Alexander the Great and his successors. Dionysus anticipated the age of those monarchs. Statues were set up representing him in the guise of Dionysus, the god by whose name he was called. Here indeed, he did not stand alone among his contemporaries. The Spartan Lysander also had been invested with attributes of divinity. But in one respect, Dionysus was far from being a forerunner of the Macedonian monarchs. He was not an active or deliberate diffuser of Hellenic civilization. On the contrary, he appears rather as an undoer of Hellenic civilization. He destroys Hellenic towns, and he replaces Hellenic by Italian communities. He cultivates the friendship of Gauls and Lucanians to use them against Greeks, not to make them Greeks. This side of the policy of Dionysus, the establishment of Italian settlements in Sicily, it points unintentionally indeed so far as he was concerned, to the expansion of Italy. It points to the Italian conquest of Sicily, which was to be accomplished more than a century after his death. Dionysus, then, has the significance of a pioneer. But there is something else to be said. Original and successful as he was, great things as he did, we cannot help feeling that he ought to have done greater things still. A master of political wisdom, an originator of daring ideas, a man of endless energy, remarkably temperate in the habits of his life. He was hampered throughout by his unconstitutional position. The nature of tyranny imposed limitations on his work. He had always to consider, first, the security of his own unchartered rule. He could never forget the fact that he was a hated master. He could therefore never devote himself to the accomplishment of any object or the solution of any problem with the undivided zeal which may animate a constitutional prince who need never turn aside to examine the sure foundations of his power. We saw how the tyrant's warfare against Carthage was affected by these personal calculations. The Syracusan tyranny accomplished indeed far more than could have been accomplished by the Syracusan democracy. Dionysus as a tyrant wrought what he could never have wrought, as a mere statesman governing by legitimate influence the councils of a free assembly. But he illustrates, and all the more strikingly, as a pioneer of the great monarchies of the future, the truth to which attention has been called before, that the tyrannies and democracies of Greek cities were in their nature not adapted to create and maintain large empires. End of chapter 15, part 8. Recording by Paul Sutton. A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 2, by John Bagnell Burry. Chapter 15, part 9. Dionysus the Younger. The empire of Dionysus, which he had made fast, to use his own expression, by chains of adamant, a strong army, a strong navy, and strong walls, descended to his son, Dionysus, a youth of feeble character, not without amiable qualities, but of the nature that is easily swayed to good or evil, and is always dependent on advisors. At first he was under the influence of Dion, who had been the most trusted minister of the elder Dionysus in the later part of his reign holding the office of admiral and allied by a double marriage with the tyrant's family. The tyrant had espoused Dion's sister, Aristomachy, and Dion married one of the daughters of this marriage, Arete, his own niece. The other daughter was given to Dionysus, her half-brother. Another man, possessing the pride, wealth, and ability of Dion, might have sought to fling aside Dionysus, and if he did not seize the tyranny himself, at all events to secure it for the sons of his sister, the brothers of his wife, Hipparinus and Nicaeus. But Dion was not like other men. His aspirations were loftier and less selfish. His object was not to secure tyranny for any man, but to get rid of tyranny altogether. But this was not to be done by a revolution. The democracy which would have risen on the ruins of the despotism would have been in Dion's eyes as evil a thing for Syracuse as the despotism itself. For Dion had imbibed, and thoroughly believed in, the political teachings of his friend, Plato the philosopher. His darling project was to establish at Syracuse a constitution, which would so far as possible conform to the theoretical views of Plato, and which would probably have taken the shape of a limited kingship, with some resemblance to the constitution of Sparta, and this could never have been brought about by a pure vote of the Syracusan people. The ideal constitution must be imposed upon them for their own good. The sole chance lay in persuading a tyrant to impose limitations on his own absolute power, and introduce the required constitution. 
Give me, says Plato himself, a city governed by a tyranny, and let the tyrant be young, with good brains, brave, and generous, and let fortune bring in his way a good lawgiver. Then a state has a chance of being well governed. Dion saw in young Dionysus a nature which might be molded as he wished, a nature, perhaps which he missed in his own nephews, Hipparinus and Nicaeus. He devoted himself loyally to Dionysus, who looked up to his virtue and experience, and he set himself to interest the young ruler in philosophy and make him to take a serious view of his duties. But his chief hope lay in bringing the tyrant under the attraction of the same powerful personality which had exercised a decisive and abiding influence over him. Plato must come to Syracuse and make the tyrant a philosopher. The treatment which Plato had experienced on the occasion of a previous visit to Sicily at the hands of the elder Dionysus was not indeed such as to encourage him to return. But he yielded, reluctantly, to the pressing invitation of the young ruler and the urgent solicitations of Dion, who represented that now, at last, the moment had come to call an ideal state into actual existence. It was the vision of a dreamer dreaming greatly, and that a statesman of Dion's practical experience and knowledge of human nature should have allowed himself to be guided by such a dream may seem strange to us, to us to whom the history of hundreds of societies throughout a period of more than 2,000 years has brought disillusion. It has indeed seemed so curious that some have concluded that Dion was throughout plotting to dethrone Dionysus, that the philosophical scheme was part of the plot, and Plato an unconscious tool of the conspiracy. But the good faith of Dion seems assured. We must remember that a state founded on philosophical principles was a new idea, which was not at all likely to seem foredoomed to failure to anyone who was enamored of philosophy, for such a state had never been tried and consequently there was no example of a previous failure. On the contrary, there was the example of Sparta as a success. The political speculators of those days always turned with special predilection to Sparta as a well-balanced state, and it was believed that her constitution and discipline had been called into being and established for all time by the will and fiat of a single extraordinarily wise lawgiver. Why then should not Dionysus and Dion, under the direction of Plato, do for Syracuse what Lycurgus had done for Lacedaemon. And Dion doubtless thought that his own experience would enable him to adjust the demands of speculation to the rude realities of existence. No welcome could have been more honorable and flattering than that which Plato received. He engaged the respect and admiration of Dionysus. And the young tyrant was easily brought to regard tyranny as a vile thing, and to cherish the plan of building up a new constitution. The experiment would probably have been tried, if Plato in dealing with his pupil had acted otherwise than he did. The nature of Dionysus was one of those natures which are susceptible of impression and capable of enthusiasm, but incapable of persevering application. If Plato had contented himself with inculculating the general principles which he has expounded with such charm in his Republic, Dionysus would in all likelihood have attempted to create at Syracuse a dim adumbration of the ideal state. It is hardly likely that it would have been long maintained. Still, it would at least have been essayed, but Plato insisted on imparting to his pupil a systematic course of philosophical training, and began with a science of geometry. The tyrant took up the study with eagerness. His court was absorbed in geometry, but he presently wearied of it. And then influences which were opposed to the scheme of Dion and Plato began to tell. One of the first acts of the new reign had been to recall from exile the historian Philistus. He was entirely adverse to the proposed reforms, and wished that the tyranny should continue on its old lines. He and his friends insinuated that the true object of Dion was to secure the tyranny for one of his own nephews, as soon as Dionysus had laid it down. They did everything to turn Dionysus against Dion, and at last an indiscreet letter of Dion gave them the means of success. Syracuse and Carthage were negotiating peace, and Dion wrote to the Carthaginian judges not to act without first consulting him. The letter was intercepted, and though its motive was doubtless perfectly honest, it was interpreted as treason. Dion was banished from Sicily, but was allowed to retain his property, and the party of Philistus won the upper hand. Plato remained for a while in the island. Dionysus was jealous of the esteem which he felt for Dion and desired above all things to win the same esteem for himself. But the philosopher's visit had been a failure. He yearned to get back to Athens, and at length Dionysus let him go. 
So ended the notable scheme of founding an ideal state, the realization of which would have involved the disbandment of the mercenary troops, and thereby the collapse of the Syracusan Empire. It is easy to ridicule Plato for want of tact in his treatment of the young tyrant. It is easy to flout him as a pedant for not distinguishing between an academy and a court. But Plato was perfectly right. The only motive which had brought him to Sicily was to prepare the way for founding a new state fashioned more or less according to his own ideals. Now, the first condition of the life of such a state was that a king should be a philosopher. Therefore, as Dionysus, not Plato, was to be king in the new state, it was indispensable that Dionysus should become a philosopher. Plato had not the smallest interest in imparting to the tyrant a superficial smattering of philosophy, enough to beguile him into framing a platonic state. For that state would have been stillborn, since it lacked the first condition of life, a true philosopher at its head. If Dionysus had not the stuff of a true, but only of a sham philosopher, it was useless to make the experiment. Plato adopted the only reasonable course. He was true to his own ideal. End of chapter 15, part 9. Recording by Paul Sutton. Chapter 15, Part 10 of A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Sutton. A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 2. By John Bagnell Burry. Chapter 15, Part 10. Dion. Strange as it may appear, after such experiences, Plato seems to have returned once more to Sicily, at the urgent invitation of Dionysus. He can have had no more expectations of making a philosopher out of the tyrant, and his chief motive must have been to bring about the recall of Dion and reconcile him to Dionysus, who appears to have lured the philosopher by the hope that this might be accomplished. Plato was received and entertained with as great honor as before, but his visit was fruitless. Probably the tyrant ascertained that Dion was in the meantime using his wealth to make silent preparations for winning his way back to Syracuse and overthrowing the tyranny. Dionysus, therefore, took the precaution of confiscating Dion's property, and then Plato returned to Athens as soon as he could. Dion also betook himself to Old Greece and made Athens his headquarters. Presently, the tyrant committed a needless act of tyranny, he compelled Dion's wife, Arete, to marry another man. At length, Dion deemed that the time for action had come. With a very small force, packed into not more than five merchant ships, he set sail from Zacynthus to encounter the mighty armaments of Dionysus. His coming was expected, and the Admiral Philistus had a fleet in Italian waters to waylay him. But Dion sailed straight across the open sea to Pekinus. His plan was to land in western Sicily, collect what reinforcements he could, and march on Syracuse. It was a bold enterprise, but Dion knew that the character of the tyrant was feeble, and that the Syracusans pined to be delivered from his tyranny. Driven by a storm to the Libyan coast, the ships of the Deliverer finally reached Heraclea Manoa, now a Carthaginian port, in southwestern Sicily. Here, they learned that Dionysus had departed for Italy with 80 ships, and they lost no time in marching to Syracuse, picking up reinforcements, both Greek and Sicil, on their way. The Campanian mercenaries, who were guarding Epipole, were lured away by a trick, and making a night march from Acraea, Dion and his party entered Syracuse amid general rejoicings. The assembly placed the government in the hands of twenty generals. Dion was among them. The fortress of Epipole was secured. No part of Syracuse remained in possession of Dionysus except the island and against this Dion built a wall of defense, from the greater to the lesser harbor. Seven days later, Dionysus returned. While Syracuse was rocking with the first enthusiasm at her deliverance, the deliverer was the popular hero. But Dion was not a man who could hold the affections of the people, for he repelled men by his exceeding haughtiness, and it was seen to 
that he was determined masterfully to direct the Syracusans how they were to use their freedom. Dionysus, shut up in the island, resorted to artifices to raise suspicion against him in the minds of the citizens. An arrival appeared on the scene who possessed more popular manners than Dion. This was a certain Heraclides, whom the tyrant had banished and who now returned with an armament of ships and soldiers. The assembly elected him admiral. Dion undid this act on the ground that his own consent was necessary, and then came forward himself to propose Heraclides. This behavior alienated the sympathies of the citizens. They did not want another autocrat. Soon afterwards, Heraclides won an important sea fight, defeating Philistus, who had returned from Italy with his squadron. The old historian himself was taken and put to death with cruelty. Dionysus thus lost his best support, and presently he escaped from the island, taking his triremes with him, but leaving a garrison of mercenaries and his young son, Apollocrates, in command. Soon after this, the influence of Dion waned so much that the Syracusans deposed him from the post of general and appointed 25 new generals, among them Heraclides. They also refused to grant any pay to the Peloponnesian deliverers who had come with Dion. The Peloponnesians would have gladly turned against the Syracusans if Dion had given the signal. But Dion, though self-willed, was too genuine a patriot to attack his own city and he retired to Leontini with 3,000 devoted men. The Syracusans then went on the siege of the island fortress, and so hard-pressed was the garrison that it determined to surrender. Heralds had been already sent to announce the decision to the Syracusans when in the early morning reinforcements arrived, soldiers and provisions brought by a campanian of Naples by name Nipsius, who, eluding the notice of the enemy's ships, sailed into the great harbor. The situation was changed and negotiations were immediately broken off. At first, fortune favored the Syracusans. Heraclides put out to sea and won a second sea fight, sinking or capturing whatever warships had been left behind by Dionysus or were brought by Nipsius. At this success, the city went wild with joy and spent the night in carousing. Before the dawn of day, when soldiers and generals were alike sunk in a drunken sleep, Nipsius and his troops issued from the gates of the island and surmounting the cross wall of Dion by scaling ladders, slew the guards and took possession of Lower Acredina and the Agora. All this part of the city was sacked. Full leave was given to the mercenaries to do as they listed. They carried off women and children, and all the property they could lay hands on. Next day, all the citizens who had taken refuge in Apopoli and the Upper Acredina, looking hopelessly at what had been done, and seeing what the barbarians were beginning their horrible work again, Messengers, riding as swiftly as they could, reached Leontini towards evening. Dion led them to the theater, and there, before the gathered folk, the envoys told their tale and implored Dion and the Peloponnesians to forget the ingratitude of Syracuse and come to her help. Dion made a moving speech. He would in any case go, and if he could not save his city, he would bury himself in her ruin. But the Peloponnesians might well refuse to stir for a people which had entreated them so ill. A shout went up that Syracuse must be rescued, and for the second time, Dion led the Peloponnesians to her deliverance. They set out at once, and a night march brought them to Megara, five or six miles from Syracuse at the dawn of day. There, dreadful tidings reached them. Nipsius, knowing that the rescue was on its way, and deeming that no time was to be lost, had let loose his barbarians again into the city at midnight. They no longer thought of plunder, but only of slaying and burning. At this news, the army of rescue hurried on to save what might still be saved. Entering by the Hexapylon on the north, Dion cleared his way before him through Arachidina and reached the cross wall, which he had himself built as a defense against the island. It was now broken down, but behind its ruins, Nipsius had posted a body of his mercenaries, and this was the scene of the decisive struggle. Dion's men carried the wall, and the foe was driven back into the fortress of Ortigia. The opponents of Dion, who had not fled, were humbled. Heraclides besought his pardon, and Dion was blamed for not putting him to death. It was at all events foolish magnanimity, which consented to the arrangement that Dion should be general with full power on land, and Heraclides by sea. The old dissensions soon broke out, and presently we find a Spartan named Gesilus reconciling the rivals and constraining Heraclides to swear solemnly to do nothing against Dion. Nipsius seems to have disappeared from the scene. 
And it was not long before the son of Dionysus, wary of the long seed, made up his mind to surrender the island to Dion. During all these dreadful events, Dion's sister, Aristomache, and his wife, Arete, had been kept in the island. Dion now took back his wife. The time at last came for Dion to show what his political aims really were. He professed to have come to give Syracuse freedom, but the freedom which he would have given her was not such as she herself desired. The Syracusan citizens wanted the restoration of their democracy. But to Dion, democracy seemed as bad a form of government as tyranny. If taught by experience, he no longer dreamed of a platonic state. He desired to establish an aristocracy with some democratic limitations, and with a king or kings as in Sparta. With this purpose in view, he sent to Corinth for helpers and advisors, and he expressed his leanings to the Corinthian oligarchy by an issue of coins with a flying horse, modeled on the Pegasi of Corinth. But though Dion hoped to establish a state in which the few should govern the many, he made a grave mistake in not immediately placing himself above the suspicion of being a selfish power seeker, a possible tyrant. The Syracusans longed to see the fortress of the tyrant demolished, and if Dion had complied with their wish, he might have secured for himself abiding influence. But though he did not live in the fortress, he allowed it to remain, and its existence seemed a standing invitation to tyranny. Dion had no intention of allowing the Syracusans to manage their own affairs and the enjoyment of power corrupted him. His authority was only limited by the joint command of Heracletes, and at last he was brought to consent that his rival should be secretly assassinated. After this, he was to all purposes tyrant, though he might repudiate tyranny with his lips. Among those who had come with him from Elder Greece to liberate Syracuse was a pupil of Plato named Callippus, and this man plotted to overthrow Dion who trusted him implicitly. Aristomachy and Arete suspected him and taxed him with treachery, nor were they assured until he had taken the most solemn oath that a mortal could take. He went to the precinct of the great goddesses Demeter and Persephone. The priest wrapped him in the purple robe of the queen of the underworld and gave him a lighted torch. In this guise, he swore that he plotted no evil design against Dion. But so little regard had Callippus for religion that he chose the festival of the maiden by whom he had sworn for the execution of his plot. He employed some men of Zacynthus to murder Dion, and then seized the power himself. The tyranny of Callippus lasted for about a year. Then, while he was engaged in an attack on Catane, the two sons of the elder Dionysus by his second wife, Hipparinus and Nicias, came to Syracuse, and won possession of Ortigia. These brothers were a worthless pair, drunken and dissolute. Hipparinus held the island for about two years, then he was murdered in a fit of drunkenness, and was succeeded by Nicaeus, who ruled Ortigia five years longer. It is not certain how far these tyrants were able to assert their authority over Syracuse outside the precincts of the island. During all these changes, Dionysus was living at Locri, the native city of his mother, and ruling it with a tyrant's rod. His cruelty and the outrages which he committed on the freeborn maidens of the city provoked universal hatred. At length he saw the chance of recovering Syracuse. Leaving his wife and daughters at Locri with a small garrison, he sailed to Ortigia and drove out Nicias. As soon as he had gone, the Locrians arose and easily overcame his mercenaries. The enormities of which the tyrant had been guilty may best be measured by the brutal thirst of vengeance which now consumed the citizens of Locri. No supplications, no intervention, no offers of ransom could turn them away from wreaking their pent-up hatred on the wife and daughters of Dionysus. The women were submitted to the most horrible tortures and insults before they were strangled. The sea was sown with their ashes. End of chapter 15, part 10. Recording by Paul Sutton. A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 2, by John Bagnell Burry. Chapter 15, Part 11. Timolean. At this moment, tyrannies flourished in Sicily. Besides Syracuse, the cities of Messana, Leontini, and Catane, and many Sicil towns were under the yoke of tyrants. Syracuse was at least half free. Dionysus held only the island, but the Syracusans, for lack of another leader, looked for help and guidance in their struggle against their own tyrant to the man who had made himself lord of Leontini. 
This was a certain Hecatus, a man ill to deal with, who was a follower of Dion. But after Dion's death caused his wife and sister to be drowned while they were sailing to the Peloponnesus, this Hecatus was aiming at becoming himself Lord of Syracuse, and he hoped to accomplish this purpose with the help of Carthage. But he veiled his designs, and he supported an appeal which the Sicilian Greeks now addressed to Corinth. It was an appeal for help, both against the plague of tyranny which was rampant in Sicily, and against the Carthaginians who were preparing a great armament to descend upon the troubled island. The Syracusans selected Hecatus as their general. Corinth, ever a solicitous mother to her colonies, was ready to respond to the appeal, and the only difficulty was to find a suitable commander. Someone in the assembly, by a sudden inspiration, arose and named Timoleon, the son of Timodemus. Belonging to a noble family, and notable by his personal qualities, Timoleon was living under a strange cloud, though a deed which some highly praised and others severely blamed. He had saved his brother's life in battle at the risk of his own, but when that brother afterwards plotted to make himself tyrant, Timoleon and some friends put him to death. His mother and many others abhorred him as guilty of a brother's blood, while others admired him as the slayer of a tyrant. In the light of his later deeds, we know that Timoleon was actuated by the highest motives of duty when he consented to his brother's death. Ever since that terrible day, he had lived in a retirement, but when his name was mentioned in the assembly, all approved, and Telecletes, a man of influence, expressed the general thought by saying, We shall decide that he slew a tyrant if he is successful, that he slew his brother if he fails. The enterprise was to be Timoleon's ordeal. With ten ships of war, a few fellow citizens, and about one thousand mercenaries, Timoleon crossed the Ionian Sea, guided, it was said, by the track of a flaming torch, the emblem of the Sicilian goddesses, Demeter and Persephone. At Regium, now free from the rule of tyrants, he met with a warm welcome. But he found a Carthaginian fleet awaiting him there, and likewise ambassadors from Hecatus, who demanded that the ships and soldiers should be sent back to Corinth, since the Carthaginians would not permit them to cruise the Sicilian waters. As for Timoleon himself, Hecatus would be pleased to have his help and counsel. Timoleon had no thought of heeding such a message. It was not to set up the rule of Hecatus at Syracuse that he had come, or to submit to the dictation of the foes of Hellas. But the difficulty was to leave the roadstead of Regium in face of the Punic fleet. Here, Timoleon showed caution and craft. He pretended to agree to the proposals, but he asked that the whole matter and the intentions of Hecatus should be clearly stated in the presence of the Regine people. With the connivance of the Regines, time was wasted, and the Carthaginians and the ambassadors of Hecatus were detained in the assembly until the Corinthian ships had put out to sea. Timoleon himself, slipping away, just in time to embark in the last of them, he made straight for Torimenium. It will be remembered that Torimenium, planted by Hamilco to be a Sicil city, had been taken by Dionysus to be an abode for his mercenaries. Amid the troubles after the tyrant's death, it had gained its independence and a citizen named Andromachus had become the foremost man in its public affairs. Andromachus induced his fellow citizens to offer a home to the homeless Naxians, whose parents Dionysus had so cruelly disposed. The Naxians came back to the hill which looked down on the place of their old city, Naxos revived in Torimenium, and the Naxians were the first Sicilians to welcome the deliverer of Sicily to her shores. Timoleon's first success was at Hadranum, the Sicil town where the great Sicilian fire god Hadranus had his chief abode. The men of Hadranum were at discord among themselves. Some would summon Hecatus, others invited Timoleon, but both Hecatus and Timoleon came. It was a race between them to get to Hadranum first. Timoleon, the later to arrive, surprised the enemy as they were resting outside the town and defeated them, although in numbers they were five to one. The gates of the city were then thrown open, and Hadranum became the headquarters of Timoleon's army. Soon afterwards, Hecatus suborned two men to assassinate the Corinthian leader, but the plot was frustrated at the last moment. And henceforth, the belief gained ground that Timoleon was hedged about by some divine protection. The fire god of Hadranum, too, had shown by miraculous signs that he approved of the stranger's enterprise. Others now allied themselves with Timoleon and presently Dionysus sent a message to him, proposing to surrender the island and asking only to be allowed to retire in safety to Corinth with his private property. 
The offer was at once accepted. The fortress and the mercenaries who guarded it and all the war gear were transferred to Timolean. Dionysus lived the rest of his life at Corinth in harmless obscurity. Many anecdotes were told of the trivial doings of the fallen lord of Sicily and his smart sayings. When someone contrasted his fortune with that of his father, he remarked, My father came into power when democracy was hated, but I, when tyranny was envied. Having won Ortigia sooner and more easily than could have been hoped, it remained for Timoleon to liberate the rest of Syracuse, which was in the hands of Hecatus, but Hecatus had powerful allies. 150 Carthaginian ships, under the command of Mago, sailed into the Great Harbor, and a Carthaginian force was admitted into Syracuse. The Corinthian commander in the island, Timolean himself still abode at Hadranum, was hard-pressed, but presently Mago and Hecatus went off to besiege Catane, and Neon, making a successful sally, occupied Acredina. At the same time, reinforcements from Corinth, which had been for some time delayed in Italy by the Carthaginian fleet, arrived in Sicily. It was now time for Timolean himself to appear at Syracuse. He pitched his camp on the south side of the banks of Anapus. Then another piece of luck befell him. The Greek mercenaries, both his own and those of Acadus, used to amuse their idle hours by fishing for eels at the mouth of the river. And as they had no cause of quarrel, though they were ready to kill each other for pay, they used to converse amicably on such occasions. One of Timolean's soldiers observed that the Greeks ought to combine against the barbarians, and the words coming to the ears of Mago caused him to conceive suspicions of Hecatus. He suddenly sailed off with all of his fleet, but when he reached Carthage, he slew himself and his countrymen crucified his corpse. This story, however, can hardly be whole explanation of Mago's strange behavior. Thus freed from his most formidable foe, Timolean soon drew Hecatus from Apopoli, and Syracuse was at length completely free. The Syracusans had found a deliverer who did not, like Dion, seek to be their master, and the fortress of Dionysus was pulled down. This act of demolition seemed the seal and assurance of their deliverance, but the city was dispeopled and desolate. Grass grew in the marketplace, and the first task of the deliverer was to repopulate it with new citizens. The Corinthians made proclamations at the festivals of elder Greeks, inviting emigrants to resettle Syracuse. Men whom the tyrants had banished flocked back and 60,000 men in all gathered both from west and east, with women and children, and restored the strength of the city. The laws of Diocles were issued anew, and the democratic constitution was revived, and in some respects remodeled. The most important innovation was the investing of Amphipolis, or priest of Olympian Zeus, with the chief magistracy. The priest was annually elected and gave his name to the year, but as he was chosen by lot out of three clans, his promotion to be the first magistrate of the Republic was a limitation of the democracy. Such was the renovation of Syracuse. And her new freedom was expressed, on some coins which were now issued by the symbol of an unbridled steed. Timolean then went on to do for other towns in Sicily what he had done for Syracuse. Many tyrants submitted, even Hecatus, who had withdrawn to Leontini. There was also work to be done against the Carthaginians, who were intent upon recovering lost ground and were preparing for another great effort to drive the Greeks out of Sicily. Five years after Timolean had landed in the island, a large armament sailed from Carthage and put in at Lilybium. It consisted of 200 galleys and 1,000 transports. There were 10,000 horses, some for war chariots, and the total number of the infantry was said to be 70,000. The flower of the host was the sacred band of 2,500 Carthaginian citizens, men of birth, and wealth. Hamilcar and Hasdrubal, the commanders, decided to march right across Sicily against Syracuse. But Timolean did not await them there. He would try to encounter them west of the Helissus in Punic, not in Grecian territory. Collecting such an army as he could, it amounted to no more than 10,000, he set out. On the march, he was deserted by 1,000 mercenaries, who clamored for arrears of pay and murmured at being led against such overwhelming odds. And with difficulty could he persuade the rest to go on. The Carthaginians were encamped on the west bank of the Cremissus, a branch of the river Hypsus, not that which washes a Cragus, but that which flows through the territory of Salinas. The city of Antella, now held by Campanians, was situated on the Cremissus, and it may be that the Punic army had halted with the hope of taking it. The field of battle, which was now fought between the Greeks and Phoenicians on the banks of the Cremissus, is unknown. 
In the morning the Greeks ascended a hill which divided them from the river, and on their way they met mules laden with wild celery, a herb which was used to wreathe sepulchral slabs. The soldiers were depressed by an incident which seemed ominous of evil, but of the same herb was wrought the crowns of victors in the Isthmian games. And Timolean hastened to interpret the chance as an augury of victory. He wreathed his head with a celery, and the whole host followed his example. Then two eagles appeared in the sky, one bearing a serpent, another fortunate omen. The Greeks halted on the hilltop, striving to pierce the mist which enveloped the ground below them, and when it melted away they saw the enemy crossing the stream. The war chariots crossed first, and behind came the sacred band. Timolean saw that his chance laying attacking before the whole army had crossed. He set down his cavalry to lead the attack, and himself followed with the foot. The war chariots prevented the horses from approaching the sacred band, so Timolean ordered the cavalry to move aside and assail the flank of the foe, leaving the way clear for the infantry. It is not recorded how the infantry swept away the war chariots, but they succeeded in reaching the sacred band. The Carthaginians, firm and immovable, withstood the onset of the spears, and the Greeks, finding that all their thrusting could not drive back or pierce the shield wall, flung down their spears and drew their swords. In the sword fight, it was no longer a matter of weight and courage. Skill and lithesome movements told. And the Greeks, superior in these qualities, utterly smote the sacred band. Meanwhile, the rest of the Punic army had crossed the river, and although the flower of it was destroyed, there were still enormous numbers to deal with, but fortune followed Temelane. Clouds had gathered and were hanging over the hills. And suddenly there burst forth a tempest of lightning and wind-driven rain and hail. The Greeks had their backs to the wind. The rain and hail drove into the faces of the enemy, who in the noise could not hear the commands of their officers. When the ground became muddy, the lighter armor of the Greeks gave them a great advantage over their foes, who floundered about, weighted down by their heavy mail. At length the Carthaginians could no longer stand their ground. And when they turned to fly, they found death in the Cremissus. Rapidly swollen by the rain, the river was now rushing along in a furious torrent, which swept men and horse to destruction. It is said that 15,000 prisoners were secured, that 10,000 men had been killed in the fight, not counting those who perished in the river. Rich spoils of gold and silver were taken in the camp. The choicest of the arms were sent to the Isthmus to be dedicated in the Temple of Poseidon. The battle was fallen out clean, contrary to what was like to have been. Timolan had gained a victory, which may be set beside Gelen's victory at Himera, but he did not follow it up. He made no attempt to cut short the Phoenician dominion in Sicily. Perhaps his inaction was due to less unwillingness than to embarrassments which threatened Syracuse. The tyrant of Catane, who had gone over to Timolan, declared against him. Hecatus seems to have seized again the tyranny of Leontini. And Timolan found himself engaged in a war with these two tyrants, Mamercus and Hecatus, who were aided by Carthaginian mercenaries. At last, both the tyrants were captured. The Syracusans put them both to death, and slew the wife and daughter of Hecatus in retaliation for the murder of the wife and sister of Dion. The Messenians also put to death their oppressor, Hippon, with torture, and the schoolboys were taken to the theater to witness a tyrant's death. Other cities under the yoke of tyranny were likewise liberated and some dispeopled towns, like Acragus and Gela, were colonized. After twenty years of troubles, Sicily was to have a respite now. Carthage made peace, the Helicis being again fixed as the frontier, and she undertook to do nothing to uphold tyrants in Greek cities. Timolan had now delivered Sicily from both domestic despots and from foreign foes, and having achieved his task, he laid down the powers which had been granted to him for its performance. Among the great men in Greek history, he holds a unique place, for the work which he accomplished was inspired neither by selfish ambition nor patriotism. He sought no power for himself. He labored in a strange land, for cities which might adopt him but were not his own. Patriotism, indeed, in the widest sense, might stimulate his ador when he fought for Hellas against the Phoenicians. But of Greek leaders who achieved as much as he, there is none whose conduct was, like Timolaeans, wholly guided by simple devotion to duty. The Syracusans gave him a property near Syracuse, and there he dwelt till his death, two years after his crowning victory. Occasionally he visited the city when the folk wished to ask for his counsel, but he had become blind, and these visits were rare. He was lamented by all Greek Sicily, and at Syracuse his memory was preserved by a group of public buildings called after him. The land had rest for twenty years after Timolaean's death. 
the direct results of his work did not amount to more than that. A tyrant arose then of a worse type than the elder Dionysus, and his hand was heavy upon Sicily. But the career of Agathocles lies outside the limits of this history. Thus ends chapter 11. Recording by Paul Sutton. A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 2, by John Bagnell Burry, Chapter 15, Part 12. Events in Great Greece On the mainland, as in the island, the Hellenic name seemed like to have been blotted out, there by the Phoenicians and the Italian mercenaries, here by the native races. The power of the elder Dionysus had kept at bay the Lucanians, the Mesopians, the Iapogeans, and other neighbors who pressed on Great Greece. But when his son was attacked by Dion, the Syracusan Empire dissolved of itself, and the barbarians of Italy, having no great power to fear, began anew to descend from the mountains on the Greek settlements of the coast. A number of tribes in the toe of the peninsula banded themselves together in a league with their federal capital at Consentia. And this Brescian League, as it was called, aimed at subduing all the Greek cities of the promontory, Tyrena, Hipponian, Nusibaris, and Traeus, and other places were captured. Men were not blind to the danger which menaced western Hellas, of being sunk under a tide of barbarism. One of the objects of Plato and Dion had been to drive all the barbarian mercenaries out of Greek Sicily. But in Italy the peril was greatest, and there was sore need of help from without. The appeal of Syracuse to her mother Corinth, and the coming of Timolean, put it into the mind of Terras, hard bestead by the neighboring peoples, to ask succor of her mother Sparta. The appeal came at a favorable moment. Sparta was not in a position to undertake any political scheme at home, and King Archidamus eagerly embraced the chance of going forth to fight for Hellas against the barbarians of the west, even as his father, Agrisilus, sixty years ago, had fought against the barbarians of the east. He got together a band of mercenaries, chiefly from Phocian survivors of the Sacred War, and sailed to Italy. For four or five years seemingly he strove against the barbarians, but without winning any decisive success, and was finally killed at Mandonia in a battle with the Lucanians. The ineffectual expedition of Archidamus was a striking contrast to the brilliant achievements of Timolean. But Terrace was not ungrateful for his efforts. She had commemorated her appeal to Sparta by many beautiful gold pieces on which the infant Taurus was shown supplicating Poseidon of Cape Teneris. The tragic issue of that appeal suggested a motive for another series of coins, and called forth one of those pathetic illusions which Greek art could achieve with matchless grace. Taurus is represented riding on his dolphin and sadly contemplating a helmet. It is the helmet of the Spartan king who had fallen in his service. Taurus was soon forced to seek a new champion. She invited Alexander of Molossia, the uncle of Alexander the Great, and this king saw and seized the chance of founding an empire in the west, of doing there on a small scale what his nephew was accomplishing on a mighty scale in Asia. He was an able man, and success attended his arms. On the east coast of Italy, he subdued Mesopians, and pushed as far north as Sympontum, which he captured. In the west, he smote the Brescian League, seizing Consentia and liberating Turina. His power was so great in the south that Rome had made a treaty with him and it is possible that his designs reached to Sicily. The welcome given to this ally and deliverer was also reflected in the money of Taurus. Coins were struck with the seated eagle of Dodona, and the thunderbolt of Zeus beside it. But Taurus presently felt her own freedom menaced by the conqueror, and she renounced her alliance. War ensued, Therai upholding Alexander. The barbarians profited by these struggles to rise against their conqueror, and a battle was fought at Pandosia. During the engagement, a Lucanian exile in the Tarentine army stabbed the king in the back, and the design of an Epirot empire bestriding the Hadriatic perished with him. This befell not long after the overthrow of the Persian monarchy on the field of Guagamela. But Alexander's work had not been futile. Henceforth, Terrace was able to keep the upper hand over her Italian neighbors. End of chapter 15, part 12. Recording by Paul Sutton. Chapter 16, Part 1 of A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 2, by John Bagnell Bury. Chapter 16, Part 1 The Rise of Macedonia. After the Battle of Mantinea, when Thebes retired from her aggressive policy, Athens stood first, the most important state in old Greece. She would have been free to devote all her energies to re-establishing her power on the coasts of the northern Aegean and by the gates of the Pontic waters, and would doubtless have successfully achieved this main object of her policy, if two outlying powers had not suddenly stepped upon the scene to thwart her and cut short her empire. These powers, Caria and Macedon, lay in opposite quarters of the Greek world. Both were monarchies, both were semi-Hellenic. Macedon was a land power, Caria was both a land power and a sea power, but it was as a sea power that she was formidable to Athens. Of the two, it was Caria which seemed to Greece the country with the future, and to Athens the dangerous rival. Of Macedonia little account was taken by the civilized world, and Athens expected that she could always manage it. No prophet in his happiest hour of clairvoyance would have predicted that within thirty years Caria would have sunk back into insignificance, leaving nothing to posterity save the sepulchre of her prince, while Macedon would bear the arts and wisdom of Hellas to the ends of the earth. Section 1 Athens regains the Chersonese and Elboea. The death of Epaminondas delivered Athens from her most dangerous and active enemy, but the intrigues which he had spun against her in the north bore results after his death. Alexander of Ferrae, who had become the ally of the Thebans, seized the island of Peparetus with his pirate ships, and defeated an Athenian armament under Leosthenes. He then repeated the daring enterprise of the Spartan Telotius, sailing rapidly into the Piraeus, plundering the shops, and disappearing as rapidly with ample spoil. The Athenians replied by making a close defensive and offensive alliance with the federal state of the Thessalians. The stone of the treaty is preserved. The allies of both parties are included. The Thessalians bind themselves not to conclude the war against Alexander without the Athenians, and the Athenians in likewise without the president, Aachen, and league of the Thessalians. And the treasurers of Athens are directed to pull down the stele on which the former alliance with Alexander had been inscribed. But the Athenians vented their indignation within their own walls. Since the capture of Oropus, there had been signs of smouldering discontent at the conduct of affairs. Callistratus had been indicted and acquitted in the matter of Oropus, but his credit had been roughly shaken, and Alexander's insult to the city at her very doors excited the popular wrath to such a pitch that the statesman, as well as the defeated admiral, was condemned to death, and escaped only by a timely flight. Thus the ablest Athenian statesman of the fourth century passed from the stage, and no sympathy followed him. Some years later he ventured to return from his Macedonian exile, hoping that the wrath of his countrymen would have passed away. The wrath had passed, but it had not been replaced by regret. On reaching Athens he sought the refuge of suppliants at the altar of the twelve gods, but no voice was raised to save him and the executioner carried out the doom of the people. The Athenians were always austere masters of their statesmen, and it sometimes appears to us, though in truth we seldom have sufficient knowledge of the circumstances, to justify a confident judgment, that they unreasonably expected, and in gathering where no seed had been sown. The public indignation, which had been aroused by the daring stroke of the tyrant of Ferrae, was enhanced, by the bad tidings which came from Thrace. King Cotes, the reviver of the Odrysian power, had succeeded in laying hold of Sestos and almost the whole peninsula 
which guards the entrance to the Propontis, in spite of the Athenian fleet. Soon afterwards the old king was murdered, and his realm was divided among his three sons. This change was advantageous to Athens, as she could play off one Thracian prince against another. The territory on the Propontis fell to Cersobleptes, who was supported by the Oiboian Caridemus, a mercenary captain, who had frequently been employed in the service of Athens, and had married, like Iphicrates, a daughter of the Thracian king. Cersobleptes engaged to hand over to Athens the entire Chersonese, except Cardia, the enemy of Athens, which was to remain independent. But there was no fleet on the spot to enforce the immediate fulfillment of the promise, and, when an admiral was presently sent out, he was defeated by Caridemus. At length a capable man was sent, Caras, a daring, dissolute, and experienced son of Ares, who speedily captured Cestus, and punished the inhabitants for their unfaithfulness by an unmerciful slaughter. Cersobleptes was forced to change his attitude, and the peninsula was recovered. The Athenians, adopting the same policy which they had followed in Samos, sent out settlers to the Chersonese. In the same year Euboea was won back to the Athenian League, and there even seemed a fair prospect of accomplishing what of all things would have rejoiced the most, the recovery of long-lost Amphipolis. But their new scheme against Amphipolis may be said to open, in a certain way, a new chapter in a history of Greece. Section 2. Philip the Second of Macedonia The man for whom Macedonia had waited long came at last. We have met once and again in the course of our history kings of that ambiguous country, Hellenic and yet not Hellenic, Alexander playing a double part at Plataea, Perdiccas playing, with consummate skill, a double part in the war of Sparta and Athens. But now the hour of Macedonia had come, and we must look more closely at the cradle of the power, which was destined to change the face, not only of the Greek, but of the Oriental world. In their fortress of Aegea, the Macedonian kings had ruled for ages, with absolute sway over the lands and the northern and northwestern coasts of the Termaic Gulf, which formed Macedonia in the strictest sense. The Macedonian people and their kings were of Greek stock, as their traditions and the scanty remains of their language combined to testify. They were a military people, and they extended their power westward and northward over the peoples of the hills, so that Macedonia, in a wider sense, reached to the borders of the Illyrians in the west, and of the Paeonians in the north. These hill tribes, the Orestians, Lunkestians, and others, belonged to the Illyrian race, and they were ever seeking to cast off the bond of subjection which attached them to the kings of Aegea. In Illyria and Paeonia they had allies, who were generally ready to support them in rebellion, and the dangers which Macedonia had constantly to encounter, and always to dread, from half-subjugated vassals and warlike enemies, had effectually hindered her hitherto from playing any conspicuous part in the Greek world. Thus the Macedonian kingdom consisted of two heterogeneous parts, and the Macedonian kings had two different characters. Over the Greek Macedonians of the coast, the king ruled immediately, they were his own people, his own companions. Over the Illyric folks of the hills, he was only overlord. They were each subject to its own chieftain, and the chieftains were his unruly vassals. It is clear that Macedonia could never become a great power until these vassal peoples had been completely tamed and brought under the direct rule of the kings, and until the Illyrian and Paeonian neighbors had been taught a severe lesson. These were the tasks which awaited the man who should make Macedonia. The kings had made some efforts to introduce Greek civilization into their land. Archelaus, who succeeded Perdiccas, had been a builder and a roadmaker, and following the example of Greek tyrants, he had succeeded in making his court at Pella a center for famous artists and poets. Euripides, 
the tragic poet, Timotheus, the most eminent leader of a new school of music, Zoexis the painter, and many another may have found pleasure and relief in a change from the highly civilized cities of the South to a new and fresher atmosphere where there were no politicians. It is sometimes said that Macedonia was still in the Homeric stage of development. There is truth in this, but the position of the monarch was different from that of the Homeric king. No law bound the Macedonian monarch. His will was binding on his subjects, and against him they had only one solitary right. In the case of a capital charge, the king could not put a Macedonian to death without the authority of a general assembly. This was the charter of Macedonian liberty. Fighting and hunting were the chief occupations of this vigorous people. A Macedonian, who had not killed his man, wore a cord round his waist, and until he had slain a wild boar, he could not sit at table with the men. Like the Thracians, they drank deep. Bacchic mysteries had been introduced. It was in Macedonian air, on the banks of Lake Ludius, that Euripides drew inspiration for his Bacchae. We have seen how Perdiccas slew his guardian and stepfather Ptolemy, and reigned alone. Six years later, the Illyrians swooped down upon Macedonia, and the king was slain in battle. It was a critical moment for the kingdom. The land was surrounded by enemies, for the Paeonians at the same time menaced it in the north, and from the east a Thracian army was advancing to set a pretender on the throne. The rightful heir, Amyntas, the son of the slain king, was a child. But there was one man in the land who was equal to the situation, the child's uncle, Philip, and he took the government and the guardianship of the boy into his own hands. We have already met Philip as one of the hostages who were carried off to the Thebes. He had lived there for a few years, and drunk in the military and political wisdom of Epaminondas and Pelopidas. We know not why he was allowed to return to his home soon after the death of Ptolemy. Perhaps it was thought that his affections had been firmly won by Thebes, and that he would be more useful to her in Macedonia. Philip was twenty-four years old when he was called upon to rescue his country and the dynasty of his own house. The danger consisted in the number of his enemies, foreign invaders and domestic pretenders, and pretenders supported by foreign powers. Philip's first step was to buy off the Paeonians by a large sum of money, his next to get rid of the pretenders. One of these, Argaeus, was assisted by Athens with a strong fleet. Philip defeated him, and did all in his power to come to terms with Athens. He released without ransom the Athenians, whom he had made prisoners in the battle, and he renounced all claim to the possession of Amphipolis, which his brother, King Perdiccas, had occupied with a garrison. Gold easily induced the Thracians to desert the pretender whom they had come forth to support. But the Paeonians were quieted only for the moment, and the Illyrians were still in the land, besetting Macedonian towns. It was necessary to deal with these enemies once for all, and to assert decisively the military power of Macedon. Philip had new ideas on the art of war, and he spent the winter in remodeling and training his army. When the spring-tide came round, he had ten thousand foot soldiers and six hundred horsemen, thoroughly disciplined and of great physical strength. With this force he marched against the Paeonians and quelled them in a single battle. He then turned against the Illyrians, who refused to evacuate the towns they held in the Lincestian territory. A great battle was fought, in which Philip tested his new military ideas. The Illyrians left seven thousand on the field, and the vassals of the highlands, who had supported the invaders, were reduced to abject submission. When he had thus established his power over his dependencies, and cleared the land of foes, Philip lost little time in pushing eastward, on the side of Thrace. The motive for this rapid advance 
was the imperative necessity of obtaining gold. Without gold, Philip could not develop his country, or carry out his military schemes. The Macedonians were not a commercial folk, and therefore his prospects depended on possessing land, which produced the precious ore. In Mount Pangaeus, on his eastern frontier, there were rich sources of gold, and incited by him, a number of people from the opposite island of Tassos, where the art of mining was well understood, had crossed over to Crenides on that mountain, and formed a settlement. But in order to control the new mines, it was indispensable to become master of the great fortress on the Strimon, the much-coveted Amphipolis. The interests of Philip thus came into direct collision with the interests of Athens. Here Philip revealed his skill in diplomacy. When he released the Athenian prisoners, he professed to resign all claim to Amphipolis, and on this basis negotiated a peace with Athens. When the treaty was concluded, a secret article was agreed upon, by which Philip undertook to conquer Amphipolis for Athens, and Athens undertook to surrender to him the free town of Pydna. It is probable that this secret engagement was not made until Philip had actually attacked Amphipolis, and the Amphipolitans, preferring Athens to Macedon, had sent a request for Athenian succor. The moment was inconvenient, as the forces of Athens could not be spared from the Chersonese, and the Athenians, failing to grasp the situation, trusted the promises of Philip. Of course, Philip deceived them, and they deserved no sympathy, for their own part of the agreement was a shameful act of treachery to Pydna, their ally. Their orators might cry out against the perfidy of the Macedonian, but the truth is that they sought to make Philip a tool of their own designs, and he showed them that in diplomacy he was not their dupe but their master. When Philip had taken Amphipolis, he converted the Thasian settlement of Cranides into a great fortress, which he called after his own name, Philippi. He had thus two strong stations to secure Mount Pangaeus, and the yield of the gold mines, which were soon actively worked, amounted to at least one thousand talents a year. No Greek state was so rich. The old capital, Aegaea or Edessa, was now definitely abandoned, and the seat of government was established at Pella, the favorite residence of Archelaus. This coming down from Aegaea to Pella is significant of the opening of a new epoch in Macedonian history. Not long afterwards Philip captured Pydna. If the seizure of Amphipolis was an injury to Athens, the capture of Pydna was an insult. He then took Potidaea, but instead of keeping it for himself, handed it over to the Olynthians, to whom he also ceded Anthemus. The Olynthians, alarmed by his operations on the Strimon, had made proposals to Athens for common action against Macedon. The Athenians, trusting Philip, had rejected the overtures. But when they found that they had been duped, they would have been ready and glad to cooperate with Olynthus, and it was to prevent such a combination that Philip dexterously propitiated the Olynthians, intending to devour them on some future day. With the exception of Methony, the Athenians had no foothold now on the coast of the Thermaic Gulf. They formed alliances with the Thracians of the West, who were indignant at the Macedonian occupation of Crenides, and with the Paeonian and Illyrian kings, who were smarting under their recent discomfitures. But Philip prevented the common action of the allies. He forced the Paeonians to become his vassals, his ablest general, his only general, he used to say himself, Parmenion, inflicted another overwhelming defeat of the Illyrians, and the Thracians, again bought off, renounced their rights to Mount Pangaeus. But the success cost Philip little. Having established his mining town, he assumed the royal title, setting his nephew aside, and devoted himself during the next few years to the consolidation of his kingdom and the creation of a national army. 
It was in these years that he made Macedonia. His task, as has been already indicated, was to unite the hill tribes, along with his own Macedonians of the coast, into one nation. The means by which he accomplished this was military organization. He made the Highlanders into professional soldiers, and kept them always under arms, caught by the infection of the military spirit, seduced by the motives of emulation and ambition. They were to forget that they were Orestians or Lincestians, and blend into a single homogeneous Macedonian people. To complete this consummation would be a work of years, but Philip conceived the project clearly and set about it at once. A professional army with a national spirit, that was the new idea. Both infantry and cavalry were indeed organized in territorial regiments. Perhaps Philip could not have ventured at first on any other system. But common pride and common desire of promotion, common hope of victory, tended to obliterate these distinctions, and they were done away with under Philip's son. The heavy cavalry were called companions of the king and royal soldiers, and they were more honorable than the infantry. Among the infantry there was one body of royal guards, the silver-shielded Hippaspistae. The famous Macedonian phalanx, which Philip drilled, was merely a modified form of the usual battle-line of Greek spearmen. The men in the phalanx stood freer, in a more open array, and used a longer spear, so that the whole line, though still cumbrous enough, was more easily wielded, and the effect was produced not merely by the sheer pressure of a heavy mass of men, but by the skilful manipulation of weapons. Nor was the phalanx intended to decide a battle like the deep columns of Epaminondas. Its function was to keep the front of the foe in play, while the cavalry, in wedge-like squadrons, rode into the flanks. It was by these tactics that Philip had won his victory over the Illyrians. But Greece paid little heed to the things which Philip was doing. The Athenians might indeed encourage his Illyrian and Paeonian enemies, and urge the Thracians to drive him from Mount Pangaeus. But though he had outwitted them, they could not yet see that he was an enemy of a different stamp from a Cotis or a Cersobleptes. Having managed Macedonia for a hundred years, they had little fear that as soon as they had the time to spare, they would easily manage it again. When Philip married Olympus, the daughter of an Epirot prince, the event could cause no sensation. The birth of a son a year later stirred no man's heart in Greece, for who, in his wildest dreams, could have foreseen in the Macedonian infant the greatest conqueror who had yet been born into the world? If it had been revealed to man in that autumn that a power had started up which was to guide history into new paths, they would have turned their eyes not to Pella, but to Halicarnassus. End of chapter 16, part 1Chapter 16, Part 2 Of a History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 2, by John Bagnell Bury. Chapter 16, Part 2 Section 3, Mausolus of Caria Caria, like Macedonia, was peopled by a double race, the native Carians and the Greek settlers on the coast. But the native Carians were further removed than the Illyrians from the Greeks. The Illyrians spoke a tongue of the same Indo-Germanic stock as the Greeks. The Carians belonged to an older race, which held the region of the Aegean before Greeks and Illyrians came. Yet the Carians were in closer touch with Greece than the Greeks of Macedonia. 
The Greeks of Caria were always abreast of Greek civilization, and they had assimilated and tutored the natives of the land. Tralles and Mulassa were to all appearance Greek towns. Greek was the dominant language of the country. A province of the Persian Empire, Caria, had yet a certain independent bond of union among her cities in an Amphictonic league which met in the temple of Zeus at Lagina. It was a religious union, though it might be used for purposes of common political action. But political unity was given to Caria not by federation, but by monarchy. A citizen of Mylasa, named Hecatomnus, succeeded in establishing his rule over the whole land, soon after the death of Tisopfernes, and the great king esteemed it his most prudent policy to acknowledge the dynasty of Caria as his official satrap. Both Hecatomnus and his son Mausolus, who succeeded to his power, never failed to pay their tribute to the treasury of Susa, or to display the becoming submission to the Persian king. Only once, as we have seen, when all the western satraps rebelled, did Mausolus fall short in his loyalty. The Carian dynasts, they never assumed the royal title, thus secured for themselves a free hand. With the constitutions of the Carian cities, their sovereignty did not interfere, Thus, even in their own city, Milasa, the popular assembly still passes decrees, and these decrees are ratified not by Mausolus, but by the three tribes, perhaps a sort of aristocratic council. In fact, Hecatomnus and Mausolus held in relation to the Carian states an analogous position to that which Pisistratus and his sons held in the Athenian state. They were the actual rulers, but officially they did not exist. The differences were that the Karen dynast held the official position of Persian satrap, and was tyrant of a number of states which were independent of each other. These native satraps brought the Greek towns of the coast, Halicarnassus, Iasus, Cnidus, perhaps Miletus itself, gradually under their power, and Mausolus annexed the neighboring land of Lycia. Thus, at the time of Philip's accession to the throne of Macedonia, a rich and ambitious monarchy had arisen on the southeastern shores of the Aegean. To develop his power, it was desirable for Mausolus to win the lordship of the islands adjacent to his coasts, and it was clearly necessary to form a strong navy. The change of the satrap's residence from inland Milassa to Halicarnassus on the sea is thus politically significant. Caria was to become a sea power. Mausolus built himself a strong castle on the little island of Sepirion, in front of the city, and constructed two harbors, one for ships of war, the other for ships of trade. The great islands of Rhodes, Kos, and Chios, which Mausolus especially coveted, belonged to the Athenian alliance. But recently, there was much discontent at the Athenian supremacy, and there were good grounds for this feeling. The reversion to the policy of Clerochis in neighboring Samos, as well as in distant Potidaea, excited apprehensions for the future, and the exactions of the rapacious and irresponsible mercenaries, whom Athens regularly employed, but did not regularly pay, caused many complaints. There were moreover strong oligarchical parties in these states, which would be glad to severe connection with Athens. The scheme of the Carian prince was first to induce these islands to detach themselves from Athens, and then to bring them under his own sway. He fanned the flame of discontent, and the three islands jointly revolted from the Athenian alliance, and were supported by Byzantium. Athens immediately sent naval forces to Chios, under Cabrias and Cares, two of the generals of the year, and the town was attacked by land and sea. But in trying to enter the harbor, Cabrias, who led the way, was assailed on all sides, and fell fighting. Thus the Athenians lost the most gallant of their soldiers, a commander of whom it was said that he never spared himself, and always spared his men. 
The attack on Chios was abandoned, and the Chians, much elated, and commanding a fleet of hundred ships, proceeded to aggressive warfare against the outsettlers of Athens and located Samos. With only sixty ships, Cares could do nothing, and as many more were hastily sent under the command of Timotheus and Iphigrates. Under three such generals, much might be expected from such a fleet, but more would probably have been accomplished under any one of them alone. They relieved Samos, and made an unsuccessful diversion to the Propontes, hoping to take Byzantium. Then they sailed to Chios, and concerted a plan of attack in the strait between the island and the mainland. But the day proved stormy, and the two veteran admirals, Iphicrates and Timotheus, deemed that it would be rushed to fight. Chares, however, against their judgment, attacked the enemy, and being unsupported was repulsed with loss. The ineffectual operations of two such tried and famous generals were a cruel disappointment to the Athenians, who had given them an adequate fleet. Chares, furious at the behavior of his colleagues, formally accused them of deliberate treachery, and was supported by the orator Aristophon. The charge was that they had received bribes from the Chians and the Rhodians. Countercharges were brought against Chares by Timotheus and Iphicrates, but the sympathies of Athens were altogether given to the commander, who erred on the side of boldness. Iphicrates, however, had less political influence, and therefore fewer enemies than Timotheus, and he knew how to conciliate the people. He was accordingly acquitted. Timotheus, always haughty and unpopular, probably assumed a posture as haughty and unbending as ever. Aristophon probably pressed him hard, and he was fined hundred talents. Rich as he was, he was unable to pay this enormous sum, and he withdrew to Calchis, where he died soon afterwards. Thus within twelve months the Athenians lost the two men, Cabrias and Timotheus, who had built up their second empire. They afterwards recognized that the measure which they had dealt out to Timotheus was hard, and they permitted his son, who had himself been tried and acquitted on the same charge, to settle the fine by a payment of ten talents. Carus now went forth as sole commander to sustain the war against the recreant allies. But he went unfurnished with money to pay his troops. He found the means of supplying this deficiency in the disturbed state of Asia Minor. The satrap of Hellespontine, Phrygia, Artabazus, had rebelled, but was not strong enough to hold his own against the king's troops. Carus came to his rescue, gained a brilliant victory over the satraps, who were arrayed against him, and received from the grateful Atrabazus money, which enabled him to pay and maintain the army. The victory and the money pleased the Athenians, but Artaxerxes was deeply incensed. The news presently reached Athens that the great king was equipping a vast armament in Syria and Cilicia to avenge the audacity of Carus. How much truth there was in this report it is impossible to say, but it evoked an outburst of patriotism and supplied the Athenian orators with material for invectives and declamations. Men began to talk in earnest of realizing the dream of Isocrates, of convoking a pan-Hellenic congress and arming Hellas against the barbarian. Demosthenes, who was now beginning to rise into public notice, delivered in these days a speech, which was more to the point than many of his later, more famous orations. He showed that the alarm was premature, and that the notion of sending round appeals to the cities of Greece was foolish. Your envoys will do nothing more than rhapsodize in their round of visits. The truth was that Athens could in no case think of embarking at this juncture in a big war, she had not the means. Isocrates himself raised his voice for peace, in a remarkable pamphlet, distinguished by the nobility of tone and the wits of view which always mark his writings. It was a scathing condemnation of imperialism. 
passing from the momentary state of affairs, he looked out into the future, and boldly declared that the only salvation for Athens lay in giving up her naval empire. It is that, he said, which brought us to this pass, it is that which caused the fall of our democracy. He showed the calamities which the empires of Athens and Sparta had drawn upon themselves and Greece. But it is to be observed that, when a moment had come, at which his favorite plan of a common attack on Persia seemed at length feasible, he was wise enough not to advise it. He looks to Thrace, not to Persia, to find lands for endowing those needy Greeks who were rowing about for subsistence. In the end prudent counsels prevailed. Caris was recalled, negotiations were opened with the revolted allies, and the peace was made. Athens recognized the independence of the three islands, Chios, Kos, and Rhodes, and of the city of Byzantium. It was not long before Lesbos also severed itself from the Athenian alliance, which thus lost all its important members in the eastern Aegean, and in the west, Corcura fell away about the same time. All happened as Mausolus foresaw. He helped the oligarchies to overthrow the popular governments, and then gave them the protection of Carian garrisons. But the prince did not live to develop his empire. Soon after the success of his policy against Athens, he died, leaving his power to his widow Artemisia. The opportunity was seized by the Democrats of Rhodes to regain their freedom, and they appealed to Athens. After what had passed, they had little right to expect a hearing, and under the influence of the wise and pacific statesmen who now controlled the assembly, their appeal was refused. In spite of the hot and somewhat sentimental pleadings of Demosthenes, who upheld the extraordinary doctrine that Athens was bound, whenever she was called upon, to intervene to support democracy against oligarchy. Artemisia soon recovered her grip on Rhodes. Caria remained for another twenty years under dynasts of the house of Hecatomnus, until it submitted to Alexander the Great. The expansion of the Carian power, which seemed probable under the active administration of Mausolus, was never fulfilled. Though we know nothing of his personal character, the outward appearance of Mausolus is familiar to us. The islanders of the north, who possess in our capital his genuine portrait, and the headless figure of his queen. The colossal statue, made at latest soon after his death, represents a man of a noble cast of face, of a type presumably Carian, certainly not Greek, and with the hair curiously brushed back from his brow. This statue stood, along with that of Artemisia, within the sepulchral tomb, which he probably began, and which she certainly completed. Such a royal tomb seems to take us back to the days of prehistoric Greece. It strikes one almost like a glorified resurrection of one of the old chamber sepulchres of the Lelegis, which are strewed about the Helicarnassian peninsula. It rose above the harbour at Helicarnassus, conspicuous from the sea, crowned with a chariot on its apex. The building was adorned with friezes, wrought by four of the most illustrious sculptors of the day, of whom Scopas himself was one. The precious fragments of these works of art are the legacy which the Carian realm has bequeathed to mankind, these and a new ward which the tomb of Mausolus added to the vocabularies of Europe. End of chapter 16, part 2Chapter 16, Part 3 Of a History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 2, by John Bagnell Bury. Chapter 16, Part 3 
Section 4. Focus and the Sacred War. In the meantime, another of the states of northern Greece seemed likely to win the position of supremacy, which Thessaly had seemed on the eve of winning, and which Boeotia had actually held for a few years. Phocis now came forward in her turn, and enjoyed a brief moment of expansion and conquest, a flashlight which vanished almost as soon as it appeared. In succession to the national leaders, Jason of Ferea and Epaminondas of Thebes, we now meet Onomarchus of Elatea. Into this career of aggrandizement, Phocis was thrust by the aggression of her neighbors, rather than lured by the lust of conquest. The Pokians had never been zealous adherents of the Boeotian alliance, which they were forced to join after the Battle of Leuctra, and they cut themselves loose from it after the death of Epaminondas. But those Thebes could no longer maintain her wider supremacy in Greece, and independent Phocis was a source of constant danger to her, in her narrower supremacy in Boeotia, as the western cities of the land could always find in Phocis a stay and support for their own independence. It was therefore deemed necessary by the politicians of Thebes to strike a blow at their western neighbors. One of the instruments of which Epaminondas had made use to promote his city's influence in the north was the old Amphictyonic League, which for a hundred years had never appeared on the scene of history. At an assembly of this body, soon after Leuctra, the Thebans accused the Spartans of having seized the Cadmea in time of peace. The Spartans were sentenced to pay a fine of five hundred talents. The fine could not indeed be exacted, but they were doubtless excluded from the temple of Delphi. The Thebans resolved to wield against Phocis the same engine which they had wielded against Sparta. The nature of the pretext is uncertain, but it was not difficult to find a misdemeanor which would seem grave enough to the Thessalians and Locrians, inveterate enemies of Phocis, to justify a sentence of condemnation. A number of rich and prominent Phocians were condemned to pay large fines for sacrilege. And when these sums were not paid within the prescribed time, the Amphictions decreed that the lands of the defaulters should be taken from them, and consecrated to the Delphian god, and a tablet with the inscribed decree was set up at Delphi. The men who were implicated in the alleged sacrilege determined to resist, and they appealed to their fellow countrymen, in whatever form of federal assembly the Phocian cities used to discuss their common interests, to protect themselves and their property against the threatened danger. The man who took the lead in organizing the resistance was Philomelus, a wealthy citizen of Ledon. He discerned clearly that mercenaries would be required to defend Phocis against her enemies, Boetians, Locrians, and Thessalians, and made the bold and practical proposal that Delphi should be seized, since the treasures of Delphi would supply at need the sinews of war. It's hardly likely that he openly avowed the true reason of the importance of seizing Delphi. It was enough to assert the old rights of the Phocians over rocky Pitho, rights for which he could appeal to the highest authority, the sacred text of Homer. And to point out that the Delphians were implicated in the unjust decrees of the Amphictyons. The proposals of Philomelus were adopted, and he was appointed general of the Phocian forces with full powers. His first step was to visit Sparta, not only as the enemy of Thebes, but as being in the same case as Phocis, lying under an Amphictyonic sentence which had recently been renewed and confirmed. King Archidamus welcomed the proposals of the Phocian plenipotentiary, but Sparta stood in a rather awkward position. Hitherto she had always supported the Delphians in maintaining their independence against Phocian claims, as, for instance, when in the days of Pericles she restored them to their shrine after the Phocians, with Athenian aid, had dispossessed them. It would consequently have been a flagrant inconsistency in Spartan policy to turn against the Delphians now, 
so that Archidamus did not openly avow his sympathy with the Phocian cause, but privately he supported it, by placing fifteen talents in the hands of Philomelus. With this sum and fifteen talents from his own purse, Philomelus was able to hire some mercenaries, and with their help to seize Delphi. The Locrians of neighboring Amphissa, whom the Delphians had summoned to their aid, arrived too late, and were repulsed. Philomelus did no hurt to the people of Delphi, excepting only the clan of the Trachiade, bitter Antiphocians, whom he put to death. The first object of Philomelus was to enlist Hellenic opinion in his favor. He had the secret sympathy of Sparta, and he might count on the friendship of Athens, who had always been an ally of Phocis, and was now an enemy of Thebes. He sent envoys to Sparta, to Athens, to Thebes itself, to explain the Phocian position. These envoys were instructed to say that in seizing Delphi the Phocians were simply resuming their rights over the temple, which belonged to them, and had been usurped by others, and to declare that they would act merely as administrators of the Panhellenic sanctuary, and were ready to allow all the treasures to be weighed and numbered, and to be responsible to Greece for their safety. In consequence of these embassies, Sparta came forward from her reserve, and openly allied herself with Phocis, while Athens and some smaller states promised their support. The Thebans and their Amphictyonic friends resolved to make war. In the meantime, Philomelus had fortified the Delphic sanctuary by a wall, and had collected an army of five thousand men, with which he could easily hold the position. It was his wish that the oracle responses from the mystic tripod should continue to be given as usual to those who came to consult Apollo, and he was anxious above all to receive some voice of approval or encouragement from the god. But the Delphian priestess was stubborn to the Phocian intruder, and refused to prophesy. He tried to seat her by force upon the tripod, and in her alarm she bade him do as he would. He eagerly seized these words as an oracular sanction of his acts. It soon became necessary to raise more money for paying the mercenaries, and for this purpose Philomelus, refraining as long as he could from touching the treasures of the shrine, levied a contribution from the rich Delphians. At first he had to deal only with the Locrians, whom he finally defeated in a hot battle near the Phadriad Cliffs, which rise sheer above Delphi. The loss of the Locrians was heavy. Some of them, driven to the edge, hurled themselves down the cliffs. This victory forced the Thebans to prepare actively to intervene. The Amphictyonic assembly met at Thermopylae, and it was decided that an Amphictyonic army should enforce the decree of the League against the Phocians, and rescue Delphi from their power. Philomelus, with the forces which he had, might hold his own against the Locrians, but not against the host which would now be arrayed against him. There were only two means of saving Phocis. One was the active support of Athens or Sparta, or both. The other was the organization of a large army of mercenaries. As neither Athens nor Sparta showed willingness to give any immediate assistance, nothing remained but the other alternative. And that alternative, as Philomelus must have foreseen from the beginning, would not be possible without the control of far larger sums of money than could either be contributed by the Phocian cities, or extorted from the Delphian proprietors. No resource remained but to make use of the treasures of the temple. At first Philomelus was scrupulous. He only borrowed from the god enough to meet the demand of the moment. But, as habitude blunted the first feelings of scrupulousness, and as needs grew more pressing, the Phocians dealt as freely with the sacred vessels and the precious dedications as if they were their own. By offering large pay, Philomelus assembled an army of ten thousand men, who cared little whence the money came. An indecisive war with the Thebans and Locrians was waged for some time, 
till at length the Phocians underwent a severe defeat near Neon, on the north side of Mount Parnassus. The general fought desperately, and covered with wounds, he was driven to the verge of a precipice, where he had to choose between capture and self-destruction. He hurled himself down from the cliff, and perished. The Thebans imagined that the death of Philomelus meant the doom of the Phocian cause, and they retired after the battle. But it was not so. In Onomarchus of Eletaia, who had been associated with him in the command of the army, he had a successor as able as himself. The retreat of the enemy gave Onomachus time to reorganize the troops and collect reinforcements, and he not only coined the gold and silver ornaments of the temple, but beat the bronze and iron donatives into arms for the soldiers. He then entered upon a short career of signal successes. Westward, he forced Locrian and Fissa to submit. To northward he reduced Doris, and crossing the passes of Mount Oeta, he made himself master of Thermopylae, and captured the Locrian Thronion, near the eastern gate of the pass. Eastward he took possession of Orchonemus, and restored those of the inhabitants, who had escaped the sword of the Thebans ten years before. The Thebans, meanwhile, were hampered by want of money, and having neither mines like Philip, nor a rich temple like Phocis, they decided to replenish their treasury by sending out a body of troops on foreign service. We have already seen Sparta and Athens raising money by the same means, and the Theban soldiers who now went forth under Pamines hired themselves out to the same Persian satrap Artabazus, for whom the Athenian Chorus had won a victory over the army of the king. Pamines was equally successful, but it does not seem that his expedition profited the Boeotian treasury, for he presently became suspected by Artabazus, who threw him into prison. Among the most important uses to which Onomarchus applied the gold of Delphi was the purchase of the alliance of the tyrants of Ferrae. By this policy, Thessaly was divided, and the Sicilian League, beset by the hostility of Ferrae, was unable to cooperate with the Thebans against Phocis. But the Thessalians, being hard-pressed, turned for help to their northern neighbor, Philip of Macedon, and his intervention south of Mount Olympus marks a new stage in the course of the Sacred War. Philip had lately deprived Athens of her last ally on the Termai Gulf, by the capture of Messoni, the Athenian expedition of relief coming too late to save it. He readily acceded to the request of the Thessalians to act as their general. It was a convenient occasion to begin the push southward and lay the foundation of Macedonian supremacy in Greece, plans which were now coming within the range of practical effort. Against the forces which Philip led to the support of the Thessalian League, it was hopeless for Lycophron of Ferrae to stand alone. The tyrant was lost, unless he were succored by the arm of those who had already furnished him with gold. Nor did the Phocians leave him unsupported. The strength of Onomarchus was now so great that he could spare a force of seven thousand men for a campaign in the north. But his brother Philus, to whom he entrusted the command, was beaten out of Thessaly by Philip. Then Onomarchus went forth himself, at the head of the whole Phocian host, about twenty thousand, to rescue his ally. Far superior in numbers, he defeated the Macedonian army in two battles, with serious loss. Philip was compelled to withdraw into Macedonia, and Onomarchus delivered Thessaly, into the hands of Lycophron. At this moment, the power of the Phocians was at its height. Their supremacy reached from the shores of the Corinthian Gulf to the slopes of Olympus. They were masters of the fast of Thermopylae, and they had two important posts in western Boeotia. For, in addition to Orchomenus, they won Coronea immediately after the Thessalian expedition. If all these things had befallen at some other epoch, the Phocian power might have endured for a time, 
and the name of their able leader might have been more familiar to posterity. But Onomarchus had fallen on evil days. He and his petty people were swept away in the onward course of a greater nation and a greater chief. Philip of Macedon speedily retrieved the humiliation which he had suffered at the hands of his Phocian foes. In the following year he descended again into Thessaly, and Onomarchus went forth again to succor his ally or dependent. In the preceding campaign, Philip had captured the port of Pagasae and placed in it a Macedonian garrison. It was important not only for Perae, but for Athens, that this post should not remain in his hands, and Carus was sent with an Athenian fleet to assist the Phocians in recovering it. The decisive battle was fought at a place unknown, near the Pagasaean Gulf. The numbers of the infantry were nearly equal, but Philip's cavalry and his tactics were far superior. More than a third of the Phocian army was slain or made prisoners, and Onomarchus was killed. Ferae was then captured, and Lycophron driven from the land, and Philip, having thus become master of Thessaly, prepared to march southward, for the purpose of delivering the shrine of Apollo from the possession of the Phocians, whom he professed to regard as sacrilegious usurpers. Phocis was now in great need, and her allies, Sparta, Achaea, and Athens, at length determined to give her active help. The Macedonian must not be permitted to pass Thermopylae. The statesman Eubulus, whose influence was now predominant at Athens, and was chiefly directed to the maintenance of peace, acted promptly on this occasion, and sent a large force under Nausicles to defend the pass. Philip at once recognized that it would be extremely hazardous to attempt to force the position, and he retired. He was a prince who knew when to wait and when to strike. Thus Phocis was rescued for the time. She was indebted both to Sparta and Achaia, who had sent her aid, but most of all to Athens. In supporting Phocis, the Spartans had objects of their own in view. They had not abandoned their hopes of winning back Messenia and destroying Megalopolis. It was therefore their policy to sustain Phocis, in order that Phocis might keep Thebes so fully occupied that they would have a free hand in the Peloponnesus without fear of Theban interference. The successes of Onomarchus in his first Thessalian campaign encouraged Sparta to prepare for action, and Megalopolis, made aware of the danger, applied to Athens for help. It was a request which no practical statesman could have entertained, and it had no chance of being granted, under the regime of as wise a head as Eubolus. Orators like Demosthenes, who constituted themselves the opponents of Eubolus, might invoke the old principle, that it was the policy of Athens to keep Sparta weak. But this was an obsolete maxim, for there was now no serious prospect of Sparta becoming formidably strong. It was no concern of Athens, to meddle in the Peloponnesus now. Her true policy was to keep on friendly terms with Sparta, and, in conjunction with her, to support the Phocian state against Thebes, Thessaly, and Macedon. This was the policy which Eubulus followed. The war broke out in the Peloponnesus soon after the check of Philip at Thermopylae. While Athens held aloof, Achaia and Elis, Phleus and Mantinea, supported Sparta, and the Phocians sent three thousand men to her help. But all these forces were outnumbered by the Messenians, Arcadians, and Argives, to whom the Thebans had sent a considerable aid. A series of engagements were fought. They were almost all indecisive, but they rescued Messenia and the Arcadian capital, and frustrated the plans of Lacedaemon. The death of Onomarchus developed the leadership of the Phocian League upon his brother Faulus. At first, the Phocians barely maintained their posts in western Boeotia, but presently, after the return of the auxiliaries whom they had sent to the Peloponnesus, they conquered 
Epicnemedian Locris and laid siege to Narux, which they ultimately captured. Thus Faulus maintained the power of Phocis for about two years. Then he was carried off by disease, and was succeeded by his nephew, Phalaecus, son of Onomarchus. Under Phalaecus the war dragged on for a few more years, without any notable achievement, the Thebans winning battles of no importance, and ravaging Phocis, the Phocians retaining their grip on western Boeotia. The rise of Phocis to its momentary position as one of the leading powers in Greece depended on two conditions, the possession of Delphi and the possibility of hiring mercenaries. It is therefore clear that Phocis could not easily have come to the front before the 4th century, when mercenary service had come widely into vogue. But these two essential features of the Phocian power, the occupation of Delphi and the employment of mercenary troops, gave it a bad name. Historians echo the invectives of the enemies of Phocis, and give the impression that during the sacred war the sanctuary of Apollo was in the hands of sacrilegious and unscrupulous barbarians. Tales were told how the dedicatory offerings were bestowed upon the loose favorites of the generals, how Philomelus gave a golden dress to a dancing girl, or Faulus a sylvan beaker to a flute player. It matters little whether such scandals are true or false. If true, they would only show that the generals were not above petty peculations. But the Phocians were not alien desecrators of the shrine of Apollo. They could establish as good a claim to Delphi as many claims founded on remote events in the past, and they certainly desired to maintain the Panhellenic dignity and sanctity of the shrine and the oracle as high as ever under their own administration. But they regarded Delphi not only as a Panhellenic sanctuary, but as a national sanctuary of Phocis, somewhat in the same way as Athens employed the treasures of her temples for national purposes of defense in the Peloponnesian War. So Phocis felt justified in employing the treasures of Apollo for the national interest of Phocis. Throughout all, the Phocian statesmen could have maintained that they were only borrowing from the god loans, which would be gradually paid back after the restoration of the peace. Recently there has come to light, among the original documents inscribed on the stones of Delphi, a striking disproof of the old view which conceived the Phocians of Onomarchus and Faulus as a band of robbers holding their orgies in a holy place. The temple of the god, which had been built by the Alcmaeonids, was destroyed by an earthquake, nearly twenty years before the Phocian usurpation. The work of rebuilding had been begun, perhaps soon after, but had advanced slowly, and when Philomelus seized Delphi, the completion of the temple was still far off. The work was carried out under a commission of temple builders, in which all the Amphictyonic states were represented, and this body administered a fund set apart for the building. During the Phocian usurpation, the council of temple builders still held their meetings. The work still went on. The skillful artisans in Corinth and elsewhere brought the stone material and transferred it to Delphi, as if nothing had befallen. The payments were made as usual from the fund, and the accounts were kept. We have some of them still. Those Amphictyonic states, which were at war with Phocis, like Thebes and Thessaly, were naturally not represented at the meetings of the board of the temple builders, but Delphian members were always present, and after Locris had been conquered by Faulus, we find Locrians also attending the meetings. Thus the completion of the temple of Apollo was not suspended while the Phocians held the sanctuary, and the Dorian and Ionian states continued to take their part in the Panhellenic work of supervising the structure as if nothing had happened, to alter the center of the Greek world. End of chapter 16, part 3
Chapter Sixteen, Part Four, of A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume Two, by John Bagnell Bury. Chapter Sixteen, Part Four, The Advance of Macedonia. The Macedonian monarch was now master not only of the Thermaic Gulf and the mouth of the Strymon, but of the basin of Pagasae, and he was beginning to create a fleet. His marauding vessels, let loose in the northern Aegean, captured the corn ships of Athens, descended on her possessions and dependencies. Lemnos, Imbros, and Oiboea, and once even insulted the coast of Attica itself. The most important interest of Athens centered round the Hellespont and Propontis, and it was obviously her policy to form a close combination with the Thracian king Chersobleptis, with a view to offering common resistance to the advance of the new northern power on the Thracian side. It was an effort in this direction when Aristocrates proposed a resolution in honor of Charidemus, the adventurer who had become the brother-in-law and the chief minister of the Thracian king. The resolution was impeached as illegal, and the accuser was supplied with a speech by the young politician Demosthenes. The legal objections were probably cogent, but the opponents of the proposal might wisely have confined themselves to this aspect of the question. They went on to impugn the expediency of the measure, and the speech of Demosthenes against Aristocrates was calculated, so far as a single speech could have a political effect, to alienate a power which it was distinctly the interest of Athens to conciliate. But it mattered little. No sooner had Philip returned from Thessaly than he moved against Thrace. Supported by a rival Thracian prince, and by the cities of Byzantium and Perinthus, he advanced to the Propontis, besieged Herion Tejos, the capital of Chersobleptes, and forced the potentate to submit to the overlordship of Macedon. The movements of Philip had been so rapid that Athens had no time to come to the rescue of Thrace. When the news arrived there was a panic and an armament was voted to save the Chersonese. But a new message came that Philip had fallen ill. Then he was reported dead, and the sending of the armament was postponed. Philip's illness was a fact. It compelled him to desist from further operations, and the Chersonese was saved. Eight years had not elapsed since Philip had mounted the throne of Macedon, and he had shifted the balance of power in Greece, and altered the whole prospect of the Greek world, for those who had eyes to see. He had created an army and a thoroughly adequate revenue. He had made himself lord of almost the whole seaboard of the northern Aegean, from the defile of Thermopylae to the shores of the Propontis. The only lands which were still accepted from his direct or indirect sway were the Chersonesus and the territory of the Chaldician League. He was ambitious to secure a recognized hegemony in Greece, to hold such a position as had been held by Athens, by Sparta and by Thebes in the days of their greatness, to form, in fact, a confederation of allies which should hold some such dependent relation towards him as the confederates of Delos had held towards Athens. Rumors were already floating about, that his ultimate design was to lead a Panhellenic expedition against the Persian king, the same design which was ascribed to Jason of Ferrae. Though the Greek states regarded Philip as in a certain sense an outsider, both because Macedonia had hitherto lain aloof from their politics, and because absolute monarchy was repugnant to their political ideas, it must never be forgotten that Philip desired to identify Macedonia with Greece, and to bring his own country up to the level of the kindred peoples which had so far outstripped it in civilization. Throughout the, his whole career 
he regarded Athens with respect. He would have given much for her friendship, and he showed that he deemed it one of his misfortunes that she compelled him to be her foe. He was himself imbued with great culture, and if the robust Macedonian enjoyed the society of the somewhat rude boon companions of his own land with whom he could drink deep, he knew how to make himself agreeable to Attic philosophers or men of letters whom he always delighted to honor. He chose an accomplished man of letters, Aristotle of Stagira, who had been educated at Athens, to be the instructor of his son Alexander. This fact alone sets Philip in the true light, as a conscious and deliberate promoter of Greek civilization. Greece saw with alarm the increase of the Macedonian power, though men were yet far from apprehending what it really meant. No state had been directly hit except Athens, though the day of Chalcides was at hand, and it was now too late for Athens to retrieve her lost position, either alone or with any combination she could form, against the state which possessed an ample revenue and a well-drilled national army, under the sovereign command of the greatest general and diplomatist of the day. The only event which could now have availed to stay the course of Macedon, would have been the death of Philip. But the Athenians did not apprehend this. They still dreamed of recovering Amphipolis. Their best policy would have been peace and alliance with Macedonia. There can be little question that Philip would have gladly secured them the Chersonese and their conships, for the possession of the Chersonese had not the same vital importance for him as Amphipolis or as the towns around the Termaic Gulf. In these years Athens was under the guidance of a cautious statesman, Oibolus, who was a marvelously able minister of finance. He was appointed councillor of the Theoric Fund for four years, and this office, while it was specially concerned with the administration of the surplus of revenue which was devoted to theoric purposes, involved a general control over the finances of the state. He pursued a peace policy, yet it was he who struck the one effective blow that Athens ever struck at Philip, when she hindered him from passing Thermopylae. But Oebolus wisely refused to allow Athens to be missled into embarking in unnecessary wars in the Peloponnesus or Asia Minor, and frankly accepted the peace which had concluded the war of Athens with her allies. The mass of the Athenians were well contented to follow the counsel of a dexterous financier, who, while he met fully all the expenses of administration, distributed large dividends of festival money. The news of Philip's campaign in Thrace may have temporarily weakened his influence. It was felt that there had been slackness in watching Athenian interests in the Hellespontine regions, and his opponents had a fair opportunity to inveigh against an inactive policy. The most prominent among these opponents was Demosthenes, who had recently made a reputation as a speaker in the assembly. The father of the Demosthenes was an Athenian manufacturer, who died when his son was still a child. His mother had Scythian blood in her veins. His guardians dealt fraudulently with the considerable fortune which his father had left him, and when he came of age, he resolved to recover it. For this purpose he sat at the feet of the orator Isacus, and was trained in law and rhetoric. Though he received but a small portion of his patrimony, the oratory of Demosthenes owed to this training, with a practical purpose, many qualities, which it would never have acquired under the academic instruction of Isocrates. He used himself to tell how he struggled to overcome his natural defects of speech and manner, how he practised gesticulation before a mirror, and declaimed verses with pebbles in his mouth. In the end he became as brilliant an orator as the Pnux had ever cheered. Perhaps his only fault was a too theatrical manner. His earlier political speeches are not monuments of wisdom. He came forward as an opponent of the policy of Abelus, and so we have already met him supporting the appeals of Rhodes and Megalopolis. 
The advance of Philip to the Propontis gave him a more promising occasion to urge the Athenians to act, since their own interests were directly involved. And the effort of Demosthenes was more than adequate. The harangue, which is known as the first Philippic, one of his most brilliant and effective speeches, calls upon the Athenians to brace themselves vigorously to oppose Philip, our enemy. He draws a lively picture of the indifference of his countrymen, and contrasts it with the energy of Philip, who is not the man to rest, content with that he has subdued, but is always adding to his conquests, and casts his snare around us while we sit at home postponing. Again, is Philip dead? Nay, but he is ill. What does it matter to you? For if this Philip die, you will soon raise up a second Philip by your apathy. Demosthenes proposed a scheme for increasing the military forces of the city, and the most essential part of the scheme was that a force should be sent to Thrace, of which a quarter should consist of citizens, and the officers should be citizens. At present the numerous officers whom they elected were kept for services at home. You choose your captains, not to fight, but to be displayed like dolls in marketplace. Demosthenes was applauded, but nothing was done. His ideal was the Athens of Pericles, but he lived in the Athens of Oibulus. In the fourth century the Athenians were quite capable of holding their own among their old friends and enemies, the Spartans and Thebans, and the islanders of the Aegean, with paid soldiers and generals like Iphicrates and Charis, they could maintain their position as a first-rate power. But against a large, vigorous land power, with a formidable army, their chances were hopeless. For, since the fall of their empire, the whole spirit of the people had tended to peace and not to war. They were no longer animated by the idea of empire, and the memories of the past, which Demosthenes might invoke, were powerless to stir them to action. The orations of Demosthenes, however, carefully studied, however imbued with passion, could not change the character of his countrymen. Their spirit did not respond to his, and, not being under the imperious dominion of an idea, they saw no reason for great undertakings. Nor was the condition of Athens as ill as the opponent of Oibolus painted it. Under the administration of Oibolus, the fleet was increased. The building of a new arsenal was begun, new shipsheds were made, and the military establishment of Athens was in various ways improved. She was still the great sea power of the Aegean, and strong enough to protect her commercial interests. The next stage in the development of Macedonia was the incorporation of Chalcidice, and as soon as Philip recovered from his illness, he turned his attention to this quarter. If the Olynthians had treated Philip honorably, they would probably have been left a self-governing community, with their territory intact, dependent on Macedonia. But they treated both Athens and Philip badly. They first made a close alliance with Philip to rob Athens, and then, when they had received from Philip Antimus and Potidaea, they turned round and made peace with Athens, a power with which Philip was at war, and recognized the right of Athens to Amphipolis. At the time, Philip was otherwise engaged, but three years later he sent a requisition to Olynthus, demanding the surrender of his half-brother, a pretender to the Macedonian throne, to whom they had given shelter. The demand was refused, and Philip marched against Chalcides. One after another the cities of the Olynthian confederacy opened their gates to him, or, if they refused, like Stagira, they were captured. In her jeopardy, Olynthus sought an alliance with Athens, and on this occasion both the leaders of the Athenian assembly and the advocates of a war policy found themselves in harmony. It was during the debates on the question of alliance that Demosthenes pronounced his Olynthian orations, which were animated by the same spirit as his Philippic, and were in fact Philippics. At this juncture, the Athenians seem to have been awakened to the necessity of action, 
sufficiently to embolden Demosthenes to throw out the unpopular suggestion that the Theoric Fund should be devoted to military purposes, and he repeats his old plea for citizen soldiers. An alliance was concluded, and mercenaries were dispatched to the Chalcidian Peninsula under Charis and Charidemus, who had left the service of Chersobleptes. More troops would certainly have followed, and Philip might have been placed in some embarrassment, especially as Chersobleptes had rebelled. But he diverted the concern of Athens in another direction, and so divided her forces. He had long been engaged in intrigues in Oiboea, and now Eretria revolted and drove out Plutarch, the tyrant who held the city for Athens. Neighboring Chalcis and Oreos in the north followed the example. Oboea was in a state of revolt. It's just possible that, if Athens had left Oiboea alone, and consecrated all her military power in Chalcidis, she might have saved Olynthus for the time. The division of her forces was certainly fatal, and Demosthenes deserves great credit for opposing any interference in Oiboea. But the Athenians would have been strong-minded indeed, if they had done nothing, to regain the neighboring island, while they dispatched all their troops to succor an ally. The expedition to Oiboea, which was now entrusted to the general Phocion, might better never have been sent, but beforehand there seemed no reason why it should not succeed. Phocion's only exploit was to extricate himself from a dangerous position at Tamunae by winning a battle, but he returned to Athens without having recovered any of the rebellious cities. The enemy had taken a number of prisoners, for whose ransom Athens had to pay fifty talents, and it was decided that there was nothing for it but to acknowledge the independence of Eboea, with the exception of Charistus, which remained loyal. Meanwhile Philip was pressing Olynthus hard, and urgent appeals were sent to Athens. This time Demosthenes had his way, and two thousand citizen soldiers sailed for the north. But it was too late. Olynthus was captured before they reached it, and Philip showed no mercy to the city, which had played him false. The place was destroyed, and the inhabitants scattered in various parts of Macedonia, some set to work as slaves in the royal domains. The other cities of the Confederacy were practically incorporated in Macedonia, but they still continued to exist as cities and manage their local affairs. There was no question of their extermination. Demosthenes had opposed the expedition to Oiboea, and thereby hangs a story. He had a bitter foe in a rich man, named Medias, who was a supporter of Oibolus. Their personal hostility was revakened by the debates over the Oiboean question, and Medias seized the occasion of the great Dionysiac feast to put a public affront on his enemy. Demosthenes had undertaken the duty of supplying a horus for his tribe, and on the day of the performance, when he appeared in the sacred robe of Ocorigus, Medias struck him in the face. The outrage involved contempt of a religious festival, and Demosthenes instituted proceedings against his insulter. The speech, which he composed for the occasion, contains fine catching invective. The description of Medias vulgarly displaying his wealth may be quoted to illustrate contemporary manners. Where, Demosthenes asks, are his splendid outlays? For myself I cannot see unless it be in this, that he has built a mansion at Eleusis large enough to darken all the neighborhood, that he keeps a pair of white horses from Sicyon, with which he conducts his wife to the mysteries or anywhere else he fancies, that he sweeps through the market-place, with three or four lackeys all to himself, and talks about his bowls and drinking horns and saucers, loud enough to be heard by the passers-by. But Demosthenes consented to compromise the matter for a small sum before it was brought to an issue, and there can be little question that his consent was given from political motives. On the capture of Olynthus, 
the different parties drew together and agreed to cooperate, and this new political combination rendered it necessary for Demosthenes, however reluctant, to patch up the foil with Medias. End of chapter 16, part 4「Chapter 16, Part 6 of A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 2, by John Bagnall Bury. Chapter 16, Part 6 Section 6 The Peace of Philocrates Her recent military efforts had exhausted the revenue of Athens. There was not enough money in the treasury to pay the judges their daily wage. Peace was clearly a necessity, and this must have been fully recognized by Eubulus. But there was great indignation at the fall of Olynthus, and the feeling that a disaster had been sustained was augmented by the fact that there were a considerable number of Athenians among the captives. Accordingly, the pressure of popular opinion, which was for the moment strongly aroused against Philip, induced Eubulus to countenance the dispatch of envoys to the cities of the Peloponnesus, for the purpose of organizing a national resistance in Hellas against the man who had destroyed Olynthus. It is probable that this measure was advocated by Demosthenes, in later years a national resistance to Philip was his favourite idea. It was an effort foredoomed to failure, as Eubulus knew perfectly well. Yet it served his purpose, for it protected him against suspicions of being secretly friendly to Philip. On this occasion the orator Aeschines, famous as the antagonist of Demosthenes, first came prominently forward. He had begun life as an usher in a school kept by his father. He had then been a tragic actor, and finally a public clerk. He was now sent to rouse the Greeks of the Peloponnesus against Macedonia, and he used such strong language in his disparagement of Philip, especially at Megalopolis, that no one could accuse him of Philippizing. The mere fact that envoys were sent to Megalopolis, whose application for help had so recently been rejected by Athens, is enough to cast suspicion on the whole round of embassies as a farce, got up to satisfy public opinion at home. Demosthenes, like other politicians, saw the necessity of peace and worked towards it. Philip desired two things, to conclude peace with Athens, and to become a member of the Amphictyonic Council. Towards this second end a path was prepared by the Thebans, who, along with the Thessalians, addressed an appeal to Philip that he would undertake the championship of the Amphictyonic League and crush the Phocians. In Phocis itself there had recently been domestic strife, Palaecus had been disposed from the generalship, but he had a party of his own and held Thermopylae with the strong places in its neighbourhood. When it was noised abroad that Philip was about to march southward in answer to the Theban prayer, the Phocians invited Athens and Sparta to help them once again to hold the gates of Greece. Both Athens and Sparta again responded to the call, but the call had come from the political opponents of Palaecus, and he refused to admit either Spartan or Athenian into the pass. Philaeus seems to have previously assisted the enemies of Athens in Euboea, and statesmen at Athens might now feel some uneasiness, whether he would not turn traitor and surrender the pass to Philip. It was another reason for acquiescing in the necessity of making peace. The first overtures came from Athens. Ten Athenian envoys, and one representative of the Synedrion of Athenian allies, were sent to Pella to negotiate terms of peace with the Macedonian king. Among the envoys were Philocrates, who had proposed the embassy, Aeschines, and Demosthenes. The terms to which Philip agreed were that Athens and Macedon should each retain the territories of which they were actually in possession at the time the peace was concluded. The peace would be concluded when both sides had sworn to it. Both the allies of Macedonia and those of Athens were to be included, with two exceptions. Philip refused to treat with Halus in Thessaly, a place which he had recently attacked, or with the Phocians, whom he was determined to crush. By these terms, which were perfectly explicit, Athens would surrender her old claim to Amphipolis, 
and on the other hand Philip would recognise Athens as mistress of the Chersonese. The two exceptions which Philip made were inevitable. Halus indeed was a trifle which no one heeded, but it was an essential part of the Macedonian policy to proceed against Phocis. To the envoys, whom the king charmed by his courteous hospitality at Pella, he privately intimated that he was far from being ill-disposed to the Phocians, and perhaps a few of them hoped that there was something in the assurance. But in truth the Athenian statesmen troubled themselves little about Phocis. Some of them, like the Theban Proxenos Demosthenes, were more disposed to lean towards Thebes. It would be necessary to keep up the appearance of protecting an ally, though relations with that ally had recently grown somewhat strained, but neither Eubulus nor Demosthenes would for a moment have dreamed of foregoing the peace for the sake of supporting Phocis against her enemies. There were a few Thracian forts, belonging to Cursobleptes, which Philip was anxious to capture before the peace was made, and when the envoys left Pella, he set out for Thrace, having given them an undertaking to respect the Chersonese. The envoys returned home, bearing with them a friendly letter from Philip to the Athenian people, and they were followed in a few days by three Macedonian delegates, appointed to receive the oaths from the Athenians and their allies. How important this negotiation was for Philip is proved by the fact that two of these deputies were the two greatest of his subjects, Parmenio and Antipater. On the motion of Philocrates, the peace was accepted by Athens on the terms which Philip offered, though there were dissentient voices against the exclusion of Phocis and Halus. But the murmurs of the opposition were silenced by the plain speaking of Eubulus, who showed that if the terms were rejected, the war must be continued. And some of the ambassadors disseminated the unofficial utterances of Philip, that he would not ruin the Phocians, and that he would help Athens to win back Euboea and Oropus. The upshot was that Phocis was not mentioned in the treaty. She was tacitly, not expressly, excluded. The peace was now concluded on one side, and it remained for the envoys of Athens to administer the oath to Philip and his allies. It was to the interest of Athens that this act should be accomplished as speedily as possible, for Philip was entitled to make new conquests until he swore to the peace, and he was actually engaged in making new conquests in Thrace. The same ambassadors who had visited Macedonia to arrange the terms of a treaty now set forth a second time to administer the oaths. Meanwhile, Philip had taken the Thracian fortresses which he had gone to take, and had reduced Cursobleptes to be a vassal of Macedonia. When he returned to Pella, he found not only the embassy from Athens, but envoys from many other Greek states also, awaiting his arrival with various hopes and fears he was beginning to be recognised as the arbiter of northern Hellas. So far as the formal conclusion of the peace went, there was no difficulty, but the Athenian ambassadors had received general powers to negotiate further with Philip, with a view to some common decision on the settlement of the Phocian question and northern Greece. The treaty was a treaty of peace and alliance, and if Philip could have his way, the alliance would have become a bond of close friendship and cooperation and it was in this direction that Eubulus and his party were inclined cautiously to move. Athens might now have taken her position as joint arbitrator with Philip in the settlement of the Amphictyonic states. Both Philip and Athens had a common interest in reducing the power of Thebes, and if it was in the interest of Athens that Phocus should not be utterly destroyed, Philip had no special enmity against Phocus, whose strength was now exhausted. The Phocian sacrilege was a convenient pretext to interfere and step into the place of Phocis in the Delphian Amphictyone. A common programme was discussed, and might easily have been concerted between Philip and the ambassadors. To treat the Phocians with clemency and to force Thebes to acknowledge the independence of the Boeotian cities would have been the basis of common action. The restoration of Plataea was mentioned, and while Philip promised to secure the restitution to Athens of Euboea and Oropus, Athens would have supported the admission of Macedonia into the Amphictyonic Council. Eschines was the chief mouthpiece of the councils of Eubulus. But the project of an active alliance was opposed strenuously by Demosthenes. And as Demosthenes had great and daily increasing influence with the Athenian assembly, it would have been unsafe for Philip to conclude any definite agreement with the majority of the embassy. The policy of Demosthenes was to abandon the Phocians to their fate and to draw closer to Thebes, so that when his city had recovered from her financial exhaustion, 
Thebes and Athens together might form a joint resistance to the aggrandizement of Macedonia. In consequence of this irreconcilable division, which broke out in most unseemly quarrels among the ambassadors, nothing more was done than the administration of the oath. The envoys accompanied the king into Thessaly, and at Ferrai the oath was administered to the Thessalians, his allies. A peace was then arranged with Hellenessus, and the envoys returned to Athens, leaving Philip to proceed on his own way. It now remains to be seen whether Eubulus would carry the assembly with him in favour of a rational policy of cooperation with Macedon, or would be defeated by the brilliant oratory of his younger rival. Philip's course of action would depend upon the decision of the assembly. It was a calamity for Athens that at this critical moment there was no strong man at the helm of the state. The assembly was swayed between the opposite councils of Demosthenes, whose oratory was irresistible, and Eubulus, whose influence had been paramount for the past eight years. When the ambassadors returned, Demosthenes lost no time in denouncing his colleagues, as having treacherously intrigued with Philip against the interests of the city. His denunciation was successful for a moment, and the usual vote of thanks to the embassy was withheld. But the success was only for a moment. As Chines and his colleagues defended their policy triumphantly before the assembly, and it was clear that the programme which they had discussed with Philip would have been satisfactory to the people. The assembly decreed that the treaty of peace and alliance should be extended to the posterity of Philip. It further decreed that Athens should formally call upon the Phocians to surrender Delphi to the Amphictyons, and should threaten them with armed intervention if they declined. Demosthenes appears to have made no opposition to this measure against the Phocians, and it seemed that the policy of cooperation with Philip was about to be realised. Philip, in the meantime, advanced southward. The pass of Thermopylae was held by Philacus, who had been reinforced by some Lacedaemonian troops. But Philacus had opened secret negotiations with Pella some months before, and the hostile vote of the Athenians decided him to capitulate on condition of departing unhindered where he would. Before he reached Thermopylae, Philip had addressed two friendly letters to Athens, inviting her to send an army to arrange the affairs of Phocis and Boeotia. Indisposed as the Athenian citizens were to leave Athens on military service, they lent ready ears to the absurd terrors which Demosthenes conjured up, suggesting that Philip would detain their army as hostages. Accordingly, they contented themselves with sending an embassy, on which Demosthenes declined to serve, to convey to Philip an announcement of the decree which they had passed against the Phocians. Thus swayed between Eubulus and Demosthenes, the Athenians had done too much or too little. They had abandoned the Phocians, and at the same time they resigned the voice which they should and could have had in this political settlement of northern Greece. As it was clear that Philip could not trust Athens, owing to the attitude of Demosthenes, he was constrained to act in conjunction with her enemy Thebes. The cities of western Boeotia, which had been held by the Phocians, were restored to the Boeotian Confederacy. The doom of the Phocians was decided by the Amphictyonic Council which was now convoked. If some of the members had had their way, all the men of military age would have been cast down a precipice. But Philip would not have permitted this, and the sentence was as mild as could have been expected. The Phocians were deprived of their place in the Amphictyonic body, and all their cities, with the exception of Abai, were broken up into villages, so that they might not again be a danger to Delphi. They were obliged to undertake to pay back, by instalments of sixty talents a year, the value of the treasures which they had taken from the sanctuary. The Lacedaemonians were also punished for the support which they had given to Phocis, by being disqualified to return either of the members who represented the Dorian vote. The place which Phocis vacated in the council was transferred to Macedonia, in recognition of Philip's services in expelling the desecrators of the temple. The Athenian declaration against Phocis exempted Athens from the penalty which was inflicted on Sparta at this Amphictyonic meeting. But this was small comfort, and when the Athenians realized that they had gained nothing, and that Thebes had gained all she wanted, they felt with indignation that the statesmanship of their city had been unskilful. The futility of their policy had been mainly due to Demosthenes, who had done all in his power to thwart Eubolus, and he now seized the occasion to discredit that statesman and his party. He encouraged his fellow countrymen in the unreasonable fear that Philip would invade Attica, 
and the panic was so great that they brought their families and movable property from the country into the city. The fear was soon dispelled by a letter from Philip himself, but Demosthenes had succeeded in creating a profound distrust of Philip, and there was soon an opportunity of expressing his feeling. An occasion offered itself to Philip almost immediately to display publicly to the assembled Greek world the position of leadership which he had thus won. It so happened that the celebration of the Pythian Games fell in the year of the peace. It will be remembered how the despot of Ferai, when he had made himself ruler of Thessaly, was about to come down to Delphi and assume the presidency of the Pythian feast, when he was cut down by assassins. The ambitions and plans of Ferai had passed to Pella, and Greece, which had dreaded the claims of the Thessalian tyrant, had now to bend the knee before the Macedonian king. Athens sulked. She sent no deputy to the Amphictyonic meeting which elected Philip president for the festival, no delegates to the festival itself. This marked omission was a protest against the admission of Macedonia to the Amphictyonic League, and Philip understood it as such. But he did not wish to quarrel with Athens. He hoped ultimately to gain her good will, and instead of marching into Attica, whither his Thessalian and Theban friends would have only too gladly followed him, he contented himself with sending an embassy to notify to the Athenian people the vote which made him a member of the Amphictyony, and to invite them to concur. The invitation was in fact an ultimatum. Eubulus and his party had lost their influence in the outburst of anti-Macedonian feeling which Demosthenes had succeeded in stirring up. But the current had gone too far, and Demosthenes had some difficulty in allaying the spirits which he had conjured up. The assembly was ready, on the slightest encouragement, to refuse its concurrence to the Amphictyonic decree, and Demosthenes was forced to save the city from the results of his own agitation by showing that it would be foolish and absurd to go to war now for the shadow at Delphi. Rarely had Athens been placed in such an undignified posture, a plight for which she had to thank the brilliant orator whom a malignant fate had sent to guide her on a futile path. From this time forward, Demosthenes was the most influential of her counsellors. Neither Demosthenes, the eloquent speaker, nor Eubulus, the able financier, saw far into the future. The only man of the day, perhaps, who grasped the situation in its ecumenical aspect, who described, as it were, from without, the place of Macedonia in Greece and the place of Greece in the world, was the nonagenarian Isocrates. He had never ventured to raise his voice in the din of party politics. He had kept his garments unspotted from the defilement of public life, and when he condescended to give political advice to Greece, it was easy for the second-rate statesman as well as the party hack to laugh at a mere man of study stepping into a field where he had no practical experience. But Isocrates discerned the drift of events, where the orators who madly declaimed in the Pnyx were at fault, and the view which he took of the situation after the conclusion of the peace of Philocrates simply anticipated the decrees of history. He explained his view in an open letter to King Philip. He had long since seen the endless futility of perpetuating that international system of Greece which existed within the memory of men, a number of small sovereign states, which ought by virtue of all they had in common to form a single nation, divided and constantly at feud. The time had come, he thought, to unite Greece, now that there had arisen a man who had the brains, the power and the gold to become the central pivot of the Union. Sovereign and independent the city-states would of course remain, but they might be drawn together into one fold by a common hope and allegiance to a common leader, and under such a leader as Philip there was a great programme for Greece, and not a mere programme of ambition undertaken for the sake of something to do, but an enterprise which was urgently needed to meet a pressing social danger. We have already seen how Greece was flooded for many years past with a superfluous population who went about as armed rovers, attached to no city, hiring themselves out to any state that needed fighting men, a constant menace to society. A new country to colonize was the only remedy for this overflow of Greece, as Isocrates recognized, and the new country must be won from the barbarian. The time had come for Hellas to take the offensive against Persia, and the task appointed for Philip was to lead forth the hosts of Hellas on this splendid enterprise. If he did not destroy the whole empire of the great king, he might at least annex Asia Minor from Cilicia to Sinope to the Hellenic world and appropriate it to the needs of the Hellenic folk. Ten years later the fulfilment of this task which Isocrates laid upon Philip was begun, 
not indeed by Philip himself, but by his successor. We shall see in due time how the fulfilment surpassed the utmost hopes of the Athenian speculator. But it is fair to note how justly Isocrates had discerned the signs of the times and the tendency of history. He saw that the inveterate quarrel between Europe and Asia, which had existed since the Trojan War, was the great abiding fact. He foresaw that it must soon come to an issue, and throughout the later part of his long life he was always watching for the inevitable day. The expedition of Cyrus and the campaign of Agesilaus were foreshadowings of that day, and it had seemed for a moment that Jason of Ferrai was chosen to be the successor of Agamemnon and Simon. Now the day had come at last. The choice of destiny had fallen upon the man of Macedonia, and Isocrates knew that this expansion of Greece would meet Greece's chief practical need. It is instructive to contrast his sane and practical view of the situation of Greece with the chimerical conservatism of some of his contemporaries. This conservatism, to which the orator Demosthenes gave a most noble expression, was founded on the delusion that the Athens of his day could be converted by his own eloquence and influence into the form and feature of the Periclean city. This was a delusion which took no account of the change which events had wrought in the Athenian character. It was a noble delusion which could have misled no great statesman or hard-headed thinker. It did not mislead Isocrates. He appreciated the trend of history and saw the expansion of Greece, to which the world was moving. End of chapter 16, part 6「Chapter 16, Part 7 Section 7 Interval of Peace and Preparations for War 346-1 BC Having gained for Macedonia the coveted place in the religious league of Greece, Philip spent the next year or two in improving his small navy, in settling the administration of Thessaly, and in acquiring influence in the Peloponnesus. It may fairly be said that Thessaly was now joined to Macedonia by a personal union. The Thessalian cities elected the Macedonian king as their archon. The old name of Tagus, with its Phaean associates, was avoided. And he set four governors over the four great divisions of the country. South of the Corinthian Isthmus, Philip adopted the old policy of Thebes, offering friendship to those states which needed a friend to stand by them against Sparta. His negotiations gained him the adhesion of Messenia and Megalopolis, Elis and Argos. In Megalopolis they set up a bronze statue of Philip, while Argos had a special tie with Macedon, since she claimed to be the original home of the Macedonian kings. Nor did Philip yet despair of achieving his chief aim, the conciliation of Athens. No one knew how to bribe better than he, and we may be sure that he gave gold without stint to his Athenian supporters. The Athenians naturally preferred peace to war, and the political party which was favourable to friendly relations with Philip was still strong and might at any moment regain its power. The influence of the veteran Eubulus, who seems to have withdrawn somewhat from public affairs, was on that side. There were Eschines and Philocrates who had been active in the negotiation of the peace, and there was the incorruptible soldier Phocion, who was a remarkable figure at Athens, although he had no pretensions to eminence either as a soldier or as a statesman. He was marked among his contemporaries as an honest man, superior to all temptations of money, and as the Athenians always prized this superhuman integrity which few of them attempted to practice, they elected him forty-five times as strategos, though in military capacity he was no more than a respectable sergeant. But his strong common sense, which was impervious to oratory, and his exceptional probity made him a useful member of his party. There was one man in Athens who was firmly resolved that the peace should be no abiding peace, but a mere interval preparatory to war. Demosthenes, 
supported by her parodies, Lycurgus and others, spent the time in inflaming the wrath of his countrymen against Philip and in seeking to ruin his political antagonists. These years are therefore marked by a great struggle between the parties of war and peace, the influence of Demosthenes being most often in the ascendancy, and ultimately emerging victorious. After Philip's installation in the Amphictyonic Council, Demosthenes lost no time in striking a blow at his opponents. He brought an impeachment against Asinis for receiving bribes from the Macedonian king, and betraying the interests of Athens in the negotiations which preceded the peace. Men's minds were irritated by the triumph of Thebes, and Demosthenes might have succeeded in inducing them to make Asinis a scapegoat, if he had not committed a fatal mistake. He associated with himself in the prosecution a certain Timarchus, whose early life had been devoted to vices which disqualified him from the rights of a citizen, and thus Aschines easily parried the stroke by bringing an action against Timarchus and submitting his private life to an annihilating exposure. The case of Demosthenes was thereby discredited, and he was obliged to let it drop for the time. A year or so later we find Demosthenes going forth on a mission to the cities of the Peloponnesus to counteract by his oratory the influence of Philip, but his oratory roused no echoes, and Philip had good reason to complain of invectives which could hardly be justified from the lips of the representative of a power which was at peace and in alliance with Macedonia. An embassy came from Pella to remonstrate with the Athenians on their obstinate misconstruction of Macedonian motives, and Demosthenes seized the occasion to deliver one of his uncompromising anti-Macedonian harangues. The basis of his reasoning in this Philippic and in the political speeches which followed it during the next few years, is the proposition that Philip desired and proposed to destroy Athens. It was a proposition of which he had no valid proof, and it was actually untrue, as the sequel showed. We are not told what answer Athens sent to Pella, but it would seem that she complained of the terms of the recent peace as unfair, and specially mentioned her right to Halus. This island off the coast of Thessaly, a place of no value whatever, had belonged to the Athenian confederacy, but it had been seized by pirates, and the pirates had been expelled by Philip's soldiers. Philip sent an embassy with a courteous message, requesting Athens to propose emendations in the terms of the peace, and offering to give her Halonessus. But the place was of so little consequence to Athens or any one, that it served as an excellent pretext for diplomatic wrangling, and Demosthenes could persuade the people to refuse Halonessus as it was offered, and demand that it should not be given, but given back. Besides the restoration of this worthless island, Athens made the proposal that the basis of the peace should be altered, and that each party should retain, not the territories which were actually in its possession when the treaty was concluded, but the territories which lawfully belonged to it. This proposal was preposterous. No peace can be made on a basis that leaves open all the debated questions which it is the object of the treaty to settle. Athens also complained of the Thracian fortresses which Philip captured and retained after the negotiation had begun. On this question Philip was legally in the right, but he offered to submit the matter to arbitration. Athens refused the offer on the plea that suitable arbiters could not be found. She thus showed that she was not in earnest. Her objection was as frivolous as her proposal. Demosthenes was responsible for the attitude of the city and his intention was to keep up the friction with Macedonia and prevent any conciliation. The ascendancy which Demosthenes and his fellows had now won emboldened them to make a grand attack upon their political opponents, and thereby deal Philip a sensible blow. Hyperides brought an accusation of treachery against Philocrates, whose name was especially associated with the peace, and so formidable did the prospect of the trial seem, in the present state of popular opinion, that Philocrates fled, and he was condemned to death for contempt of court. Encouraged by this success, Demosthenes again took up his indictment against Aschines, but Aschines stood his ground, and one of the most famous political trials of antiquity was witnessed by the Athenian public. We can still hear the two rivals scurrilously reviling each other and vying to deceive the judges, for they published their speeches after the trial, to instruct and perplex posterity. It is in these documents, burning with the passions of political hatred, that the modern historian, picking his doubtful way through lies and distortions of fact, 
has to discover the course of the negotiations which led to the peace of Philocrates. The speech of Demosthenes, in particular, is a triumph in the art of sophistry. No politician ever knew better than he how short is the memory of ordinary men for the political events which they have themselves watched and even helped to shape by their votes and opinions, and none ever traded more audaciously on this weakness of human nature. Hardly four years had passed since the peace was made, and Demosthenes, confident that his audience will remember nothing accurately, ventures likely to falsify facts which had so lately been notorious in the streets of Athens. Disclaiming all responsibility for a peace which he had himself worked hard to bring about, but now seeks to discredit, he discovers that the Phocians were basely abandoned and imputes their fate to Aschines. Against Aschines there was in fact no case. The charge of receiving bribes from Philip was not supported by any actual evidence. The reply of Aschines, which, as an oratorial achievement, is not inferior to that of his accuser, rings less falsely. Eubulus and Phocion men of the highest character, supported Eschines, but the public feeling was so hostile to Philip at this junction that the defendant barely escaped. That Eschines and many others of his party received money from Philip we may well believe, though the reiterations of Demosthenes are no evidence. But to receive money from Philip was one thing, and to betray the interests of Athens was another. It must be proved that a politician has sacrificed the manifest good of his country, or deserted his own political convictions, for a sackful of silver or gold, before he could be considered unconditionally a traitor. Public opinion in Greece thought no worse of a man for accepting a few talents from foreigners who were pleased with his policy, although those few public men, Demosthenes was not among them, who made it a rule never to accept an obol in connection with any political transaction, were respected as beings of superhuman virtue. Philip, who unlocked many a city by golden keys, was doubtless generous to the party whose programme was identical with his own interests, and it may be that Aschines and others, who were not in affluent circumstances, would have been unable to devote themselves to public affairs if the king had not lined their wallets with gold. Meanwhile, Philip was seeking influence and intriguing in the countries which lay on either side of Attica, in Megara on the west and Euboea on the northeast. An attempt at a revolution in Megara was defeated, and the city allied itself with its neighbour and old enemy, Athens. But in Euboea the movements supported by Macedonia were more successful. Both in Eritrea and in Aureus oligarchies were established, really dependent on Philip. But in Chalcis, which from its strategic position was of greater importance, the democracy held its ground and sought an equal alliance with Athens, to which Athens gladly consented. Events in another quarter of Greece now caused a number of lesser Greek states to rally round Athens, and so bring within the field of near possibilities a league such as it was the dream of Demosthenes to form against Macedonia. By his marriage with an Epirot princess, it naturally devolved upon Philip to intervene in the struggles for the Epirot throne, which followed her father's death. He espoused the cause of her brother Alexander against her uncle Aribus, marched into the country, and established Alexander in the sovereignty. Epirus would now become dependent on Macedonia, and Philip saw in it a road to the Corinthian Gulf and a means of reaching Greece on the western side. His first step was to annex the region of Cassopia, between the rivers Acheron and Oropus, to the Epirote League of which his brother-in-law was head. And his eyes were then cast upon Ambracia, which stood as a barrier to the southward expansion of Epirus. But the place which he desired above all was doubtless Norpactus, the key to the Corinthian Gulf, now in the hands of the Achaeans. For encompassing his schemes in this quarter his natural allies were the Aetolians. They too coveted Norpactus, and would have held it for him, and they were the enemies of the Ambraciots and Acarnians, whom he hoped to render dependent upon Epirus. The evident designs of Philip alarmed all these peoples, and not only Ambracia, Acania, and Achaea, but Corcyria also sought the alliance of Athens. Philip, however, judged that the time had not come for further advances on this side, and some recent movements of Cursobleptes decided him to turn now to one of the greatest tasks which were imposed upon the expander of Macedonia, the subjugation of Thrace. Since the Persians had been beaten out of Europe, Thrace had been subject to native princes, some of whom, Teres, Sitalkes, Cotis, 
we have seen ruling the whole land from the Strymons to the Danube's mouth. It was now to pass again under the rule of a foreigner, but its new lords were Europeans who would lead Thracian soldiers to avenge upon Asia the Oriental yoke which had been laid upon their ancestors. Of the Thracian expedition of Philip we know as little as of the Thracian expedition of Darius. Unlike Darius, he did not cross the rivers of the north or penetrate into any part of Scythia, but his campaign lasted ten months, and he spent a winter in the field in that wintry land, suffering from sickness as well as from the cold. In war Philip never spared himself either hardship or danger. Demosthenes, in later years, described his reckless energy, ruthless to himself, in a famous passage. To gain empire and power he had an eye knocked out, his collarbone broken, his arm and his leg maimed. He abandoned to fortune any part of his body she cared to take, so that honour and glory might be the portion of the rest. The Thracian king was dethroned, and his kingdom became a tributary province of Macedon. There is still in the land a city which bears Philip's name, and is the most conspicuous memorial of that great and obscure campaign. Philippopolis on the Hebrus was the chief of the cities which the conqueror built to maintain Macedonian influence in Thrace. This conquest was not an infringement of the peace, for Cursobleptes had not been admitted to the treaty as an ally of Athens. But it affected nearly and seriously the position of Athens at the gates of the Black Sea. The Macedonian frontier was now advanced to the immediate neighbourhood of the Chersonese, and Athens had no longer Thracian princes to wield against Philip. The prospect did not escape Demosthenes, and he resolved to force on a war, though both his own country and Philip were averse to hostilities. Accordingly, he induced Athens to send a few ships and mercenaries under a swashbuckler named Diopethes, to protect her interest in the Chersonese. There had been some disputes with Cardia touching the lands of the Athenian outsettlers, and Diopethes lost no time in attacking Cardia. Now Cardia had been expressly recognised as an ally of Philip in the peace, and thus the action of Diopethes was a violation of the peace. The admiral followed up this aggression by invading some of Philip's Thracian possessions, and Philip then remonstrated at Athens. The admiral was so manifestly in the wrong that the Athenians were prepared to disown his conduct, but Demosthenes saved his tool and persuaded the people to sustain Diopethes. He followed up his speech on the Chersonese question, which scored this success by a loud call to war, the harangue known as the Third Philippic. The orator's thesis is that Philip, inveterately hostile to Athens and aiming at her destruction, is talking peace but acting war, and, when all the king's acts have been construed in this light, the perfectly sound conclusion is drawn that Athens should act at once. The proposals of Demosthenes are to make military preparations to send forces to the Chersonese, and to organize an Hellenic League against the Macedonian wretch. Envoys were sent here and there to raise the alarm. Demosthenes himself proceeded to the Propontis, and succeeded in detaching Byzantium and Perinthus from the Macedonian alliance. At the same time, Athenian troops were sent into Euboea. The governments on Aureus and Eritrea were overthrown, and these cities joined an independent Euboeic League of which the Synod met at Chalcis. The island was thus liberated from Macedon without becoming dependent on Athens. All these acts of hostility were committed without an overt breach of the peace between Athens and Philip, but the succession of Perinthus and Byzantium was a blow which Philip was not prepared to take with equanimity. When he had settled his Thracian province, he began the siege of Perinthus by land and sea. There was an Athenian squadron in the Hellespont which barred the passage of the Macedonian fleet, but Philip caused a diversion by sending land troops into the Chersonese, and by this stratagem got his ships successfully through. The siege of Perinthus marks, for eastern Greece, the beginning of those new developments of the art of besieging, which in Sicily had long since been practised with success. But all the engines and rams, the towers and the mines of Philip, failed to take Perinthus on its steep peninsular cliff. His blockade on the seaside was inefficient, and the besieged were furnished with stores and men from Byzantium. The Athenians were still holding aloof. They had addressed a remonstrance to Philip for violating the Chersonese and capturing some of their cruisers. 
Philip replied by a letter in which he rehearsed numerous acts of Athenian hostility to himself. But the decisive moment came when the king suddenly raised the siege of Perinthus and marched against Byzantium, hoping to capture it by the unexpectedness of his attack. Athens could no longer hold aloof when the key of the Bosporus was in peril. The marble tablet on which the piece was inscribed was pulled down. It was openly war at last. A squadron under Ceres was sent to help Byzantium, and Phocion presently followed with a second fleet. Other help had come from Rhodes and Chios, and Philip was compelled to withdraw into Thrace, baffled in both his undertakings. It was the first triumph of Demosthenes over the arch-foe, and he received a public vote of thanks from the Athenian people. But one wonders that the naval power of Athens had not made itself more immediately and effectively felt. The Macedonian fleet was insignificant. It could inflict damage on merchant vessels or raid a coast, but it had no hold on the sea. The Athenian navy was three hundred strong and controlled the northern Aegean, and yet it seems that in these critical years there was no permanent squadron of any strength stationed in the Hellespont. Naval affairs had been by no means neglected. Eubulus had seen to the building of new shipsheds and had begun the construction of a magnificent arsenal close to the harbour of Zia, for the storage of the sails and rigging and tackle of the ships of war. But these luxuries were vain if the ships themselves were not efficient, and the group system in which the ships were furnished worked badly. Demosthenes had long ago desired to reform this system, which had been in force for seventeen years. The 1,200 richest citizens were liable to the triarchy, each trireme being charged on a small group, of which each member contributed the same proportion of the expense. If a large number of ships were required, this group might consist of five persons. If a small, of fifteen. This system bore hardly on the poorer members of the partnership, who had to pay the same amount as the richer, and some were ruined by the burden. But the great mischief was that these poorer members were often unable to pay their quota in time, and consequently the completion of the triremes was delayed. The influence of Demosthenes was now so enormous that he was able, in the face of bitter opposition from the wealthy class, to introduce a new law, by which the cost of furnishing the ships should fall on each citizen in proportion to his property. Thus a citizen whose property was rated as exceeding thirty talents, would henceforward, instead of having to pay one-fifth or perhaps one-fifteenth of the cost of a single trireme, be obliged to furnish three triremes and a boat. So popular was Demosthenes, by the success of Euboea and Byzantium, that he was able to accomplish a still greater feat. Years before he had cautiously hinted at the expediency of devoting the festival fund to military purposes. He now persuaded the Athenians to adopt this highly disagreeable measure. The building of the arsenal and shipsheds was interrupted also, in order to save the expenses. Philip in the meantime had again withdrawn into the wilds of Thrace. The Scythians near the mouth of the Danube had rebelled, and he crossed the Balkan range to crush them. In returning to Macedon through the lands of the Tribali, in the centre of the peninsula, he had some sore mountain warfare and was severely wounded in the leg. But Thrace was now safe, and he was free to deal with Greece. End of chapter 16, part 7「Chapter sixteen, parts eight and nine of a History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume two, by John Bagnall Bury. Chapter 16, Parts 8 and 9 Section 8, Battle of Chaeronea Philip had no longer the slightest prospect of realising the hope, which he had cherished both before and after the peace of Philocrates, of establishing friendly relations with Athens. The influence of the irreconcilable orator was now triumphant. Through the persistent agitation of Demosthenes, coldness and quarrelling had issued in war and Macedonia had received a distinct check. There was nothing for it now but to accept the war and bring the Macedonian cavalry into play. 
There were two points where Athens could be attacked effectively, at the gates of her own city and at the gates of her granary in the Euxini. But a land power like Macedonia could not operate effectively in the Propontis, unless aided by allies which possessed an effective navy, and Philip had experienced the truth of this when he laid siege to Perinthus and Byzantium. And in that quarter he had now to reckon not only with the Athenian sea power, but with the small navies of the Asiatic islands, Rhodes, Kos, and Chios, which had recently come to the rescue of the menaced cities. For these island states calculated that, if Philip won control of the passage between the two continents, he would not only tax their trade, but would soon cross over to the conquest of Asia Minor, and their fleets would then be appropriated to form the nucleus of a Macedonian navy. Now that Athens had been awakened from her slumbers, it was abundantly evident that the only place where Macedonia could inflict upon her a decisive blow was Attica. On her side, Athens had lightly engaged in a war, for which she had not either fully counted the cost or meditated an adequate programme. In truth, the Athenians had no craving for the war, and they were not driven to it by imperious necessity, or urged by an irresistible instinct, or persuaded by a rational conviction of its expediency. The persistent and crafty agitation of Demosthenes and his party had drawn them on step by step. Their natural feeling of irritation at the rise of a new great power in the north had been sedulously fed and fostered by that eloquent orator and his friends, till it had grown into an unreasoning hatred of the Macedonian king, whose character, aims, and resources were totally misrepresented. But now that war was declared, what was to be the plan of action? Athens had not even an able general who could make an effective combination. She controlled the sea, and it was something that Euboea had shaken off the Macedonian influence. In Chalcis, Athens had a point of vantage against Boeotia, and from Aureus she could raise the Thessalian coast and operate in the Bay of Pagasae. But when Philip advanced southward and passed Thermopylae, which was in his hands, the Athenian superiority at sea was of no use, for his communications were independent of the sea. There was no means of offering serious opposition if he marched on Attica, and the citizens were hardly likely at the bidding of Demosthenes to ascend their ships as they had done at the bidding of Themistocles. If events fell out according to the only probable forecast which could be made, on the assumption of Demosthenes that the invasion of Attica and the ruin of Athens were the supreme objects of Philip, the Athenians had to look forward to the devastation of their country and the siege of their city. How was this peril to be met? They were practically isolated, for they had no strong continental power to support them. What could Megarians or Corinthians, Ambraciots or Achaeans do for them against the host of Philip and his allies? Ah, if we were only islanders! Many an Athenian must have murmured in these critical years. It was the calamity of Athens, as it had been the calamity of Holland, that she was solidly attached to the continent. Now that the crisis approaches nearer, it is borne in upon us more and more how improvident the policy of Athens had been. If she had accepted Macedonian friendship and kept a strong naval force permanently in the Propontis, assuring herself of undisputed control of her own element, she would have been perfectly safe. The constant presence of a powerful fleet belonging to a predominant naval state may be in itself a strategic success equivalent to a series of victories. But though we have almost no notices of the movements of the Athenian galleys at this time, we cannot help suspecting that the naval power of Athens was inefficiently handled. Demosthenes had never had a free hand until the siege of Byzantium. Till then he could do little more than agitate. When at length he became, in the full sense of the word, the director of Athenian policy, his energy and skill were amazing. But we cannot help asking with what hopes he was prepared to undertake the responsibility of bringing an invader into his country and a besieger to the walls of his city. The answer is that he rested his hope on a single chance. From the beginning of his public career, Demosthenes had a strong leaning to Thebes, and it had been already mentioned that he was Theban Proxenos at Athens. This was a predilection which it behoved him to be very careful of airing, for the general feeling in his city was unfriendly to Thebes. The rhetorical tears which Demosthenes shed over the fate of the Phocians were not inconsistent with his attachment to the enemies of Phocis, for he never raised his voice for the victims of Theban hatred until their doom was accomplished. The aim of his policy was to unite Athens in alliance with Thebes. 
it was a difficult and doubtful game. Could Thebes be induced to turn against her Macedonian ally, who had recently secured for her the full supremacy of Boeotia, and who, she might reasonably reckon, would continue to support her as an useful neighbour to Attica? On this chance, and a poor chance it seemed, rested the desperate policy of Demosthenes. If Thebes joined Philip, or even gave him a free passage through Boeotia, the fate of Attica was sealed. But if she could be brought to desert him, her well-trained troops, joined with those of Athens, might successfully oppose his invasion. The invasion was not long delayed, and it came about in a curious way. During the recent sacred war, the Athenians had burnished anew and set up again in the sanctuary of Delphi the donative which they had dedicated after the victory of Plataea, being gold shields with the inscription, from the spoils of Persians and Thebans who fought together against the Greeks. Such a rededication, while Delphi was in the hands of the Phocians, who had been condemned as sacrilegious robbers, might be regarded as an offence against religion. At all events, the Thebans and their friends had an excellent pretext to revenge themselves on Athens for that most offensive inscription, which had perpetrated the shame of Thebes for a century and a half. The Thebans themselves did not come forward, but their friends of the Locrian Amphissa and arranged to accuse the Athenians at the autumn session of the Amphictyonic Council and propose a fine of fifty talents. At this session, Ashinis was one of the Athenian deputies, and he discovered the movement which was afoot against his city. He was an able man, and he forestalled the blow by dealing another. The men who had been incited to charge Athens with sacrilege had been themselves guilty of a sacrilege far more enormous. They had cultivated part of the accursed field which had once been the land of Crisa. Aeschines arose in the assembly, and in an impressive and convincing speech which carried his audience with him, called upon the Apphictyons to punish the men who had wrought this impious act. On the morrow, at the break of day, the Amphictyons and the Delphians, armed with pickaxes, marched down the hill to lay waste the places which had been unlawfully cultivated, and as they did so, were assaulted by the Amphictyons, whose city is visible from the plain. The council then resolved to hold a special meeting at Thermopylae, in order to consult on measures for the punishment of the Locrians, who, to their former crime, had added the offence of violating the persons of the Amphictyonic deputies. By his promptness and eloquence the Athenian orator had secured a great triumph. He had completely turned the tables on the enemies, Amphissa and Thebes, who must have been prepared to declare an Amphictyonic war against Athens, in case she declined, as she certainly would have done, to pay the fine. They calculated, of course, on the support of Philip of Macedon. But it was now for Athens to take the lead in a sacred war against Amphissa, and it was a favourable opportunity for her to make peace with Philip, so that the combination should be Philip and Athens against Thebes, instead of Philip and Thebes against Athens. It was not to be expected that this advantage which Aeschines had gained would be welcome to Demosthenes, for it was the object of Demosthenes to avoid an embroilment with Thebes. Accordingly, he persuaded the people to send no deputies to the special Amphictyonic meeting, and take no part in the proceedings against Amphissa. He upbraided Aeschines with trying to bring an Amphictyonic war into Attica, a strange taunt to the man who had prevented the declaration of an Amphictyonic war against Athens. Thus, although the attack upon Athens must have been prepared at Theban instigation, the incident was converted, through the policy of Demosthenes, into a means of bringing Athens and Thebes closer together. Athens and Thebes alike abstained from attending the special meeting. The Amphictyons, in accordance with the decisions of that meeting, marched against the Amphissians, but were not strong enough to impose the penalties which had been decreed. Accordingly, at the next autumn session, they determined to invite Philip to come down once more to be leader in a sacred war. Philip did not delay a moment. An Amphictyonic war, from which both Athens and Thebes held aloof, was a matter which needed prompt attention. When he reached Thermopylae, he probably sent on, by the mountain road which passes through Doris to Amphissa, a small force to occupy Cytinion, the chief town on that road. Advancing himself through the defile of Thermopylae into northern Phocis, he seized and refortified the dismantled city of Elatea. The purpose of this action was to protect himself in the rear against Boeotia, and preserve his communications with Thermopylae while he was operating against Amphissa. But while he halted at Elatea, he sent ambassadors to explore the intentions of Thebes. He declared that he intended to invade Attica, 
and called upon the Thebans to join him in the invasion, or, if they would not do this, to give his army a free passage through Boeotia. This was a diplomatic method of forcing Thebes to declare herself. It does not prove that Philip had any serious intention of marching against Attica, and his later conduct seems to show that he did not contemplate such a step. But in Athens, when the news came that the Macedonian army was at Eletia, the folk fell into extreme panic and alarm. It would seem that Philip's rapid movements had brought him into central Greece far sooner than was expected, and the news of his arrival, which must have been transmitted by way of Thebes, was accompanied by the rumour that he was about to march on Athens. And thus the Athenians in their fright connected the seizure of Eletia with the supposed design against themselves, although Eletia had no closer connection than the pass of Thermopylae with an attack on Athens. For a night and a day the city was filled with consternation, and these anxious hours have been famous in history through the genius of the orator Demosthenes, who in later years recalled to the people the scene and their own emotions by a picturesque description which no orator has surpassed. On the advice of Demosthenes, the Athenians dispatched ten envoys to Thebes. Everything depended upon detaching Thebes from the Macedonian alliance, and it seemed at least possible that this might be effected. For though there were probably few in Thebes who were inclined to be friendly to Athens, there was a party of some weight which was distinctly hostile to Macedonia. Moreover, there was a feeling of soreness against Philip for having seized Nicaea, close to Thermopylae, and replaced its Theban garrison by Thessalians. The envoys, of whom Demosthenes was one, were instructed to make concessions and exact none. The ambassadors of Athens and Macedon met in the Boeotian capital, and their messages were heard in turn by the Theban assembly. It would be too much to say that the fate of Greece depended on the deliberations of this assembly, but it is the mere truth that the Theban vote not only decided the doom of Thebes itself, but determined the shape of the great event to which Greece had been irresistibly moving. In considering the situation which the rise of Macedon had created, we have hitherto stood in Pella or in Athens. We must now for a moment take our point of view at Thebes. The inveterate rivalry and ever-smouldering hate which existed between Thebes and Athens was a strong motive inducing Thebes to embrace an opportunity for rendering Athens harmless. But it would require no great foresight to see that, by weakening her old rival, Thebes would gravely endanger her own position. So long as Philip had a strong Athens to reckon with, it behoved him to treat Thebes with respect. But if Athens were reduced to nothingness, Thebes would be absolutely in his power, and probably his first step would be to free the cities of Boeotia from her domination. To put it shortly, the independent attitude which Thebes had hitherto been able to maintain towards her friend Macedonia depended on the integrity of Athens. Thus the positions of Thebes and Athens were remarkably different. While Athens could with impunity stand alone as Philip's enemy, when Thebes was Philip's friend, Thebes could not safely be Philip's friend unless Athens were his enemy. The reason for this difference was that Athens was a sea power. To a Theban statesman, then, possessing any foresight, the subjugation of Athens would have been feared as the prelude to the depression of Thebes, and it would have seemed wiser to join in a common resistance to Philip. This sound reasoning was quickened by the eloquence of Demosthenes and the offers of Athens. The Athenians were ready to pay two-thirds of the expenses of the war. They abandoned their claim to Oropus, and they recognized the Boeotian dominion of Thebes, a dominion which they had always condemned before as an outrage on the rights of free communities. But professing now, through the mouth of Demosthenes, to be the champion of Hellenic liberty, Athens scrupled little to sacrifice the liberties of a few Boeotian cities. By these concessions she secured the alliance of Thebes, and Demosthenes won the greatest diplomatic success that he had yet achieved, the consummation to which his policy had been directed for many years. The first concern of Philip was to do the work which the Amphictyons had summoned him to perform, but that he is completely lost to our sight in this campaign. We only know that the Allies followed him into focus and gained some advantages in two engagements, but that he ultimately captured not only Amphissa, cutting up a force of mercenaries that Athens had sent his, that Athens had sent thither, but also Norpactus, thus gaining a point of vantage against the Peloponnesus. He then turned back to carry the war into Boeotia, and when he entered the great western gate of that country close to Chaeronea, he found the army of the allies guarding the way to Thebes, and prepared to give him battle. He had thirty thousand foot soldiers, and two thousand horse, perhaps slightly outnumbering his foes. 
Their line extended over about three and a half miles, the left wing resting on Chaeronea, and the right on the river Cephesus. The Theban Hoplites, with the sacred band in front, under the command of Theagenes, did not occupy the left wing, as when Epaminondas led them to victory at Leuctra and at Mantinea, but were assigned the right, which was esteemed the post of honour. In the centre were ranged the troops of the lesser allies, Achaeans, Corinthians, Phocians, and others, whom Demosthenes boasted of having rallied to the cause of Hellenic liberty. On the left stood the Athenians under three generals, Cares, Lysicles, and Stratocles, of whom Cares was a respectable soldier with considerable experience and no talent, while the other two were incompetent. Demosthenes himself was serving as a hoplite in the ranks. Of the battle we know less perhaps than of any other equally important engagement in the history of Greece, but we can form a general notion of the tactics of Philip. The most formidable part of the adverse array was the Theban infantry, and accordingly he posted on his own left wing the phalanx, with its more open order and long pikes, to try its strength against the most efficient of the old-fashioned hoplites of Greece. On the flank of this wing he placed his heavy cavalry, to ride down upon the Thebans when the phalanx had worn them out. The cavalry was commanded by Alexander, now a lad of eighteen, and, many hundred years after, the oak of Alexander was shown on the bank of the river. The right wing was comparatively weak, and Philip planned that it should gradually give way before the attack of the Athenians and draw them on, so as to divide them from their allies. This plan of holding back the right wing reminds us of the tactics of Epaminondas, but the use of cavalry to decide the combat is a characteristic feature of Philip's battles. The Athenians pressed forward, fondly fancying that they were pressing to victory, and Stratocles, in the flush of success, cried, On to Macedonia! But in the meantime the Thebans had been broken by Alexander's horsemen. Their leader had fallen, and the comrades of the sacred Lochos were making a last hopeless stand. Philip could now spare some of his Macedonian footmen, and he moved them so as to take the Athenians in flank and rear. Against the assault of these trained troops the Athenians were helpless. One thousand were slain, two thousand captured, and the rest ran, Demosthenes running with the fleetest. But the sacred band did not flee. They fought till they fell, and it is their heroism which has won for the Battle of Chaeronea its glory as a struggle for liberty. When the traveller, journeying on the highway from Phocis to Thebes, has passed the town of Chaeronea, he sees at the roadside the tomb where those heroes were laid, and the fragments of the lion which was set up to keep a long ward over their bones. An epitaph which was composed in honour of the Athenian dead suggests the consolation that God alone is sure of success. Men must be prepared to fail. It is true, but in this case the failure cannot be imputed to the chances of war. When the Allies opened the campaign the outlook was not hopeless. If they had been led by a competent general, they might have reduced the Macedonian army to serious straits amid the valleys of Phocis and the hills of Locris. But to oppose to a Philip, the best they had was a Ceres. The war was really decided in Locris by the strategical inferiority of the Athenian and Theban generals, and the inevitable sequel of the blunders. There was the catastrophe in Boeotia. The advantage in numerical strength with which the Allies started had been lost and when they stood face to face with the advancing foe at Chaeronea, all the chances were adverse to any issue save defeat, in a battle in the open against a general of such preeminent ability. Men must be prepared to fail when they have no competent leader. If the chances of another issue to the Battle of Chaeronea have been exaggerated, the significance of that event has been often misrepresented. The Battle of Chaeronea belongs to the same historical series as the battles of Aegosopotami and Leuctra. As the hegemony or first place among Greek states had been passed successively from Athens to Sparta and to Thebes, so now it passed to Macedon. The statement that Greek liberty perished on the plain of Chaeronea is as true or as false as that it perished on the field of Leuctra or the strand of the Goat's River. Whenever a Greek state became supreme, that supremacy entailed the depression of some states and the dependency or subjection of others. Athens was reduced to a secondary place by Macedon, and Thebes fared still worse. But we must not forget what Sparta, in the day of her triumph, did to Athens, or the more evil things which Thebes proposed. There were, however, in the case of Macedonia, 
special circumstances which seemed to give her victory a more fatal character than those previous victories which had initiated new supremacies. For Macedon was regarded in Hellas as an outsider. This was a feeling which the southern Greeks entertained even in regard to Thessaly when Jason threatened them with a Thessalian hegemony, and Macedonia, politically and historically as well as geographically, was some steps further away than Thessaly. If Thessaly was hardly inside the inner circle of Hellenic politics, Macedonia was distinctly outside it. To Athens and Sparta, to Corinth and Argos and Thebes, the old powers, who, as we might say, had known each other all their lives as foes or friends, and had a common international history, the supremacy of Macedonia seemed the intrusion of an upstart. And in second place, this supremacy was the triumph of an absolute monarchy over three commonwealths, so that the submission of the Greek states to Macedon's king might be rhetorically branded as an enslavement to a tyrant, in a sense in which the subjection to a sovereign Athens or a sovereign Sparta could not be so described. For these reasons, the tidings of Chaeronea sent a new kind of thrill through Greece, and the impression that there was something unique in Philip's victory might be said to have been confirmed by subsequent history, which showed that the old Greek commonwealths had had their day and might never again rise to be first-rate powers. Section 9. The Synedrion of the Greeks. Philip's Death. Isocrates just lived to hear the tidings of Chaeronea, and died consoled for the fate of his fallen fellow-citizens by the thought that the unity of Hellas was now assured. But a Greek unity, such as he dreamed of, was by no means assured. The hegemony of Macedonia did as little to unite the Greek states or abolish the separatist tendency as the hegemony of Athens or of Sparta, but we must see how Philip used his victory. He treated Thebes just as Sparta had treated it when Phobidas surprised the citadel. He punished by death or confiscation his leading opponents. He established a Macedonian garrison in the Cadmea, and broke up the Boeotian League, giving all the cities their independence, and restoring the dismantled towns of Orchomenus and Plataea. But if his dealings with Thebes did not go beyond the usual dealing of one Greek state with its vanquished rival, his dealing with Athens was unusually lenient. The truth was that Athens did not lie defenceless at his feet. He might invade and ravage Attica, but when he came to invest Athens and Piraeus, he might find himself confronted by a task more arduous than that which had thwarted him at Perinthus and Byzantium. The sea power of Athens saved her, and not less, perhaps, the respect which Philip always felt for her intellectual eminence. Now at last, by unexpected leniency, he might win what he had always striven for, the moral and material support of Athens. And in Athens men were now ready to listen to the voices which were raised for peace. The policy of Demosthenes had failed, and all desired to recover the two thousand captives and avert an invasion of the Attic soil. There was little disposition to hearken to the advice of Hyperides, who proposed to enfranchise and arm one hundred and fifty thousand slaves. Among the captives was an orator of consummate talent, named Demades, who belonged to the peace party, and saw that the supremacy of Macedon was inevitable. An anecdote was noised about that Philip, who spent the night after the battle in wild revelry, came reeling drunk to the place where his prisoners were, and jeered at their misfortune making merry, too, over the flight of the great Demosthenes. But Demades stood forth and ventured to rebuke him. O king, fortune has given you the role of Agamemnon, and you play the part of Thersites. The words stung and sobered the drunken victor. He flung away his garlands and all the gear of his revel, and set the bold speaker free. But whether this story be true or not, Demades was politically sympathetic with Philip, and was sent by him to negotiate peace at Athens. Philip offered to restore all the prisoners without ransom, and not to march into Attica. The Athenians on their side were to dissolve what remained of their confederacy, and join the new Hellenic Union which Philip proposed to organize. In regard to territory, Oropus was to be given to Athens, but the Chersonesus was to be surrendered to Macedonia. On these terms peace was concluded, and the Athenian people thought that they had come off well. Philip sent his son and two of his chief officers to Athens, with the bodies of the Athenians who had been slain. They were received with great honour, and a statue of the Macedonian king was set up in the marketplace, a token of gratitude which was probably genuine. 
Demosthenes himself afterwards confessed with a snarl that Philip had been kind. It was now necessary for Macedonia to win the recognition of her supremacy from the Peloponnesian states. Philip marched himself into Peloponnesus, and met with no resistance. Sparta alone refused to submit, and the conqueror bore down upon her, with the purpose of forcing on her a reform of the constitution and the abolition of her peculiar kingship, which seemed to him like a relic of the Dark Ages. But something mysterious happened which induced him to desist from his purpose, and a poet of Epidaurus, who was at that time a boy, told in later years how the god Asclepius had intervened to save the Spartan state. What time King Philip unto Sparta came, bent on abolishing the royal name. But Sparta, though her kings were saved, had to suffer at the hands of Philip what she had before suffered at the hands of Epaminondas, the devastation of Laconia and the diminution of her territory. The frontier districts on the three sides were given to her neighbours, Argos, Tegea, Megalopolis, and Messenia. Having thus displayed his arms and power in the south, the Macedonian king invited all the Greek states within Thermopylae to send delegates to a congress at Corinth, and, with the sole exception of Sparta, all the states obeyed. It was a federal congress, the first assembly of an Hellenic confederacy, of which the place of meeting was to be Corinth and Macedonia the head. The aim of the confederacy was understood from the first, but it would seem that it was not till the second meeting a year later that Philip announced his resolve to make war upon Persia, in behalf of Greece and her gods, to liberate the Greek cities of Asia, and to punish the barbarians for the acts of sacrilege which their forefathers had wrought in the days of Xerxes. It was the formal announcement that a new act in the eternal struggle between Europe and Asia was about to begin, and Europe, having found a leader, might now have her revenge for many a deed of insolence. The federal gathering voted for the war and elected Philip General with supreme powers. It was arranged what contingents in men or ships each city should contribute to the Pan-Hellenic army. The Athenians undertook to send a considerable fleet. The league which was thus organized under the hegemony of Macedon had the advantage of placing before its members a definite object to be accomplished, and it might be thought a common interest. But if Themistocles found it hard to unite the Greek states by a common fear, it was harder still for Philip to unite them by a common hope, and the idea which Macedon promulgated produced no Panhellenic effort, and awakened but small enthusiasm. Yet the Congress of Corinth has its significance. It is the counterpart of that earlier Congress which met at the Isthmus, when Greece was trembling at the thought of the barbarian host which was rolling towards her from the east. She had so long ceased to tremble that she had almost forgotten to remember before the day of vengeance came. But with the revolution of fortune's wheel, that day came duly round, and Greece met once more on the Isthmus to concert how her ancient tremors might be amply avenged. The new league did not unite the Greeks in the sense which Isocrates had hoped for their union. There was a common dependency on Macedon, but there was no zeal for the aims of the northern power, no faith in her as the guide and leader of Greece. Each state went its own private way, and the interests of the Greek communities remained as isolated and particular as ever. A league of such members could not be held together. The peace which the league stipulated could not be maintained without some military stations in the midst of the country, and Philip established three Macedonian garrisons at important points. At Ambracia to watch the west, at Corinth to hold the Peloponnesus in check, and at Chalcis to control northeastern Greece. The designs of Philip probably did not extend beyond the conquest of Western Asia Minor, but it was not fated that he should achieve this himself. In the spring after the Congress, his preparations for war were nearly complete, and he sent forward an advanced force under Parmenio and other generals to secure the passage of the Hellespont and win a footing in the Troad and Bithynia. The rest of the army was soon to follow under his own command. But Philip, as a frank Corinthian friend told him, had filled his own house with division and bitterness. A Macedonian king was not expected to be faithful to his wife, but the proud and stormy princess whom he had wedded was impatient of his open infidelities. Nor was her own virtue deemed above suspicion, and it was even whispered that Alexander was not Philip's son. The crisis came when Philip fell in love with a Macedonian maiden of too high a station to become his concubine. Cleopatra, the niece of his general Attalus. 
Yielding to his passion, he put Olympias away and celebrated his second marriage. At the wedding feast, Attalus, bold with wine, invited the nobles to pray the gods for a legitimate heir to the throne. Alexander flung his drinking cup in the face of the man who had insulted his mother, and Philip started up, drawing his sword to transpierce his son. But he reeled and fell, and Alexander jeered. Behold the man who would pass from Europe to Asia, and trips in passing from couch to couch. Pella was no longer the place for Alexander. He took the divorced queen to Epirus, and withdrew himself to the hills of Lynchestis, until Philip invited him to return. But the restless intrigues of the injured mother soon created new debates, and when a son was born to Cleopatra, it was easy to arouse the fears of Alexander that his own succession to the throne was imperiled. Philip's most urgent desire was to avoid a breach with the powerful king of Epirus, the brother of the injured woman. To this end he offered him his daughter in wedlock, and the marriage was to be celebrated with great pomp in Pella, on the eve of Philip's departure for Asia. But it was decreed that he should not depart. Olympias was made of the stuff which does not hesitate at crime, and a tool was easily found to avenge the wrongs of the wife and assure the succession of the son. A certain Pausanias, an obscure man of no merit, had been grossly wronged by Italus, and was madly incensed against the king, who refused to do him justice. On the wedding day, as Philip, in solemn procession, entered the theatre a little in advance of his guards, Pausanias rushed forward with a Celtic dagger and laid him a corpse at the gate. The assassin was caught and killed, but the true assassin was Olympias, and it was Alexander who reaped the fruits of the crime. Willingly would we believe that he knew nothing of the plot, and that a man of such a generous nature never stooped to thoughts of parricide. Beyond dark whispers there is no evidence against him, yet it would be rash to say his innocence is certain. To none of the world's greatest rulers has history done less justice than to Philip. The failure in appreciation has been due to two or perhaps three causes. The overwhelming greatness of a son greater than himself has overshadowed him and drawn men's eyes to achievements which could never have been wrought but for Philip's lifetime of toil. In the second place, we depend for our knowledge of Philip's work almost entirely on the Athenian orators, and especially on Demosthenes, whose main object was to misrepresent the king. And we may add, thirdly, that we possess no account of one of the greatest and most difficult of his exploits, the conquest of Thrace. Thus through chance, through the malignant eloquence of his opponent, who has held the ears of posterity, and through the very results of his own deeds, the maker and expander of Macedonia, the conqueror of Thrace and Greece, has hardly held his due place in the history of the world. The importance of his work cannot be fully understood until the consequences which it devolved upon his son to carry out have been studied. The work of Alexander is the most authentic testimony to the work of Philip. But there was one notable man of the day whose imagination grasped the ecumenical importance of the king of Macedon. A pupil of Isocrates, Theopompus of Chios, who played some part in the politics of his own island, was inspired by the deeds of Philip to write a history of his own time, with Philip as its central figure. In that elaborate work, the loss of which is irreparable, Theopompus exposed candidly and impartially the king's weaknesses and misdeeds but he declared his judgment that Europe had never produced as great a man as the son of Amyntas. It is part of the injustice to Philip that the history of Greece during his reign has so often been treated as little more than a biography of Demosthenes. Only his political opponents would deny that Demosthenes was the most eloquent of orators and the most patriotic of citizens. But that oratory in which he excelled was one of the curses of Greek politics. The art of persuasive speech is indispensable in a free commonwealth, and when it is wielded by a statesman or a general, a Pericles, a Cleon, or a Xenophon, is a noble as well as useful instrument. But once it ceases to be a merely auxiliary art, it becomes dangerous and hurtful. This is what had happened at Athens. Rhetoric had been carried to such perfection that the best years of a man's youth were absorbed in learning it, and when he entered upon public life he was a finished speaker but a poor politician. Briefly, orators took the place of statesmen and Demosthenes was the most eminent of the class. They could all formulate striking phrases of profound political wisdom, but their school-taught law did not carry them far against the craft of the Macedonian statesmen. The men of mighty words were as children in the hands of the man of mighty deeds. 
The Athenians took pleasure in hearing and criticizing the elaborate speeches of their orators, and the eloquence of Demosthenes, though it was thoroughly appreciated, imposed far less on such connoisseurs than it has imposed upon posterity. The common sense of a plain man could easily expose his sophistries. He said himself that the blunt Phocion was the chopper of his periods. Demosthenes used his brilliant speech in the service of his country. He used it unscrupulously according to his light, the light of purblind patriotism. He could take a lofty tone. He professed to regard Philip as a barbarian threatening Hellas and her gods. There is no need to show that, judged from the point of view of the history of the world, his policy was retrograde and retarding. We cannot fairly criticize him either for not having seen, even as fully as Isocrates, that the day for the expansion of Greece had come, and that no existing Greek commonwealth was competent to conduct that expansion, or if he did vaguely see it, for having looked the other way. All he saw, or at least all he cared, was that the increase of Macedonia meant the curtailment of Athens and his political life was one long agitation against Macedonia's restless advance. But it was nothing more than a busy and often brilliant agitation, carried on from day to day and from month to month without any comprehensive plan. A fervent patriot does not make a great statesman. Demosthenes could devise reforms in special departments of the administration. He could admonish his fellow citizens to be up and doing. But he did not grapple seriously with any of the new problems of his day. He did not originate one fertile political idea. A statesman of genius might conceivably have infused fresh life into Athens by effecting some radical change in her constitution and finding for her a new part to play. The fact that no such statesman arose is perhaps merely another side of the fact that her part as a chief actor was over. It has often been said that the Demosthenic Athenians were irreclaimable. They certainly could not have been reclaimed by Demosthenes. For Demosthenes, when all is said, was a typical Demosthenic Athenian. End of chapter 16, parts 8 and 9。Chapter 17, parts 1 through 3 of A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 2, by John Bagnell Burry. Chapter 17, The Conquest of Persia, Parts 1 through 3. Section 1, Alexander's First Descent on Greece. On his accession to the throne of Macedon, Alexander found himself menaced by enemies on all sides. The members of the Confederacy of Corinth, the tributary peoples of the province of Thrace, the inveterately hostile Illyrians, all saw in the death of Philip an opportunity not to be missed for undoing his work. And in Asia, Attalus, the father of Cleopatra, espoused the claim of Cleopatra's infant son. Thus Alexander stood within a belt of dangers, like that by which his father, at the same crisis in his life, had been encompassed. The difference of the means which sire and son adopted to deal with the jeopardy showed the difference in temperament between the two men. If Alexander had followed the slow and sure methods of his father, he would have bought off the barbarians of the north, effected a reconciliation with Attalus, and deferred the Greek question till he had thoroughly established his power in Macedonia. Then, by degrees, he could have recovered in a few years the dominion which Philip had won, and undertaken the expedition against Persia which Philip had planned. But such cautious calculation did not suit the bolder genius of Philip's son. He refused to yield to any of his foes. He encountered the perils one after another, and overcame them all. First of all, he turned to Greece, where the situation looked serious enough. Athens had hailed the news of Philip's death with undisguised joy and the instance of Demosthenes had passed a decree in honor of his murderer's memory. Trumpets were sounded for war, messengers were flying to Attalus and to Persia, and Greece was incited to throw off the Macedonian yoke. Ambracia expelled her garrison, and Thebes attempted to expel hers. But the insurrection of Thessaly was of far greater importance than the hostile agitations in the southern states. 
the Thessalian cavalry was an invaluable adjunct to the Macedonian army, and it was a more material consequence to a Macedonian king to be the archon of the Thessalian federation than to be acknowledged as general of the confederacy of Corinth. Yet it was hardly altogether the need of quickly securing Thessaly that urged Alexander to deal with Greece before he dealt with any other portion of his empire. He wished above all things to save Greece from herself. His timely appearance, before the agitation could develop into a fully declared rebellion, might prevent the cities from committing any irreparable action which would necessitate a condign punishment or even harsh measures. He would march south, not to chastise or judge the Greeks, but to conciliate them and obtain recognition as successor to his father's place in the Amphictyony of Delphi and the League of Corinth. He advanced to the defile of Tempe, but found it strongly held by the Thessalians. Instead of attempting to carry a position which was perhaps impregnable, he led his army further south along the coast, and, cutting steps up the steep side of Asa, he made a new path for himself over the mountain, and descended into the plain of the Peneus behind his enemy. Not a drop of blood was shed. A Thessalian assembly elected Alexander to the archonship, and he guaranteed to the communities of the land the same rights and privileges which they had enjoyed under his father. The conciliation of Thessaly led to the adhesion of its southern neighbors, Malus and Dolopia. At Thermopylae the young king was recognized by the Amphictyony, and as he marched southward not a hand was raised against him. He had swooped down so quickly that nothing was ready to resist. The Athenians sent a repentant embassy, which the king received kindly without any reference to the public jubilations over his father's murder, and the Congress of the Confederacy met at Corinth to elect Alexander general in his father's place. Alexander was chosen supreme general of the Greeks for the invasion of Asia, and it was as head of Hellas, descendant and successor of Achilles, rather than as Macedonian king, that he desired to go forth against Persia. But his election by the Greek confederacy at Corinth had more of historical fitness than political significance. The contingents which the Greek states furnished as members of the League were small, and the idea of the expedition failed to arouse any national feeling. Yet the welcome, though half-hearted and hypocritical, which was given to Alexander at Corinth, and the vote, however prefunctory, which elected him leader of the Greeks, were the fitting prelude to the expansion of Hellas and the diffusion of Hellenic civilization, which destiny had chosen him to accomplish. He was thus formally recognized as what he, in fullest verity, was, the representative of Greece. Of all those who thronged at Corinth round the royal youth, to observe him with curious gaze, or flatter him with pleasant words, some may have foreseen that he would be a conqueror of many lands, but none could have suspected how his conquests would transform the world, for few realized that the world was waiting to be transformed. Outside the gates of Corinth, according to a famous story, the king found the eccentric philosopher Diogenes sitting in the barrel, which served him as a home, and asked him to name a boon. Stand out of the sun, was the brief reply of the philosopher. Were I not Alexander, said the king to his retinue, I should like to be Diogenes. The incident may never have happened, but the anecdote happily brings face to face the enthusiast who carried individual liberty to the utmost verge of independence, and the enthusiast who dreamed of making his empire conterminous with the globe. For the individualism which Diogenes caricatured was the sister to the spirit of cosmopolitanism which Alexander's empire was to promote. Meanwhile, some domestic dangers had been cleared violently out of his path. His stepmother, her father, and her child had all been done away with. Attalus had been murdered in Asia in accordance with the king's commands. But Alexander was not responsible for the death of Cleopatra and her infant. This was said to be the work of Olympias, who, thirsty for revenge, caused the child to be slaughtered in its mother's lap, and forced Cleopatra to hang herself by her own belt. Section 2. 
Alexander's campaigns in Thrace and Illyria. There were symptoms of disquietude in Thrace. There were signs of a storm brewing in the Illyrian quarter, and it would have been impossible for the young king to invade Asia, with Thrace ready to revolt in his rear, and Macedonia exposed to attack from the west. It was indispensable to teach the Thracians a lesson, and especially the Tribali, who had never been chastised for the check which they had inflicted on Philip. The Tribali lived beyond the Hymus, and when Alexander, having crossed Mount Rodope, reached the foot of one of the western passes of Mount Hymus, he found the steep defile defended by mountaineers. They had hauled up a multitude of their war chariots to the top of the pass, in order to roll them upon the Macedonians, and then, rushing down themselves, to fall upon the disordered army. There was no other way of crossing the mountain, and the mountain must be crossed. Alexander showed, here again, the same temper and the same resource which he had shown at Tempe. When he had made up his mind that an object must be attained, he never hesitated to employ the boldest or most novel means. He ordered the infantry to advance up the path, opening the ranks when possible to let the chariots roll through, but when that was impossible he directed them to fall on their knees, and, holding their shields locked together, to form a roof on which the chariots would fall and roll harmlessly away. The device was successful. The volley of the carts rattled over the locked shields, and, notwithstanding the shock, not a man was killed. When the barbarians had exhausted these ponderous missiles, the pass was easily taken, and the Macedonians descended into the country of the Tribali. At the news of Alexander's approach, the Tribali had sent their wives and children to an island named Peusi in the Danube, and then, waiting until he advanced into their land, stole behind him to seize the mountain passes in his rear. Learning of this movement, Alexander marched rapidly back, forced the enemy to fight, and dispersed them with great loss. He then proceeded on his way to the bank of the Danube. He had foreseen that it might be necessary to operate on that river, perhaps to make a demonstration in the country of the Getai on the northern bank, and he had prepared for this emergency by adopting the same plan as Darius in his famous Thracian expedition. He instructed his ally, Byzantium, to dispatch ships to sail up the river. The garrison in the island of Peusi was supported by a host of Scythian friends on the left bank of the stream, and Alexander saw that with his few Byzantine galleys it would be hopeless to attack the island until he had secured the Scythian shore. The problem was to throw his troops across the river without the enemy's knowledge, and this must be done in the darkness of one night. The ships were too few in number, but all the fishing boats in the neighborhood were collected, and the tent skins filled with hay were tied firmly together and strung across the stream. Landing on the other bank, led by the king himself, a large band of horse and foot advanced under the cover of the long corn at dawn of day, and the barbarian host arose to see the Macedonian phalanx unfolded before them. Startled as much as by the terrible promptitude of their foe, as by the formidable array which faced them, they withdrew into their poorly fortified town, and when Alexander followed them at the head of his cavalry, they fled with all their horses could carry into the wilds of the north. Empire beyond the Danube was not sought by Alexander, and he did not pursue. He marked the term of his northern conquest by sacrificing solemnly on the banks to Zeus Soter, Heracles, and the river god himself. This exploit led to the surrender of the Tribali in the island, and all the neighboring tribes south of the river hastened to assure the king of their submission. There came also from unknown homes far up the river, or perhaps in the Dalmatian mountains, an embassy of Celts, huge-limbed, self-confident men, who had heard of Alexander's deeds and were fain to be his friends. Curious to know what impression the Macedonian name had made upon that distant folk, Alexander asked him what they feared most. We fear nothing, they said. If it be not, let's the sky fall. Braggarts, said Alexander afterwards. But before two generations had passed away, these men of mighty limbs and mighty words were destined to roll down in a torrent upon Greece and Asia, and to wrest for their own habitation a part of Alexander's conquests. Alexander's work was done in Thrace, but as he marched homeward, 
he learned that the Illyrians were already in the gate of Macedonia, and that not a moment must be lost if the country was to be saved from an invasion. Philip had secured the Macedonian frontier on the Illyrian side by a number of fortresses near the sources of the Haliachman and Apsis, and Pelion, which was the strongest of those strongholds, the key fortress of the mountain gate, had now fallen into the hands of Clytus, the Illyrian chief. To reach Pelion as quickly as possible, before the arrival of the Tolentines, a folk in alliance with Clytus, was the object of Alexander. His march was threatened by the Ariatis, another hostile folk, whom Clytus had engaged to waylay him. But this danger was prevented by the friendly king of the Agrianes, who invaded the Alteriat territory and fully occupied the fighting men. Marching rapidly up the river of the Ariagonus, Alexander encamped near Pelion. The heights around were covered with Illyrians, and Clytus, as was the custom of his people before a battle, sacrificed three boys, three maidens, and three black rams. But before they came to the actual attack, the hearts of the Illyrians failed them, and, deserting all their points of vantage, and leaving their sacrifice incomplete, they retired into the fastness. Alexander intended to blockade the place next day by a circumvallation, but the Tolentines arrived in a large force, and he saw that his men were too few to deal at once with the foes within and the foes without the walls, nor were his provisions sufficient for a protracted siege. It was absolutely necessary to withdraw from his present position, but it was a task of extreme peril to retreat in these defiles, with hostile Pelion in the rear, and Tolentine troops occupying the slopes and heights. This task, however, was carried out successfully, through the amazingly swift and skillful maneuvering of the highly drilled Macedonian soldiers. The enemy were driven from their flanking positions, and the river was crossed with much trouble, yet without the loss of a man. At the other side of the river, Alexander's communications were safe. He could obtain provisions and reinforcements as he chose, and might wait, at his ease, for an opportunity to strike. The moment soon came. The enemy, seeing in Alexander's retreat a confession of fear, neglected all precautions and formed a camp without rampart or outpost before the gates of the fortress. Taking a portion of his army and bidding the rest follow, Alexander set out at night and surprised the slumbering camp of the barbarians. A carnage followed and a wild flight, and the Macedonians pursued to the Tauritine mountains. At the first alarm, Clytus rushed to the gates of Pelion and set the town on fire before he joined the flight. This discomfit of the Illyrians was a no less striking proof of Alexander's capacity than his exploits in Thrace. These months of incessant toil had earned him a rest, but there was to be no rest yet for the young monarch. Even as the tidings of the Illyrian danger had reached him before he left Thrace, so now, while he was still at Pelion, the news came that Thebes had rebelled. He must now speed to Greece as swiftly as seven days agone he had sped to the Illyrian hills. No need was more pressing than to crush this revolt before it spread. Section 3. Alexander's Second Descent on Greece The agitation against Macedon had not ceased during the past year in the cities of Greece, and it was now fomented by the gold and the encouragement of Persia, Five years before, at the outbreak of the war, Athens had sent ambassadors to Susa, begging for subsidies from Artaxerxes, but the great king would not break with Philip then, and sent them away with a very haughty and barbarous letter of refusal. The Phrygian satrap, however, perhaps on his own responsibility, sent useful help to Perinthus in its peril, and Persia gradually awoke to the fact that Macedonia was a dangerous neighbor. The new king, Darius, saw the necessity of embarrassing Alexander in Europe, so as to keep him as long as possible from crossing into Asia, where the Macedonian forces under Parmenio were holding their own. For this purpose he stirred up thoughts of war in Greece, and sent subsidies to the Greek states. To many cities these overtures were welcome, but especially to Thebes, under the shadow of the Macedonian garrison. Three hundred talents were offered to Athens, and publicly declined but Demosthenes privately accepted them, to be expended in the interests of the great king. It is not probable that any city entered into a formal contract with Persia, 
but the basis of the negotiations was the king's peace of fifty years ago, the Greeks admitting the rights of the Persian Empire over their brethren in Asia, who on their part were awaiting with various feelings the approach of the Macedonian deliverer. As the patriots had often prayed for the death of Philip, so now they longed for the death of his youthful son, an event that might have hurled back Macedon into nothingness forever. Rumors soon spread that the wish was fulfilled. Alexander was reported to have been slain in Thrace. Demosthenes produced a man who had seen him fall, and the Theban fugitives in Athens hastened to return to their native city to incite it to shake off the Macedonian yoke. Two captains of the garrison were caught outside the Cadmia and murdered, and the Thebans then proceeded to blockade the citadel by a double rampart on the south side, where there was no city wall outside the wall of the citadel. Greece responded to the Theban leading, which Demosthenes, Lycurgus, and the other Athenian patriots had prompted and encouraged. There were movements against Macedon in Elis and Aetolia. The Arcadians marched forth to the Isthmus, and the Athenians sent arms to Thebes, though they sent no men. The hopes of the patriots ran high. The fall of the Cadmia seemed inevitable. Suddenly, a report was whispered in Thebes that a Macedonian army was encamped a few miles away at Onchestus. As Alexander was dead, it could only be Antipater. So the Theban leaders assured the alarmed people. But messengers soon came, affirming that it was certainly Alexander. Nay, then, said the leaders, since King Alexander is dead, it can only be Alexander of Lenkestus. But it was indeed the King Alexander. In less than two weeks he had marched from Pelion to Onchestus, and on the next day he stood before the walls of Thebes. He halted first on the northeastern side of the city, near the sanctuary of the Theban hero Iolaus. He would give the citizens time to make their submission, but they were in no mind to submit, and some of their light-armed troops, rushing out of the gates, attacked the outskirts of the Macedonian camp. On the morrow Alexander moved his whole army to the south side of the city, and encamped close to the Cadmia, without making any attack on the walls, still hoping that the city would surrender. But the fate of Thebes was precipitated by one of his captains, by name Perdiccas, who was in charge of the troops which guarded the camp on the side of the Cadmia. Stationed within a few yards of the Theban earthworks, Perdiccas, without waiting for orders, dashed through the outer rampart and fell upon the Theban guards. He was supported by a fellow officer, and Alexander, when he observed what had happened, sent archers and light troops to their aid. The Thebans, who manned the rampart, were driven along the gully, which, running along the east side of the Cadmia, passes the temple of Heracles outside the walls. When they reached this temple, they rallied, and turned on their assailants, and routed them back along the hollow road. But as they pursued, their own ranks were broken, and Alexander, watching for the moment, brought his phalanx into action, and drove them within the electron gate. They had no time to shut the gate before some Macedonians pushed in, along with the fugitives, and there were no men on the walls to shoot the enemy down, for the men who should have defended the walls had been sent to the blockade of the citadel. Some of the Macedonians who thus entered made their way to the Cadmia, and, joining with the garrison, they sallied out close to the Amphion, where the main part of the Theban forces were drawn up. Others, having mounted the bastions, helped their friends without to climb the walls, and the troops, thus admitted, rushed to the marketplace. But the gate was now in the possession of the Macedonians. The city was full of them, and the king himself was everywhere. The Theban cavalry was broken up, and fled through the streets and the open gates into the plain. The foot soldiers saved themselves as they could, and then a merciless butchery began. It was not the Macedonians who were zealous in the work of slaughter, but the old enemies of the Thebans, the Phocians, the Plataeans, and other Boeotian peoples, who now wrecked upon the proud city of the Seven Gates vengeance for the wrongs and insults of many generations. Six thousand lives were taken before Alexander stayed the slaughter. On the next day he summoned the confederates of Corinth to decide the fate of the rebellious city. The judges meted out to Thebes the same measure which Thebes would have once meted out to Athens. The sentence was that the city should be leveled with the dust, and her land divided among the confederates, that the remnant of the inhabitants, with the women and children, should be sold into bondage, except the priests and priestesses of the gods, and those burghers who had the bonds of guest right with the Macedonians, and that the Cadmian citadel should be occupied by a garrison. 
the severe doom, showing how deeply the masterful city was abhorred, was carried out, and among the ruined habitations, on which the Macedonian warders looked down from the fortress walls, only one solitary house stood, making the desolation seem more desolate, the house of Pindar, whom Alexander expressly spared. The Boeotian cities were at last delivered from the yoke of their impetuous mistress. Plataea and Orchomenos re-arose from their ruins. The fall of Thebes promptly checked all the other movements in Greece. The Arcadian forces withdrew from the Isthmus. Elis and Aetolia hastened to retrieve their hostile attitude. The news reached Athens during the festival of the mysteries. The solemnity was interrupted, and in a hurried meeting of the assembly it was resolved, on the proposal of Demides, to send an embassy to welcome Alexander on his safe return from his northern campaign, and to congratulate him on the just chastisement which he had inflicted upon Thebes. The same people passed this decree, who, a few days before, on the proposal of Demosthenes, had resolved to send troops to the aid of that luckless city. Alexander demanded, and it was a fair demand, that Demosthenes and Lycurgus, and the other agitators who kept the hostility to Macedonia alive, and were largely responsible for the disaster at Thebes, should be delivered to him. For so long as they were at large, there was no security that Athens would not entangle herself in further follies. When the demand was laid before the assembly, Demosthenes epigrammatically expressed his own view of the situation by advising the people not to hand over the sheepdogs to the wolf. Phocion said in downright words that Alexander must be conciliated at any cost. Let the men who surrender, he demanded, show their patriotism by sacrificing themselves. But it was finally decided that Demides, who had ingratiated himself with the Macedonian king, should accompany another embassy and beg that the offenders might be left to the justice of the Athenian people. Alexander, still anxious to show every consideration to Athens, withdrew his demand, insisting only on the banishment of the adventurer, Charidemus of Thracian notoriety. With the fall of Thebes, Alexander's campaign in Europe came to an end. The rest of his life was spent in Asia. The European campaigns, though they filled little more than a year, and though they seemed of small account by the side of his triumphs in the East, were brilliant and important enough to have won historical fame for any general. In his two descents into Greece, first to conciliate and afterwards to punish, in his expedition to the Danube, and in his Illyrian campaign, he had given tokens of the rare strategic capacity, the originality of conception, the boldness of resolution, the rapidity of action, and those other qualities which served Alexander's genius, and soon found a more specious sphere for their manifestation, when they bore him towards the unknown limits of the Eastern world. End of chapter 19, parts 1 through 3. Chapter 17, Parts 4 and 5 of A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 2 by John Bagnell Burry. Chapter 17, Parts 4 and 5. Section 4. Preparations for Alexander's Persian Expedition. Condition of Persia. Having spent the winter in making his military preparations, and setting in order the affairs of his kingdom for a long absence, Alexander set forth in spring for the conquest of Asia. Of his plans and arrangements we know almost nothing, but we may say with confidence that his scheme of conquest was well considered, and that he did not go forth as an adventurer to take whatever came in his way. His original scheme of conquest was afterwards merged in a second and larger scheme, of which he had no conception when he went forth from Macedonia, for he had not the requisite geographical knowledge of Central Asia. But in the first instance his purpose was to conquer the Persian kingdom, to dethrone the great king and take his place, and to do unto Persia what Persia under Xerxes had essayed to do unto Macedonia and the rest of Hellas. To carry out this design, the first thing needful was to secure Thrace in the rear, 
and that had already been done. In the conquest itself, there were three stages. The first step was the conquest of Asia Minor. The second was the conquest of Syria and Egypt. And these two conquests, preliminary to the advance on Babylon and Susa, would mean not merely acquisitions of territory, but strategic bases for further conquest. The weak point in Alexander's enterprise was the lack of a fleet capable of coping with the Persian navy, which was 400 strong. Here, the confederacy of Corinth should have come to his help. Athens alone could have furnished over 200 galleys, and Alexander doubtless counted on obtaining the support of Athens and other Greek cities ultimately. But he desired aid rendered with good will, and he made no effort to extort ships or men. The loosely organized League of Corinth had undertaken to supply fixed contingents, but the fulfillment of these promises were not strictly exacted. To secure Macedonia against her neighbors and subjects during his absence, Alexander was obliged to leave a large portion, perhaps as much as one half of the national army behind him. The government was entrusted to his father's minister, Antipater. It is said that the king made dispositions before his departure as one who expected never to return. He divided all his royal domains and forests and revenues among his friends, and when Perdiccas asked what was left for himself, he replied, Hope. Then Perdiccas, rejecting his own portion, exclaimed, We who go forth to fight with you need share only in your hope. The anecdote at least illustrates the enthusiasm with which Alexander infected his friends and officers on the threshold of a venture of which the conception was almost as wonderful as its success. The Persian Empire was weak and loosely knit, and it was governed now by a feeble monarch. Two generations had passed since Greece beheld its weakness memorably demonstrated by the adventures of Xenophon's 10,000, and since then we have seen it on the western side, rent and riven by revolts. Artaxerxes Ochus displayed more strength than his predecessors. He re-established his power in Asia Minor. He quelled rebellions in Phoenicia and Cyprus, and even conquered Egypt, which had long set at naught the Persian efforts to regain it. The king, Nectanobos, was driven back from Pelusium to Memphis, and from Memphis he fled to Ethiopia. The Persian king had no thought of holding the land of the Nile by kindness. As soon as he had Memphis in his power, he displayed the intolerance of the fire-worshipper. He drowned the holy bull Apis, and inaugurated the ass as the sacred animal of Egypt. This stupid outrage made the Persian rule more detested than ever. Ochus was assassinated, the victim of palace conspiracy, and after two or three years of confusion, the throne passed to a distant member of the Achaemenid house. Darius Codomanus, destined to be the last successor to his great namesake. He was a mild and virtuous prince, beloved by his followers, but too weak, both in brains and will, for the task to which fate had doomed him. It cannot be gainsaid that, if Darius had been able and experienced in war, and capable of leading men, he had some enormous advantages. In the first place, he had the advantage in the sheer weight of human bodies. Had the myriads which he could muster been divided into troops of thirty men, and a soldier of Alexander's army allotted as a cupbearer to each troop, many a company would have gone unserved. In the second place, while the coffers of Pella are said to have been emptied before Alexander set foot in Asia, the great king commanded untold wealth. The treasury of Susa was full, and in the palace of Persepolis were hoarded inexhaustible stores of gold. In the third place, he had a navy which controlled the seaboard of Asia Minor, Syria, and Egypt, and ought, if it had been handled ably, to have placed insuperable obstacles in the way of an invader who had no adequate sea power. And fourthly, although there was no cohesion in the vast empire or unity of centralization, there was, for that very reason, little or no national discontent in the provinces. Egypt was an exceptional case. The revolts which occurred from time to time were not national movements, but the disaffections of ambitious satraps. If the Persian monarch was not loved, at least he was not hated, and the warlike barbarians of the east, from far Hyrcania, or the banks of the Oxus, were always ready to follow him and glad to fight in his cause. It was quite feasible, so far as the state of feeling in the provinces was concerned, to organize an effective defense of the empire, 
but all these advantages were as naught for lack of a master mind and a controlling will. Multitudes were useless without a leader, and money could not create brains. Moreover, Persia was behind the age in the art of warfare. She had not kept pace with the military developments in Greece during the last fifty years, and though she could pay Greek mercenaries, and though these formed in fact a valuable part of her army, they could have no effect on the general character of the tactics of an oriental host. The Persian commanders had no notion of studying the tactics of their enemy and seeking new methods of encountering them. They had no idea of shaping strategic plans of their own. They simply waited on the movements of the enemy. They trusted, as they had always trusted, with perfect simplicity in numbers, individual bravery, and scythe armed chariots. The only lesson which the day of Cunaxa had taught them was to hire mercenary Greeks. The strength of the army which Alexander led forth against Persia is said to have been 30,000 foot and 5,000 horse, thus preserving the large proportion of cavalry to infantry, which was one of the chief novelties of Philip's military establishment. We have seen how Philip organized the national army of Macedonia in the chief divisions of the phalanx, the light infantry or hypastis, and the heavy cavalry. Alexander led to Asia six regiments of the phalanx, and, in the great engagements which decided the fate of Persia, these formed the center of his army. They were supported by Greek hoplites, both mercenary and confederate. The mercenaries were commanded by Menander, the confederate by Antigonus. The Hypastus, led by Nicanor, son of Parmenio, had their station on the right wing, and the first regiment of these was the royal guard, called the Aegima. Philotus, another son of Parmenio, was commander of the heavy cavalry, and eight squadrons, one of which, the royal squadron, under Clitus, corresponded to the Aegima of the light-armed foot. This Macedonian cavalry was always placed on the right, while on the left rode the splendid Thessalian cavalry under Callus, with a corps of other Greek horse attached. Both the right and left wings were strengthened by light troops, horse and foot, accruited according to their national habits from Thrace, Paeonia, and other countries of the Illyrian Peninsula. Section 5. Conquest of Asia Minor The forces which had been operating in Asia under Parmenio while Alexander was detained in Europe had been endeavoring to establish a footing in Aeolus and Mysia and secure a base on the Propontis for further advance. The great king had empowered Memnon of Rhodes, an able mercenary captain who in recent years had come to the front to oppose the van of the Macedonian invasion. The most pressing need of the Persians was to recapture Cyzicus, which was in the hands of Parmenio. In this Memnon failed, but he occupied Lampsacus. He forced the Macedonians to raise the siege of Pitani, and beat them back to the coasts of the Hellespont. But he could not, or did not, press his advantage, and the shores where Alexander's host would land were safe in the Macedonian possession. The fleet transported the army from Cestus to Abydus, while Alexander himself proceeded to Elaios, where he offered a sacrifice on the tomb of Protestelaios, the first of the mythical Greeks who landed on the shore of Asia in the Trojan War, and the first who fell. Praying that he might be luckier than Protestelaios, Alexander sailed across to the harbor of the Achaeans, and, in the mid-strait, made libations to Poseidon and the Nereids from a golden dish. The first to leap upon the Mysian strand, he crossed the plain of Troy and went up to the hill of Ilion, where he performed a sacrifice in the temple of Athena, in the poor town which stood on the ruins of six prehistoric cities. It is said that he dedicated his own panoply in the shrine and took down from the wall some ancient armor preserved there as relics of the war of Priam and Agamemnon. He sacrificed to Priam to avert his anger from one of the race of Neoptolemus. He crowned the tomb of Achilles his ancestor, and his bosom friend, Hephaestion, cast a garland upon the grave of Patroclus, the beloved of Achilles. He commanded that Ilion should raise again from its ruins as a favored city enjoying the rights of self-government and immunity from taxation. These solemnities on the hill of Troy are significant in revealing the spirit which the young king carried into his enterprise. They show how he was imbued with Greek scriptures and Greek traditions, how his descent from Achilles was part of his life, part of his inspiration, 
how he regarded himself as chosen to be the hero of another episode in the drama, whereof the first act had been illustrated by the deeds of that glorious ancestor. Meanwhile, the satraps of the great king had formed an army of about 40,000 men to defend Asia Minor. If he had entrusted the command to the Rhodian Memnon, it is possible that some effective defense might have been made, but he committed the characteristic blunder of a Persian monarch, and consigned the army to the joint command of a number of generals, including Memnon and several of the western satraps. The Persian commanders were jealous of the Greek, and, against his advice, they decided to risk a battle at once. Accordingly, they advanced from Zelia, where they had mustered, to the plain of Adrastia, through which the river Granicus flows into the Propontis, and posted themselves on the steep left bank of the stream, so as to hinder the enemy from crossing. Alexander and his army advanced eastward from Abydus, and received the submission of Lampsicus, and there of Priapus, a town near the mouth of the Granicus. It was impossible for him to avoid the combat, which the Persians desired. He could not march southwards, leaving them in his rear. But he courted the combat even more than they, for the worst thing that could have befallen him, as Memnon knew well, was that the hostile army should persistently retire before him, eating up the provisions of the country as it retreated. With his heavy infantry in two columns and his horse on the wings, Alexander marched across the Adrestian plain. The Persians had made the curious disposition of placing their cavalry along the river bank and the Greek hoplites on the slopes behind. As cavalry in attack has a great advantage over cavalry in defense, Alexander saw that the victory could best be won by throwing his own squadrons against the hostile line. Parmenio advised him to wait till the following morning, and cross the river at daybreak before the foe were drawn up in array. I should be ashamed, said the king, having crossed the Hellespont, to be detained by a miserable stream like the Granicus. An answer such as Alexander loved to give, veiling under the appearance of negligent daring a self-confidence which was perfectly justified by his strategic insight. Drawing up his army in the usual way, which has been described above, with the six regiments of the phalanx in the center, entrusting the left wing to Parmenio, and commanding the right himself, Alexander first sent across the river his light cavalry to keep the extreme left of the enemy engaged, then led his heavy Macedonian cavalry against the Persian center. Alexander himself was in the thickest of the fight, dealing wounds and receiving blows. After a sharp melee on the steep banks, the Persian cavalry was broken and put to flight. The phalanx then advanced across the river against the Greek hoplites in the background, while the victorious cavalry cut them up on the flanks. This victory, in winning which Alexander drank to the full mad excitement of battle, cost few lives to the Macedonians, and cleared out of their way the only army which was to oppose their progress in Asia Minor. But it was very far from laying Asia Minor at the conqueror's feet. There were strong places which must be taken one by one, strong places on the coast, which could be supported by the powerful Persian fleet. Of all things, the help of the Athenian navy would have best bestead Alexander now, and he did not yet despair. After the skirmish of the Granicus, when he divided the spoil, he sent three hundred Persian panoplies to Athens, as an offering to Athena on the Acropolis, with this dedication. Alexander, son of Philip, and the Greeks, except the Lacedaemonians, from the barbarians of Asia. But Athens had no zeal for the cause of the Greeks, and Alexander, against the barbarians. The victor entrusted the satrapy of Hellespontine Phrygia to Callis, making no change in the method of the Persian administration, and marched southwards to occupy the satrapy of Lydia and the rock of Sardis, girt with its threefold wall. It was a little more than two hundred years since Cyrus had overthrown the Lydian kingdom and Sardis had become the chief burg of Persian power in the west. The citadel was strong and capable of a stout defense, but it was now passed with its treasures unresistingly into the hands of the Greek conqueror. For this prompt submission the Lydians received their freedom, and the ancestral constitution, which had been suspended during the long period of Persian domination. Alexander resolved to build a temple to the Olympian zoos on the citadel, it was said that a thunder shower falling on the site of the royal palace showed him the fitting place for the sanctuary. The spot, 
where a more famous thunder shower had quenched the pyre of the last Lydian king. Parmenio's brother, Asander, was appointed satrap of Lydia, and Alexander turned to deal with the Ionian cities. Here, as was to be expected, everything depended on the strength of the political parties. The Democrats welcomed the Greek deliverer, but the oligarchs supported the Persian cause, and wherever they were in power, admitted Persian garrisons. In Ephesus, the oligarchy had got the upper hand, but on the approach of Alexander's army, the garrison left the city, and the people began to massacre the oligarchs. Alexander pacified these troubles and established a democratic constitution. He abode some time in the city, and during this sojourn the painter of Peles executed a famous picture of the king, wielding lightning in his hand, which was set up in the temple of Artemis. The next stage in the advance of Alexander was Miletus, and here for the first time he encountered resistance. The Persian garrison was commanded by a Greek who had first meditated surrender, but learning that the Persian fleet was at hand in full force, decided to brave a siege. In an earlier episode of the struggle between Europe and Asia, we witnessed memorable operations in the Latmian Gulf and the Milesian harbors, which the retreat of the sea has blotted from the map. The Isle of Lade, then associated with the triumph of Asia, was now to play a part in the triumph of Europe. The Macedonian fleet of 160 galleys sailed into the bay and occupied the harbor of Lade, before the great fleet of the enemy had arrived. When the Persian vessels came and saw they had been forestalled, they anchored off the promontory of Mycale. The city of Miletus consisted of two parts, an outer city which Alexander easily occupied as soon as he came up, and an inner city, strongly fortified with wall and fosse. Alexander threw up a rampart round the inner city, and placed troops in the island of Lade. Miletus was easily stormed by the Macedonian siege engines, and the fleet blocking the harbor hindered the Persian squadron from bringing help. Parmenio had urged the king to risk a battle on the water, though the enemy's ships were nearly three to one. But Alexander rejected the advice. He had judged the whole situation, and he had made up his mind that the Persian sea power would have to be conquered on land. If Athens had sent him naval reinforcements, it might have been otherwise. But he now despaired of active help from Greece, and he decided that it was a useless strain on his treasury to maintain 160 galleys, too few to cope with the 400 of the enemy. Accordingly, he disbanded the fleet after the fall of Miletus, and proceeded to blockade the sea by seizing all the strong places on the shores of the eastern Mediterranean. The execution of this design occupied him for the next two years, but it brought with it the conquest of Asia Minor, Syria, and Egypt. The manifest objection to the dissolution of the naval force was that, in case of a decisive defeat at the hands of the great king, should compel him to retreat, he would have no fleet to transport his army from Asia to Europe, and the fleets of the enemy, by occupying the straits at either end of the Propontis, could entirely cut him off. But Alexander trusted his own strategy. He knew that he would not be compelled to retreat. As for Asia Minor, the next and the hardest task was the reduction of Caria and the capture of Halicarnassus. The remnant of the host which fled from the Granicus and the Rhodian Memnon himself had rallied here and rested their last hopes in the strong city of Mausolus with its three mighty citadels. The great king had now entrusted to Memnon the general command of the fleet and the coasts, and Memnon had dug a deep fosse round Halicarnassus, furnished the place with food for a long siege, and placed garrisons in the smaller neighboring towns. Halicarnassus was to be the center of a supreme resistance. There had once been a chance that Alexander himself might have been, by a personal right, lord of Halicarnassus. The prince Pixodarus, one of the brothers of Mausolus, had wished to form an alliance of marriage with the house of Macedon, and Alexander had thought of offering himself as a bridegroom for his daughter. But Philip would not hear of such a match, and Pixodorus had given the maiden to a Persian noble, who had succeeded to the dynasty after his father-in-law's death. There was indeed another claimant to the dynasty, Ada, wife and sister of Idrieus. She had succeeded her husband as ruler, and had been driven out by her brother Pixodarus. She now sought the protection of Alexander, and when he captured Halicarnassus, he assigned to her the satrapy of Caria. 
it was destined that women should represent Caria in the two great collusions of Greece with Persia. In the days of Alexander, as in the days of Xerxes, the submission of Ada atoned for the bravery of Artemisia. Having made a futile attack on Mindus, Alexander filled up the moat with which Memnon had encompassed Halicarnassus, and brought his towers and engines across the walls. A breach was made on the northeast side, near to the gate of the road to Malaysia, but Alexander, who hoped to induce the town to surrender, forbore to order an attack. His hands were almost forced by two soldiers of the phalanx, who, one day, drinking together in their tent, and bragging of their prowess, flushed with wine and the zeal of rivalry, put on their armor and marched up to the wall, challenged the enemy to come out. The men on the wall, seeing them alone, rushed out in numbers, and the twain were hard-pressed till their comrades came to the rescue, and there was a sharp fight under the walls. But even now Alexander would not order an attack on the breach, and the besieged built a new crescent wall, connecting the two points between which the wall had been broken down, and maintained themselves behind it for a time. At length they made a great excursion against the camp of the besiegers at two different places. On both sides they were driven back. In confusion, and in their haste to shut the gates, they left many of their fellows to perish. At this moment an assault would doubtless have carried the Macedonians within the walls, but Alexander gave the signal to retire, till, still intent on saving the city, Memnon saw that the prospect of holding out longer was hopeless, and he determined to withdraw the garrison to the citadel of Salmacus, and the royal fortress on the island in the harbor. He fired the city at night before he withdrew, and the place was in flames when the Macedonians entered. Alexander destroyed what the fire spared, and left a body of mercenary soldiers under Ptolemy to blockade Salmacus and to support the princess of Caria. The cold season was approaching, and Alexander divided his army into two bodies, one of which he sent under Parmenio to winter in Lydia, while he advanced with the other into Lycia. He gave leave to a few young officers who had been recently wedded to return to their Macedonian homes, charging them with the duty of bringing reinforcements to the army in spring, and appointing Gordian in Phrygia as the mustering place of the whole host. Alexander met with no resistance from the cities of the Lycian League, and he left the constitution of the Confederacy intact. From the rich frontier town of Phycelus, he advanced along the coast of Pamphylia, receiving the submission of Perge and Espendus and other maritime cities, and then he turned inland from Perge and fought his way over the Pisidian hills, taking with some trouble Segalasus, the chief fastness of the Pisidian mountaineers. He descended to Salinae, the strong and lofty citadel of the Phrygian satrapy, and leaving a garrison there, he marched on to Gordian, on the Sangrius, the capital of the ancient kingdom of Phrygia. While he was winning the Lycian and Phrygian satrapies, he lost, for the moment, some points on the Aegean. Memnon, appointed commander of the Persian fleet, had taken Chios, reduced the greater part of Lesbos, and laid siege to Mytilene. He died during the siege, but Mytilene soon surrendered, and then Tenedos was compelled to recognize the peace which the king sent down. The great danger for Alexander was that these successes might encourage the Greeks to revolt, and ten Persian ships sailed as far west as Sphinos for the purpose of exciting a movement in Hellas. But eight of these vessels were captured by some Macedonian triremes, which ran over from Chalcis, and the project of a Greek rising was not carried out. At Gordian, the appointed mustering place, Alexander's army reunited, and the new troops arrived from Macedonia to replace those who had been left to garrison the subjugated countries and cities. On the citadel of Gordian stood the remains of the royal palaces of Gordius and Midas, and Alexander went up the hill to see the chariot of Gordius, and the famous knot which fastened the yoke. Cord of the bark of the cornel tree was tied in a knot which artfully concealed the ends, and there was an oracle that he who should loose it would rule over Asia. Alexander vainly attempted to untie it, and then, drawing his sword, cut the knot, and so fulfilled the oracle. From Gordian, Alexander marched by Ankara in to Cappadocia. Having received the submission of Paphlagonia, and asserted 
rather than confirmed his authority over the Cappadocian satrapy, he marched southward to Tiana and the Cilician gates. It was well that Alexander should show himself for a moment in the center of Asia Minor, but the reduction of these wild regions and the southern coast of Pontus was a task which might safely be postponed. The Cilician gates might have been easily defended by the garrison which the satrap Arsimes had posted in the pass. Alexander, with the Hypastus and other light troops, leaving the rest of his army in camp, marched up at night to surprise the station. As soon as the guards heard the footfalls of the approachers, they fled, and then Alexander, at the head of his cavalry, moved so rapidly on Tarsus that Arsimes, amazed at his sudden appearance, fled without striking a blow. Here a misadventure happened which well nigh changed the course of history. After a long ride under a burning sun, the king bathed in the cool waters of the Sidnus, which flows through Tarsus. He caught a chill which resulted in violent fever and sleepless nights, and his physicians despaired of his life. But Philip of Arcania, who was eminent for his medical skill, recommended a certain purgative. As he was preparing the draught in the king's tent, a letter was placed in Alexander's hands. It was from Parmenio, and it was warning against Philip, alleging that Darius had bribed him to poison his master. Alexander, taking the cup, gave Philip the letter to read, and, while Philip read, Alexander swallowed the medicine. His generous confidence was justified, and, under the care of Philip, he soon recovered from his sickness. End of chapter 17, parts 4 and 5Chapter 17, Part 6 of A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 2 by John Bagnell Burry. Chapter 17, Part 6. Section 6 Battle of Issus. The great king had already crossed the Euphrates at the head of a vast host. He had let the invader subjugate Asia Minor, but he now came in person to bar his further progress. Alexander did not hurry to the encounter, and his delay, as we shall see, turned to his profit in an unexpected manner. Sending forward Parmenio with part of the army to secure the passes from Cilicia into Syria, Alexander himself turned to subdue western Cilicia. He first visited Anchialus, noted for the statue of the Assyrian king Sardanapalus, and the famous inscription, Sardanapalus founded Anchialus and Tarsus on the same day. But thou, O stranger, eat, drink, and sport. All else is worthless. Having seen this comment on his own ambitious dreams, Alexander went on to Soli, the city of Solicisms, an ultimate Greek outpost where men had almost forgotten Greek institutions and Greek speech. From here he made an excursion against the Cilician hill folks, and reduced the whole district in seven days. Then he returned eastward and advanced to Issus, under Mount Amanus. Darius was on the other side of the mountains, in the plain of Sokoi, on ground which was highly favorable for deploying his host. There were two roads from Issus into Syria. One led directly over difficult mountain passes, while the other wound along the coast to Miriandros, and then crossed Mount Amanus. The second road, along which we formerly accompanied Cyrus and Xenophon, was now chosen by Alexander. Leaving his sick at Issus, he marched forward to Miriandros, but was detained there by a violent storm of rain, for it was already the beginning of winter. The great king, informed by Arsimes of the rapid approach of Alexander, expected every day to see him descending from the mountains, and when he came not, owing to the delays in Cilicia, it was thought that he held back through fear, and did not venture to desert the coast. Accordingly, Darius and his nobles decided to seek Alexander. The Persian army crossed the northern passes of Amanus, and reached Issus, where they tortured and put to death the sick who had been left behind. Alexander cannot be blamed for this disaster, for he could not foresee that his enemies would commit such an incredible military error as to abandon the open plain, in which their numerical superiority would tell for a confined place where the movements of a multitude would be cramped. To Alexander, the tidings that Darius was at Issus was too good to be true, 
and he sent a boat to reconnoitre. When he was assured that the enemy had thus played into his hands, he marched back from Meriandros through the sea gates into the little plain of Issus. The plain of Issus is cut in two by the stream of the Pinaris, which was to play the same part in the coming battle as the Granicus had played in the battle of Adrastia. Here, as in that first skirmish, it fell to Alexander to attack the Persians, who had themselves no plan of attack. Here, as there, the Persians were defended by the natural entrenchment of a steep-banked river. The Macedonian columns defiled into the plain at dawn, and when Darius learned that they were approaching, he threw across the river fifty thousand cavalry and light troops to cover the rest of the army, while it arrayed itself for battle. As his host was numbered by tens of thousands, and the plain was only three miles broad, it is clear that most of his troops were forced to remain behind as reserves. The whole front was composed of hoplites, thirty thousand Greek mercenaries, and the regiments of Orientals called Kardakes. The left wing touched the lower slopes of the mountains and curved round, following the line of the hill, so as to face the flank of the enemy's right wing. When the array was formed, the cavalry was recalled to the north of the river and posted on the right wing, near the sea, where the ground was best adapted for cavalry movements. Alexander advanced, his army drawn up on the usual plan, the phalanx in the center, the hypastus on the right. At first he placed the Thessalian, as well as the Macedonian cavalry, on the right wing, in order to strengthen his own cavalry attack. But when he saw that all the Persian cavalry was concentrated on the seaside, he was obliged to transfer the Thessalians to their usual position on his own left. In order to meet the danger which threatened the flank and rear of his right wing from the Persian forces on the slope of the mountain, he placed a column of light troops on the extreme right to form a second front. As in the engagements on the Granicus, the attack was to be made by the heavy cavalry on the left center of the enemy's line. But it was a far more serious and formidable venture. Those who have read the story of the Battle of Cunaxa might despise an Asiatic multitude, but Darius had 30,000 Greek mercenaries who knew how to stand and to fight. And if Alexander was defeated, his retreat was cut off. The Persian left did not sustain Alexander's onset at the head of his cavalry. The phalanx followed more slowly, and in crossing the stream and climbing the steep bank, the line became dislocated, especially at one spot, and the Greek hoplites pressed them hard on the river bank. If the phalanx had been driven back, Alexander's victorious right wing would have been exposed on the flank and the battle lost. But the phalangites stood their ground obstinately until the hypastus were free to come to their help by taking their adversaries in the flank. Meanwhile, Alexander's attack had been directed upon the spot where the great king himself stood in his war chariot, surrounded by a guard of Persian nobles. There was a furious melee, in which Alexander was wounded in his leg. Then Darius turned his chariot and fled, and this was the signal for a universal flight on the left. On the seaside, the Persian cavalry crossed the river and carried all before them, but in the midst of their success, the cry that the king was fleeing made them waver, and they were soon riding wildly back, pursued by the Thessalians. The whole Persian host was now rushing northward to the passes of Amanus, and thousands fell beneath the swords of their pursuers. Darius did not tarry. He forgot even his mother and his wife, who were in the camp at Issus. And when he reached the mountain, he left his chariot, his shield, and his royal cloak behind him, and mounting a swift mare, rode for dear life. Having pursued the great king till nightfall, and found his relics by the wayside, Alexander returned to the Persian camp. He supped in the tent of Darius, and there fell upon his ears a noise and the wailing of women from a tent hard by. He asked who the women were, and why they were lodged so near, and learned that it was the wife and mother and the children of the fugitive king. They had been told that Alexander had returned with the shield and cloak of Darius, and supposing that their lord was dead had broken into lamentation. Alexander sent one of his companions to comfort them with the assurance that Darius lived, and that they would receive, while they were in Alexander's power, all the respect and consideration due to royal ladies. For Alexander had no personal enmity against Darius. No act of Alexander, perhaps, astonished his contemporaries more than this generous treatment of the family of his royal rival. His ideal hero, Achilles, would not have resisted the charm of the captive queen, Statira, the most beautiful of women. But the charms of love had no temptation for Alexander, and his behavior to the captives was prompted not only by his natively humane and generous feelings, but by the instinct and policy of a royal invader to display respect 
for royalty as such. Thus was the Persian host, which had come to trample down Alexander and his little army, annihilated on the plain of Issus. A city, which still retains the name of Alexander, was built in commemoration of the battle, at the northern end of the sea gates. The road was now open into Syria. This was the immediate military result of the battle of Issus. Just as the small fight on the Granicus had cleared the way for the acquisition of Asia Minor, so the fight on the Pinaris cleared the way for the conquest of Syria and Egypt. The rest of the work would consist in tedious sieges, but the victory of Issus had, beyond its immediate result, immense importance through the prestige which it conferred on the victor. He had defeated an army ten times as great as his own, led by the great king in person, whom he had driven back over the mountains in ignominious flight. He had captured the mother of the great king, and his wife, and his children. Darius himself unbent his haughty Persian pride, when he had reached safety beyond the Euphrates, so far as to make the first overtures to the conqueror. He wrote a letter, in which he complained that Alexander was an unprovoked aggressor, begged that he would send back the royal captives, and professed willingness to conclude a treaty of friendship and alliance. It was much for a Persian king to bring himself to write this, but such a condescending appeal required a stern reply. We are fortunate enough to possess the text of Alexander's answer, which seems to have been published as a sort of manifesto to Europe as well as Asia. It was to this effect. Your ancestors invaded Macedonia and the rest of Greece, and without provocation inflicted wrongs upon us. I was appointed leader of the Greeks, and crossed over into Asia for the purpose of avenging those wrongs, for ye were the first aggressors. In the next place ye assisted the people of Perinthus, who were offenders against my father, and Ochus sent a force into Thrace, which was part of our empire. Further, the conspirators who slew my father were suborned by you, as ye yourselves boasted in your letters. Thou, with the help of Bagoas, didst murder Arases, son of Ochus, and seize the throne unjustly and contrary to the law of the Persians, and then thou didst write improper letters regarding me to the Greeks, to incite them to war against me, and didst send to the Lacedaemonians and others of the Greeks for the same purpose, sums of money, whereof none of the other cities partook, but only the Lacedaemonians. And thine emissaries corrupted my friends, and tried to dissolve the peace which I had brought about in Greece. Wherefore I marched against thee, who wert thus the aggressor in the quarrel. I have overcome in battle, first thy generals and satraps, and now thyself and thine host, and possess thy land through the grace of the gods. Those who fought on thy side, and were not slain, but took refuge with me, are under my protection, and are glad to be with me, and will fight with me henceforward. I am lord of all Asia, and therefore do thou come to me. If thou art afraid of being evilly entreated, send some of thy friends to receive sufficient guarantees. Thou hast only to come to me, to ask and receive thy mother, and wife, and children, and whatever else thou mayest desire. And for the future, whenever thou sendest, send to me as the great king of Asia, and do not write to me as an equal, but tell me whatever they might need, as to one who is lord of all that is thine. Otherwise I will deal with thee as an offender. But if thou disputest the kingdom, then wait and fight for it again, and do not flee, for I will march against thee wherever thou mayest be. The treasures which Darius had brought with him into Syria had been sent for safety to Damascus when he crossed the passes of Amanus. Accordingly, Alexander sent Parmenio to take possession of them. Parmenio found at Damascus some Greek envoys who had arrived at the camp of Darius a short time before the battle, one Spartan, one Athenian, and two Thebans. Alexander detained the Spartan as a prisoner, kept the Athenian as a friend, and let the Thebans go free. His clemency to the Thebans was due to a certain compunction, which he always felt for the hard measures dealt out to their city, while a personal motive dictated his favor to the Athenian, Iphicrates, son of the great general of the same name, whose memory was highly esteemed in Macedonia. The incident showed that Greece, which had openly chosen Alexander for her leader, was secretly intriguing with Persia. When it was known that Darius was crossing the Euphrates, men were hoping and praying at Athens that the Macedonians would be trodden under by the Persian host. A hundred fast-sailing Persian ships appeared at Siphnos 
and Agis, the Spartan king, visited the commanders, asking for money and galleys to carry out a project of rebellion against Macedonia. At Athens, Hipparides agitated for open war, but Demosthenes prudently counseled his fellow citizens to wait until the expected catastrophe of Alexander had become an accomplished fact. Then the news came that the leader of the Greeks had won a brilliant victory, and Greece had to cloak her disappointment. The Persian squadron hurried back to save what could be saved on the Asiatic coast, and only thirty talents and ten vessels could be spared to Agis, who used them to secure the island of Crete. End of chapter 17, part 6Chapter 17, Part 7 of A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 2 by John Bagnell Burry. Chapter 17, Part 7 The Conquest of Syria. It might seem that the course plainly marked out for the victor of Issus was to pursue and overwhelm Darius before he should have time to collect another army, and this is what Darius himself would have done if he had been Alexander. But it would have been a strategical error to plunge into the heart of the Persian Empire, leaving Syria and Egypt unsubdued behind him and a Persian fleet controlling the coast. The victory of Issus did not seduce Alexander into swerving from his inevitable course. The strategic value of that victory was simply that it opened the gates to Syria and Egypt, as the subjugation of Asia Minor was the strategic condition of subjugating Syria and Egypt, so the conquest of Syria and Egypt was the strategic condition of conquering Mesopotamia and Iran. It was the more imperative to follow this logical course of conquest since Phoenicia supplied the main part of the hostile navy, and nothing but the reduction of the Phoenician towns would effectually break down the sea power of Persia. No one could swoop more swiftly than Alexander when it was the hour to swoop, but never did he display his superior command of the art of war more signally than when he let the royal prey escape him and quietly carried out the plan of conquest which he had predestined. The Persian kings had allowed the Phoenician traders to go on their own way, and meddled little with their prosperous cities, so long as the Phoenician navy was at their disposal of Persia. If these strong and wealthy semi-insular cities of the coast, cut off as they were from the inner country by the high range of Lebanon, had formed a solid federal union, they might have easily succeeded in winning complete independence in the days of Persian decadence. But though Tyre, Sidon and Aradus were bound together by a federal bond, their commercial interests clash, and their jealousies prevented a hearty national effort. This had been illustrated by a recent experience. When Sidon had revolted from Persia in the reign of Artaxerxes Ochus, her two sister cities promised at a federal meeting to stand by her. But both Tyre and Aradus selfishly calculated that if Sidon were crushed and punished, her trade would come to themselves and they left her to maintain the struggle alone. She succumbed to the power of Ochus, her town was burnt down, and she lost her rights as a city. The divisions which prevented the Phoenicians from becoming a nation were profitable to Alexander. If their united fleet, which was now acting ineffectually in Aegean waters, had acted energetically in defense of their own coast against the Macedonian, their cities would have been impregnable even to Alexander. But those cities could not trust each other. Bibulus, which in some measure had taken the place of Sidon, and Aridus sent their submission to the conqueror of Issus, while dismantled Sidon, which still contributed some ships to the fleet, hoped to be reinstated in her old position by the favor of Persia's foe. Her hope was not disappointed. Alexander restored Sidon to her constitution and her territory. It cannot have been long after this that a kingling of Sidon, was laid in a resting place worthy of the great conqueror himself. His sculptured sarcophagus, recently dug up in a burying ground in the Sidonian kings, is one of the most beautiful achievements of Greek art. But we may well associate this monument with Alexander, rather than the obscure Phoenician for whose ashes it was made. 
for in two of the vivid scenes which are represented in colored relief upon its sides, Alexander appears on horseback. One of these is a passage from the Battle of Issus. There is a melee in the center. The king charges on this side, a general, perhaps Parmenio, on that. The other scene is a lion hunt, and here, if Alexander were not marked out by the royal fillet, we might almost recognize him by his eager, straining face. Alexander advanced southwards towards Tyre. Ambassadors from this city met him on the road, professing the readiness of the Tyrians to do his will. Alexander expressed his intention of visiting the city in order to sacrifice in the famous temple of Heracles, but a Macedonian visit was far from the wish of the men of Tyre. Persia was not yet subdued, and their policy was to await the event and avoid compromising themselves by a premature adhesion to Macedonia. They felt secure on their island rock, which was protected by eighty ships, apart from the squadron which was absent in the Aegean. Accordingly, they invited Alexander to sacrifice in Old Tyre, on the mainland, but refused to receive either Persian or Macedonian into the city. To subdue Tyre was the, an absolute necessity, as Alexander explained to a council of his generals and captains, which he called together. It was not safe to advance to Egypt, or to pursue Darius, while the Persians were lords of the sea, and the only way of wresting their sea power from them was to capture Tyre, the most important naval station on the coast. Once Tyre fell, the Phoenician fleet, which was the most numerous and strongest part of the Persian navy, would come over to Macedon, for the rowers would not row, or the men fight, when they had no habitations to row or fight for. The reduction of Cyprus and Egypt would then follow without trouble. Alexander grasped and never let go the fact that Tyre was the key to the whole situation. It was easy to say that Tyre must be captured, but it was not easy to say how, without a powerful navy, its capture could be achieved. This was perhaps the hardest military task that Alexander's genius ever encountered. The city, girt by walls of great height and magnificently strong masonry, stood on an island severed from the continent by a sound of more than half a mile in width. On the face which faced the mainland were the two harbors, the northern or Sidonian harbor with a narrow mouth, and the southern or Egyptian. It might seem utterly hopeless for an enemy, vastly inferior at sea, to attempt a siege of the island rock. And in truth there was only one way for a land power to set about the task. Those thousand yards of water must be bridged over, and the isle annexed to the mainland. Without hesitation, Alexander began the building of the causeway. The first part of the work was easy, for the water was shallow, but when the mole approached the island, the strait deepened, and the workmen came within range of the walls, and the difficulties of the task began. Triremes issued from the havens on either side to shoot missiles at the men who were at work. To protect them, Alexander erected two towers on the causeway, and mounted engines on the towers to reply to the missiles from the galleys. He attached to those wooden towers curtains of leather, to screen both towers and workmen from the projectiles which were hurled from the city walls. But the men of Tyre were ingenious. They constructed a fire-ship filled with dry wood and inflammables, and choosing a day on which a favorable wind blow, they towed it close to the dam and set it on fire. The device succeeded. The burning vessel soon wrapped the towers and all the engines in flames, and the triremes which had towed it up discharged showers of darts at the Macedonians who attempted to extinguish the fire. The Tyrians, too, rowed across from their island in boats, and tore up the stakes at the unfinished part of the mole. Undismayed by this disaster, which seemed to show the hopelessness of the enterprise, Alexander only went to work more vigorously. It was necessary to take Tyre, and he was determined that Tyre should be taken. He widened the causeway throughout its whole length, so that it could accommodate more towers and engines before he attempted to complete it. He saw that it would be needful to support his operations from the causeway by operations from shipboard, and he went to Sidon to bring up a few galleys which were stationed there. But at this moment the aspect of affairs was suddenly changed by the accession to Alexander of naval forces which enabled him to cope with Tyre at an advantage on her own element. The squadrons of Aridus and Bibulus, which were acting in the Aegean, learning that their cities had submitted to Alexander, left the fleet and sailed to Sidon, which the Macedonians had chosen as their naval station. These Phoenician ships were about eighty. 
and at the same time there came nine galleys from Rhodes, and ten from Lycia and Cilicia. The adhesion of the kings of Cyprus presently followed, and reinforced the fleet at Sidon by a hundred and twenty ships. With a fleet of about two hundred and fifty triremes at his command, Alexander was now far stronger at sea than the merchants of Tyre, and though the siege of the mighty stronghold was still a formidable task, it was no longer superhuman. While the fleet was being made ready in the roads of Sidon, and the engineers were fabricating new siege engines to batter down the walls of Tyre, Alexander made an expedition at the head of his light troops to punish the native brigands who infested the hills of Anti-Lebanon, and made the traffic between the coast and the hinterland unsafe. Perhaps it was now that he received an embassy from the great king, offering an immense ransom for the captives of the royal house, and the surrender of all the lands west of the Euphrates, proposing that Alexander should marry the daughter of Darius and become his ally. The message was discussed in a council, and Parmenio said that if he were Alexander, he would accept the terms. And I, said the king, would accept them if I were Parmenio. Alexander was resolved to carry out his plan of conquest to the end. He would agree to no compromise. He bade the ambassadors say that he would receive neither money nor provinces in lieu of the whole empire of Darius, for that all the land and possessions of Darius were his. He would marry the daughter of Darius if he chose, whether Darius willed it or not, and if Darius wished for any boon, he must come himself and ask for it. From Sidon, Alexander bore down upon Tyre with his own fleet, hoping to entice the Tyrians into an engagement. He commanded the right wing, while the left was committed to the charge of Craterus and Pintagoras, the king of Cypriot Salamis. When this fleet hove in sight, the men of Tyre were astonished and dismayed. Before, they would have gladly given battle, but they saw that they had no chance against so many, and they drew up their triremes in close array to block the mouths of their harbors. Alexander set the Cyprian vessels on the north side of the mole to blockade the Sidonian harbor, and the Phoenician on the south side to blockade the Egyptian harbor. It was opposite this harbor on the mainland that his own pavilion was placed. The mole had now been carried up to the island, and engineers, the best that Phoenicia and Cyprus could furnish, had prepared the engines of war. All was ready for a grand attack on the eastern wall. Some of the engines were placed on the mole, others on transport ships or superannuated galleys. But little impression was made on the wall, which on this side was 150 feet high and enormously thick, and the besieged replied to the attack with volleys of fiery missiles from powerful engines which were mounted on their lofty battlements. Moreover, the machine-bearing vessels could not come close enough to the walls for effective action. Huge stones lying under the water hindered their approach. Alexander decided that these must at all costs be removed, and galleys with windlasses were anchored at the spot in order to drag the boulders away. It was a slow task, and was thwarted by the Tyrians. Covered vessels shot out of the havens and cut the anchor ropes of the galleys, so that they drifted away. Alexander tried to meet this by placing boats similarly decked close to the anchors, but even this failed, since Tyrian divers swam under water and cut the cables. The only resource was to attach the anchors with chains instead of ropes, and by this means the stones were hauled away and the ships could approach the wall. The Tyrians now resorted to a last device. They spread the sails of all the ships which were riding at the entrance of the northern harbor, and behind this curtain of canvas which screened them from the observation of the enemy, they manned seven triremes, three five-oared and three four-oared boats, with the coolest and bravest of their seamen and waiting for the hour of noon, when the sailors of the besieging vessels used generally to disembark, and Alexander himself used to retire to his tent, they rowed noiselessly toward the Scipion squadron, which was taken completely by surprise, sank some of the vessels at once, and drove the rest on the strand. It happened that on this day Alexander remained for a shorter time than usual in his pavilion, and when he returned to his station with the Phoenician ships on the south side of the mole, discovering what had happened, he stationed the main part of those ships close to the Egyptian harbor to prevent the enemy from making any movement on his side, and taking with him some five oared boats and five swift sailing galleys, sailed around the island. The men in the city saw Alexander and all that he did, and signaled to their own vessels who were engaged in battering the stranded Cyprian vessels. 
but the signals were not seen or heard until Alexander was close upon them. When they saw him coming, they desisted from their work and made all speed for the haven, but the greater number of their boats were disabled by Alexander's vessels before they reached the harbor mouth. Henceforward, the ships of Tyre lay useless in the harbors, unable to do anything for the defense of the island. It was now a struggle between the engineers of Tyre and the engineers of Alexander. The wall opposite up to the mole defied all machines of battery and methods of assault, and the northern part of the same eastern wall, though the big stones had been cleared away from the water below it, proved equally impracticable. Accordingly, the efforts of the besiegers were united upon the south wall near the Egyptian harbor. Here at length a bit of the wall was torn down, and there was fighting in the breach, but the Tyrians easily repelled the attack. It was an encouragement for Alexander, it showed him the weak spot, and two days later he prepared a grand and supreme assault. The vessels with the siege engines were set to work at the southern wall, while two triremes waited hard by, one filled with hypastus under Admetus, the other with a phalanx regiment ready as soon as the wall yielded to hurl their crews into the breach. Ships were stationed in front of the two havens to force their way in at a favorable moment, and the rest of the fleet, manned with light troops and furnished with engines, were disposed at various points round the island to embarrass and bewilder the besieged and hinder them from concentrating at the main point of attack. A wide breach was made, two triremes were rowed up to the spot, the bridges were lowered, and the hypastus Admetus at their head, first mounted the wall. Admetus was pierced with a lance, but Alexander took his place and drove back the Tyrians from the breach. Tower after tower was captured. Soon all the southern wall was in the hands of the Macedonians, and Alexander was able to make his way along the battlements to the royal palace, which was the best base for attacking the city. But the city had already been entered from other points. The chains of both the Sidonian and the Egyptian harbors had been burst by the Cyprian and Phoenician squadrons. The Tyrian ships had been disabled, and the troops had pressed into the town. The inhabitants made their last stand in a place called the Agonorian. Eight thousand are said to have been slain, and the rest of the people, about thirty thousand, were sold into slavery, with the exception of the king, as in Milko, and a few other men of high position, who were set at liberty. The siege had been long and wearisome but the time and the labor were not too dear a price. The fall of Tyre gave Alexander Syria and Egypt, and the naval superiority in the eastern half of the Mediterranean. He performed the sacrifice of Heracles in the temple to which the Tyrians had refused him access, and celebrated the solemnity with the torch procession and games. The communities of Syria and Palestine that had not submitted, like Damascus after the victory of Issus, submitted now after the capture of Tyre, and he encountered no resistance in his southern march to Egypt, until he came to the great frontier stronghold, Gaza, the city of the Philistines. Girt with a stout wall, Gaza stood on a high rising ground, and more than two miles of sand lie between the city and the seashore, so that a fleet was no hope to a besieger. The place had been committed by Darius to the care of Batis, a trusty eunuch, who had been well furnished with provisions for a long siege. Batis refused to surrender, trusting in the strength of the fortifications, and at the first sight the engineers of Alexander declared that the wall could never be stormed on account of the height of the hill on which it stood. But Alexander was now accustomed to overcome the insuperable, and the conqueror who had sacked Tyre was not ready to turn away from the walls of Gaza. He could not leave such an important post on the line from Damascus to Egypt in the hands of the enemy. He ordered ramparts to be thrown up around the city, in order that the siege engines mounted on this elevation might be on a level with the wall. The best chance seemed to be on the south side, and here the work was pushing on rapidly. When the engines were placed in position, Alexander offered a sacrifice, and a bird of prey flying over the altar dropped a stone on the king's garland head. The soothsayer interpreted the meaning of this sign. O king, you will take the city, but you must take good heed for your own safety on this day. Alexander was cautious for a while, but when the besieged sallied forth from the gates and attacked the Macedonians who were working the engines on the ramparts and pressed them hard, he rushed to their aid and was wounded in the shoulder by a dart from a catapult. Thus part of the sign had come true. The other part was in time fulfilled. The engines which had been used in the siege of Tyre arrived by sea. 
the rampart was widened and raised to a greater height, and undermound mines were dug beneath the walls. The walls yielded in many places to the mines and the engines, but it was not till the fourth attack that the Macedonians succeeded in scaling the breaches and entering the city. The slaughter was greater than entire. The women and children were sold into bondage, and the place became a Macedonian fortress. End of chapter 17, part 7Chapter 17, Parts 8 and 9 of A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 2 by John Bagnell Burry. Chapter 17, Parts 8 and 9. Section 8. Conquest of Egypt. Egypt was now absolutely cut off from Persia. The gate to that sequestered land was open, and Alexander had only to march in. The Egyptians had not the vigor to offer any national resistance to the Greek invader, and Mazakes, the Persian satrap, seeing Phoenicia and Syria in Alexander's power, the Macedonian navy in the roadstead of Pelusium, and no help at hand, thought only of making his submission and winning the conqueror's grace. Sending his fleet up the Pelusic branch of the Nile to meet him at Memphis, Alexander journeyed thither by way of Heliopolis. In the capital of the pharaohs, where he was probably proclaimed king, he sacrificed to Apis and the other native gods, and thereby won the good will of the people, who contrasted his piety with the bigotry of the Persian monarch Ochus, who had killed the sacred bull. But while the new king showed that he would treat the native religion and customs with respect, he also made it clear that Greek civilization was now to pour into the exclusive regions of the Nile. He held athletic games and a poetical contest at Memphis, and the most famous artists from Greece came to take part in it. From Memphis he sailed down the river to Canopus, and took a step which, if he had never performed any other exploit in his life, would have made his name memorable forever. He chose the ground east of Ryokus, between Lake Mariotis and the sea, as the site of a new city, over against the island of Pharos, famous in Homeric song, and soon to become more famous still as the place of the first lighthouse, one of the seven wonders of the world. The king is said to have himself traced out the ground plan of Alexandria, the marketplace and the circuit of the walls, the sanctuary of Isis, and the temples of the Hellenic gods. He joined the mainland with the island by a causeway of seven stades, nearly a mile in length, and thus formed two harbors. The subsequent history of Alexandria, which has held its position as a port for more than two thousand years, proves that its founder had a true eye in choosing the place of the most famous of his new cities. The greatness of the place as a mart of the world far surpassed any purposes or hopes that Alexander could have formed. But his object in founding it could hardly be doubted. Alexandria was not intended to supersede Memphis as the capital of Egypt. It was intended to take the place of Tyre as the commercial center of Western Asia and the Eastern Mediterranean. And there was a good reason for diverting the lines of traffic from the Phoenician to the Egyptian coast. For it was naturally the policy of Alexander to transfer the trade of the world so far as might be into the hands of Greeks, but any new emporium rising on the ruins of Tyre or Sidon would have soon become predominantly Phoenician, owing to the Phoenician genius for trade, whereas on the Egyptian coast Greek traders would encounter no such rivalry. It was thus with a view to the commercial interests of his own race that Alexander founded the port of Egypt. In the official style of the Egyptian monarchy, the pharaohs were the sons of Amman, and as the successor of the pharaohs, Alexander assumed the same title. It was therefore necessary, in order to regulate his position, that an official assurance should be given by Amman himself that Alexander was his son. To obtain such a declaration, and satisfy fully the formalities required by the priests, Alexander undertook a journey to the oracular sanctuary of Amman, in the oasis of Siwa. 
and this motive is alone sufficient to explain the expedition. But it may well be that in Alexander's mind there was a vague notion that there was something divine about his own origin, something mystical in his mother's conception, and that, like Achilles, he was somewhat more than an ordinary man. Proceeding along the coast to Paritonian, he was there met by envoys who conveyed the submission of Cyrene. By this acquisition, the western frontier of the Macedonian Empire extended to the border of the Carthaginian sphere of influence. Alexander then struck across the desert to visit that Egyptian temple, which was most famous in the Greek world, the temple, as it was always called, of Zeus Amman. There were no tracks to guide the travelers, for the south wind had plowed up the sand and obliterated the road marks, and stories were told in the camp of miraculous guidance vouchsafed to the favorite of the god. Ptolemy, son of Lagus, who was destined hereafter to rule over Egypt and Libya, recorded in his memoirs that two snakes moved in front of the troops and showed the way, while Aristobulus, another companion of the king, spoke of the guidance of two crows. A certain mystery enveloped this expedition. It is said that Alexander told no man what he asked the god, or what the god replied, save only that the answer pleased him. But it is certain that the priests had made some dispositions that Amon spoke and recognized him as his son. The very route by which Alexander returned to Memphis is uncertain, for the same two companions differ, Ptolemy stating that he fared direct across the desert, and Aristobulus that he returned by Paritonian. At Memphis he organized the government of Egypt, entrusting it to two native nomarchs, and appointing separate Greek governors for the adjoining districts of Arabia and for Libya. But the control of the finances was placed in the hands of a special minister, Cleomenes of Naucratis. Several military commanders were also appointed, and it would seem that Alexander instituted this divided command as a safeguard against the danger of a rebellion. For, geographically situated as Egypt was, an ambitious commander might have a fair prospect of holding the country against his lord, and its recent history as a Persian province had illustrated the difficulty of dealing with it. If this be so, Alexander inaugurated a policy which was followed in later days and, in another form, by his Roman successors. Section 9. Battle of Gaugamela and the Conquest of Babylonia the new lord of Egypt and Syria returned with the spring to Tyre. The whole coastland was now in his possession, and he controlled the sea. The time had come to advance into the heart of the Persian Empire. Having spent some months in the Phoenician city, busied with various matters of policy and administration, as well as with the plans for his next campaign, he set forth at the head of 40,000 infantry and 7,000 horse, and reached Thapsacus on the Euphrates at the beginning of August. The building of two bridges had already begun, but the Persian Mazaius, who was stationed with troops on the further shore, had hindered their completion. When Alexander arrived, he withdrew. The bridges were finished, and the army passed over. The objective of Alexander was Babylon. At that time of year, it would have been mad to follow the direct route down the Euphrates, which was traversed by Cyrus and the Ten Thousand. Alexander chose the other road, across the north of Mesopotamia, and down the Tigris on its eastern bank. Throughout the Asiatic campaigns of Alexander, we are struck by the perfect organization of his transports and supplies. But we are struck even more by the certainty of his movements, through strange lands, as if he had a map of the country before him. His intelligence department must have been excellent, and though our records give us no intimations on the subject, it has been supposed with much plausibility that here the invader received help from the Jews, who, ever since the captivity, were scattered across Media and Babylonia. It is certain that Alexander had shown special favor to the race of Israel at the foundation of Egyptian Alexandria. He had invited a Jewish colony to settle there, enjoying the rights of citizens, and yet living in a separate quarter and keeping their own national customs. From some Persian scouts who were captured, it was ascertained that Darius, with a yet larger multitude than that which had succumbed at Issus, was on the other side of the river, determined to contest the passage. Alexander crossed the Tigris, not at Nineveh, the usual place of crossing, but higher up, at Bezabde. On the same night, the moon went into eclipse, 
and men anxiously sought in the phenomena a portent of the issue of the coming struggle for the lordship of Asia. Marching southward for some days, Alexander learned that Darius was encamped in a plain near Gagamela, on the river Bumotus. The numbers of the army were reported at one million foot and forty thousand horse. Having given his men four days' rest, Alexander moved on by night and halted on a hill looking down on the plain where the enemy lay prepared for battle. A council of war was held, and the question was discussed whether the attack should be made immediately. But Parmenio counseled a day's delay, for the purpose of reconnoitering fully the enemy's position, and discovering whether, perchance, covered pits had been dug or stakes laid in the ground. Parmenio's counsel was followed, and the troops pitched their camp in the order in which they were to fight. Alexander rode over the plain, and found that the Persians had cleared it of all bushes and obstacles which might impede the movements of their cavalry, or the effect of their scythed chariots. The following night was spent by the Persians under arms, for their camp was unfortified, and they feared a night attack. And a night attack was recommended by Parmenio. But Alexander preferred to trust the issue to his own generalship and the superior discipline of his troops, and not to brave the hazards of a struggle in the dark. He said to Parmenio, I do not steal victory. And under the gallantry of this reply, he concealed, in his usual manner, the prudence and policy of his resolve. A victory over the Persian host, won in the open field in the light of day, would have a far greater effect in establishing his prestige in Asia than an advantage stolen by night. The great king, according to his wont, was in the center of the Persian array, surrounded by his kinfolk and his Persian bodyguard. On either side of them were Greek mercenaries, Indian auxiliaries with a few elephants, and Carians whose ancestors had been settled in Upper Asia. The center was strengthened and deepened by a second line, composed of the Babylonian troops and the men from the shores of the Persian Gulf, and the Uxians, who dwelt east of Susa, and the Sitakenes. On the left wing, the Caudusians from the shore of the Caspian and the men of Susa were nearest the center. Next came a mixed host of Persian horse and foot, and at the extreme left were the troops from the far east, from Aracosia and Bactria. This wing was covered by 1,000 Bactrian cavalry, 100 Scythe-armed chariots, and the Scythian cavalry from the desert districts of Lake Aral. On the right were the contingents of the Caucasian folks, the Harkanians and Tapurians from the southeastern shores of the Caspian, the Parthians, who were destined in the future to found a new oriental monarchy, the Sakai from the slopes of the Hindu Kush, and the Medes and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and northern Syria. Against this host, of which the cavalry alone is said to have been as numerous as all the infantry of the enemy, Alexander descended the hill in the morning. On his left wing, commanded as usual by Parmenio, were the cavalry of the Thessalian and Confederate Greeks. In the center, the six regiments of the phalanx, and on the right, the Hypastus, and the eight squadrons of the companions, the royal squadron of Clytus being at the extreme right. Covering the right wing were some light troops, spear-throwers, and archers. The line was far outflanked on both sides by the enemy, and the danger which Alexander had most to fear, as at the Battle of Issus, was of being attacked in rear or flank. Here both wings were in peril. He sought to meet these contingencies by forming behind each wing a second line, which by facing round a quarter or half-circle could meet an attack on flank or rear. Behind the left wing were placed Thracian horse and foot, some Greek confederate cavalry and Greek mercenary cavalry. Behind the right, the old Greek mercenaries under Cleander, the Macedonian archers and some of the Agrianian spear-throwers, the mounted pikemen, and the light Paeonian cavalry, and at the extreme right, to bear the brunt of a flank assault, the new Greek mercenaries under Menidas. As he advanced, Alexander and his right wing were opposite to the center of the enemy's line, and he was outflanked by the whole length of the enemy's left. He therefore bore obliquely to the right, and even when the Scythian horsemen riding forward came into contact with his own light troops, he continued to move his squadrons of heavy cavalry in the same direction. Darius saw with anxiety that this movement would soon bring the Macedonian right 
outside the ground which he had carefully leveled and prepared for the actions of his Sith chariots. And, as he had no small part of his hopes in the deadly effect of these chariots, he commanded the Scythian and Bactrian cavalry to ride round and deliver a flank charge in order to hinder any further advance towards the right. The charge was met by the new mercenaries of Menidus, but they were too few. They were driven back until the Paeonians and the old mercenaries were bidden to come to their support. Then the barbarians gave way, but only in a short while, reinforced by more troops, they returned to the charge. The battle raged, and it was well if the Macedonians, far outnumbered, could hold their ground. Meanwhile, Darius had loosed his scythed cars to whirl destruction into the ranks of the companions in the Hypastus. But the archers and the Agrian spear-throwers received them with showers of spears and arrows. Some of these active hillmen seized the reins of the horses and pulled the drivers from their seats, while the Hypastus, swift and undismayed, opened their ranks, and the terrible chariots rattled harmless down the intervals. The whole Persian line was now advancing to attack, and Alexander was waiting for the moment to deliver his cavalry charge. He had to send his mounted pikemen to the help of the light cavalry, who were being hard-pressed on the right by the Scythians and Bactrians. And, as a countercheck to this reinforcement, squadrons of Persian cavalry were dispatched to the assistance of their fellows. By the withdrawal of these squadrons a gap was caused, in the left wing, and into this gap Alexander plunged at the head of his cavalry column, and split the line in two. Thus the left side of the enemy's center was exposed, and, turning obliquely, Alexander charged into its ranks. Meanwhile, the bristling phalanx was moving forward, and was soon engaged in close combat with another part of the Persian center. The storm of battle burst, with wildest fury, round the spot where the Persian king was trembling, and what befell at Issus befell again at Galgamela. The great king turned his chariot and fled. His Persians fled with him, and swept along in their flight the troops who had been posted in the rear. Thus the Persian center and the neighboring part of the left wing were cut down or routed by the phalanx, the hypastus, and the companions. And in the meantime, the severe struggle of the light cavalry on the uttermost left had also ended in victory for the Macedonians. The regiments of the phalanx, in their rapid advance, had failed to keep abreast, and it would seem that when the regiment of Craterus on the extreme left was already far forward in the thick of the fight, the regiment, commanded by Simeus, second from the left, was considerably in the rear. From his position, Simeus saw that the Thessalian cavalry on the left wing were pressed hard by their adversaries, and he halted his regiment, in order, apparently, to make a movement to assist them. But the Indian and Persian cavalry of the hostile center rushed through the gap in the phalanx, and rode straight onward to the Macedonian camp, unhindered by the rear line of the left wing who did not expect an enemy on that side. The captives in the camp burst out and helped their friends to murder the Thracians, who had been sent to guard it. The Greek mercenaries and Thracians of the rear line soon perceived what had happened. They turned round and attacked the plunderers in the rear and overcame them. Meanwhile, Parmenial was hard bestead. The Mesopotamians and the Syrians on the extreme Persian right had attacked his cavalry in the flank or rear. Parmenio sped a messenger to Alexander, entreating aid, and Alexander desisted from the pursuit of his fleeing rival to restore the battle on his left wing. Riding back with his companions, he encountered a large body of cavalry, Persians, Parthians, and Indians in full retreat, but in orderly array. A desperate conflict ensued, perhaps the most fearful in the whole battle, the Persians fighting not for victory, but for life. Sixty of the companions fell, but Alexander was again victorious, and rode on to the help of Parmenio. But Parmenio no longer needed his help. Not the least achievement of this day of great deeds was the brilliant fighting of the Thessalian cavalry, who not only sustained the battle against the odds which had wrung from Parmenio the cry for aid, but in the end routed their foemen before Alexander could reach the spot. The battle was won, and the fate of the Persian Empire was decided. Alexander did not tarry on the field. He lost not a moment in resuming the chase which he had abandoned, and, riding eastward throughout the night on the tracks of the Persian king, he reached Arbella on the morrow. It befell now, as it had befallen after Issus. He did not take the king, but found at Arbella his chariot, his shield, and his bow. 
Darius fled into the highlands of Media, and Ariobarzanes, with a host of the routed army, hastened southward to Persia. Alexander did not follow either king or satrap, but pursued his way to Babylon. It might have been expected, and Alexander seems to have expected, that the men of Babylon, entrusting in their mighty walls, would have offered to the victor of Galgamela the same defiance which the men of Tyre offered to the victor of Issus. He was disappointed. When he approached the city with his army arrayed for action, the gates opened, and the Babylonians streamed out, led by their priests and their chief men. The satrap, Mesaius, who had fought bravely in the recent battle, surrendered the city and citadel. In Babylonia, Alexander followed the same policy which he had already followed in Egypt. He appeared as the protector of the national religions which had been depressed and slighted by the fire worshippers. He rebuilt the Babylonian temples which had been destroyed, and above all he commanded the restoration of the marvelous temple of Bel, standing on its eight towers, on which the rage of Xerxes had vented itself when he had returned from the rout of Salamis. The Persian Mesaius, who was retained in his post as satrap of Babylonia. End of chapter 17, sections 8 and 9. Chapter 17, section 10, 11, and 12 of A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 2, by John Bagnell Burry, Chapter 17, Parts 10, 11, and 12. Section 10. Conquest of Susiana and Persis. Having rested his army in the luxurious and wonderful city of the Euphrates, the conqueror advanced southeastward to Susa, the summer residence of the Persian court. Susa had been already secured for him by Philoxenus, whom he had dispatched hither from Arbella with some light troops. In the citadel he found enormous treasures of gold and silver and purple. Among other precious things at Susa was the sculpted group of the tyrant slayers, Harmodius and Aristogiton, which Xerxes had carried off from Athens, and Alexander had the pleasure of sending back to its home this strange historical monument, now more precious than ever through its own strange history. Though it was midwinter, Alexander soon left Susa to accomplish one of the most arduous adventures that he ever undertook. He had won the treasures of Susa, but there were immense treasures still in the palaces of Cyrus and Darius, in the heart of the Persian highlands, and these were guarded not only by the difficulties of the mountainous approaches, but by the army which Ariobizanes had rescued from the overthrow of Galgamela. Perhaps the reason for Alexander's haste in pressing on to Persis was the fear that Darius might descend with a new force from Media, if time were given him before Ariobizanes was crushed. But whatever were his reasons, it seemed to him of the greatest moment to secure Persis immediately. His road lay southeastward, and when he had crossed the river Pesitigris, the first obstacle that he encountered was the independent tribe of the Uxian hillsmen, of whom the Persian kings themselves were accustomed to bestow gifts for their good will. The barbarians held the passes through which the road lay, but a night march by a difficult mountain path enabled Alexander to surprise them, and the Uxians henceforward were forced to pay yearly gifts to the lord of Asia, a hundred horses, five hundred drought oxen, and thirty thousand sheep. The Macedonian army was now in the midst of a region which was unknown to Greek charts. Alexander's advance is a march not only of conquest but of discovery, and opens a new epoch in the history of geographical sciences by revealing Central Asia to the knowledge of Europe. Leaving half of his army with Parmenio to proceed more slowly along the main road, Alexander led the other half, including the Macedonians, both horse and foot, by a shorter path through the hills to the narrow defile which formed the entrance to Persis, and was called the Persian Gates. Ariobizanes was posted there with 40,000 foot and 700 horse, guarding the rocky pass which he had fortified by a wall. An attack, easily repelled, 
showed Alexander that the pass was unpregnable. Yet it must be carried, for this was the only road to the royal cities of Persia. For a moment Alexander was baffled. Never, perhaps, not even before Tyre, was he encountered by a problem more desperate to all seeming. But he learned from a prisoner of some extremely perilous paths leading round, through the forest which covered the mountains, to the back of the pass. At this season the snow made these paths more dangerous than ever, and they might well seem hopeless to men weighed down with heavy armor. But they were the only hope, and Alexander did not hesitate. He left Craterus with part of the troops in front of the pass, with orders to attack as soon as he heard the Macedonian trumpets sounding from above on the other side. With the rest of his force, including most of the cavalry, three regiments of the phalanx, the Hypastus, and other light troops, he set forth at night, and marched quickly eleven miles along the precipitous snowy track, intersected frequently by deep gullies. When the point was reached at which he was to turn in order to descend on the Persian camp, he again divided his forces, and sent one division forward to bridge the river Araxes and cut off the Persian retreat. Taking the Hypastus, the royal squadron of the companions, one regiment of the phalanx, and some light troops, he raced down upon the camp and destroyed or routed three successive sets of outposts before the day had dawned. Instead of raising the alarm, the sentinels scattered on the mountain, and when the Macedonian trumpets pealed on the brink of his entrenchments, Ariobizanes was taken completely by surprise. Attacked on both sides, in front by Craterus, who stormed up the wall of rock, and in the rear by Alexander, the Persians were cut to pieces, or fell over precipices in their flight. Ariobizanes, with a small band, escaped into the mountains. The royal palaces of Persia, to which Alexander now hurried with the utmost speed, stood in the valley of Murvdasht, fertile then, but desolate at the present day, and close to the city of Istakar, which the Persians deem the oldest city in the world. In Istakar itself there was a royal house too, but the great palaces stood some miles away, close beneath the mountain, upon a lofty platform against a background of black rock. The platform was mounted by magnificent staircases, and it bore, besides, massive propylia, four chief buildings, the small palace of Darius, the larger palace of Xerxes, and two great pillared halls. The impressive ruins tell a trained eye how to reconstruct the general plan of the royal abode, and there can be no question that Achaemenian architecture had wrought here its greatest achievements, greater than the palace of Susa which Alexander had seen greater than that of Ekbaktana, which he was soon to see. This cradle of the Persian kingdom, to which, city and palace together, the Greeks give the name of Persepolis, was the richest of all the cities under the sun. It is said that 120,000 talents were found in the treasury. An army of mules and camels were required to remove the spoils. This store of gold, so long withdrawn from use, was now suddenly to be restored to circulation and perturbed the markets of the world. Not far off, two days' journey northward up the winding valley of the Murgab, was Pasargadai, the city of Cyrus. The maker of Persia built it close to the field where he had shattered the host of the Median king, and the place is still marked by his tomb and the stones of other buildings, on some of which the traveler may read the words, I am Cyrus the king, the Achaemenian. In Parsagade, too, Alexander found a store of treasure. For four months he had made the Persian palaces his headquarters, during which time he received the submission of Carmania, or Kerman, and made some excursions to punish the robbers who infested the neighboring mountains. But the most famous incident connected with the sojourn at Persepolis is the conflagration of the palace of Xerxes. The story is that, one night, when Alexander and his companions were drunk deep at a royal festival, Thais, an Attic courtesan, who was of the company, mindful of her country and all the wrongs which Xerxes had wrought, flung out among the tipsy carousers the idea of burning down the house of the malignant foe who had burned the temples of Greece. The mad words of the woman inspired a wild frenzy, and whirled the revelers forth, armed with torches, to accomplish the barbarous deed. Alexander hurled the first brand, and the cedar woodwork of the palace was soon in flames. But before the fire had done its work, the king's head was cool, 
and he commanded the fire to be quenched. It is folly to attempt to read into this act a deliberate policy. It was the wild freak of a moment, repented the next. Section 11. Death of Darius. In the meantime, King Darius remained in Ecbatana, surrounded by the adherents who were faithful to him, chiefly the satraps of those lands which were still unconquered. Media itself, and Hyrcania, Aria, and Bactria, Aracosia, and Drangiana. It is probable that, after the Gaugamela battle, Alexander hoped to receive some proposal from his defeated foe, more submissive and acceptable than that which had been sent after Issus. He would have been ready, perhaps, to leave to Darius the eastern part of his dominions, with the royal title, though as a dependent vassal, and to content himself for a while with the empire which he had won, including Susa and Persepolis. It may have been with the hope of receiving overtures that he tarried so long in Persis. But Darius gave no sign. Media was defensible. He had a large army from the northern satrapies, and he had Bactria as a retreat, if retreat he must. The spring was advanced when Alexander left Persis for Ecbatana. The direct road did not lie by Susa, but much further east through the land of Paritacani. He made all speed, when the news reached him by the way, that Darius was at Ecbatana with a large army prepared to fight. But when, after a succession of forced marshes, he drew nigh to the city, he found that Darius had flown eastward, following the women and heavy baggage which had been sent on to the Caspian gates, and taking the treasures with him. It is said that the reason of this retreat was the default of some Caldusian and Scythian troops which had failed to arrive in time. When he reached the Median capital, Alexander was detained by the need of arranging certain matters before he pursued his rival into the northern wilds. He paid off the Thessalian troops and the other Greek confederates, giving them a handsome donative and a conduct to the Aegean. But any who chose to enroll themselves anew in his service and share in his further course of conquest might stay, and not a few stayed. Parmenio was entrusted with the care of seeing that the treasures of Persis were transported and safely deposited in the strong keep of Ecbatana, where they were to remain in charge for the treasurer Harpalus and a large body of Macedonian troops. Parmenio was then to proceed northward to Cadusia, and along the shores of the Caspian Sea, where he was to meet the king. With the main part of the army, Alexander hurried on, merciless to men and steeds, bent on the capture of Darius. His way lay by Ragai, and when he reached that place, a little to the south of the modern capital of Persia, he found that the fugitive was already well beyond the Caspian gates, which lie a long day's journey to the east. Despairing of overtaking him, Alexander rested some days at Regai, before he advanced towards Parthia through the Caspian Pass. But meanwhile doom was stealing upon Darius by another way. His followers were beginning to suspect that ill luck dogged him, and when he proposed to stay and risk another battle, instead of continuing his retreat to Bactria, none were willing except the remnant of Greek mercenaries, who were still faithful to the man who had hired them, and perhaps dreaded punishment as recusants to the Greek cause. Bessus, the satrap of Bactria, was a kinsman of the king, and it was felt by many that he might be able to raise up again the Achaemenian house, which Darius had been unable to sustain. A plot was formed, Darius was seized, and bound in the middle of the night, set in a litter, and hurried on as a prisoner along the road to Bactria. This event disbanded his army. The Greek mercenaries went off northwards into the Caspian mountains, and many of the Persians turned back to find pardon and grace with Alexander. They found him encamped on the Parthian side of the Caspian gates, and told him the new turn of events. When he had learned that his old rival was a prisoner, and that Bessus was now his antagonist, Alexander resolved on a swift and hot pursuit. Leaving the main body of the army to come slowly after, he set forth at once with his cavalry and some light foot, and sped the whole night through, not resting till the next day at noon, and then another evening and night at the same breathless speed. Sunrise saw him at Thara. It was the place where the great king had been put in chains, and it was ascertained from his interpreter, who had remained behind ill, that Bessus and his followers intended to surrender Darius if the pursuit were pressed. There was the greater need for haste. 
the pursuers rode on throughout another night. Men and horses were dropping with fatigue. At noon they came to a village where the pursuit had halted the day before, and Alexander learnt that they intended to march in the night. He asked the people if there was no short way, and was told that there was a short way, but it was waterless. Alexander instantly dismounted five hundred of his horsemen, and gave their steeds to the officers and the strongest men of the infantry who were with them. With these he started in the morning, and having ridden some forty-five miles, came up with the enemy at break of day. The barbarians were straggling, many of them unarmed. A few who made a stand were swept away, but most of them fled when they saw that it was Alexander. Bessus and his fellow conspirators bade their prisoner, no longer seemingly in chains, mount a horse, and when Darius refused, they stabbed him and rode their ways, wounding the litter mules too, and killing the drivers. The beasts, sore and thirsty, strayed about half a mile from the road down a side valley, where they were found at a spring by a Macedonian who came to slake his thirst. The great king was near his last gasp. If he could have spoken Greek, or if the stranger had understood Persian, he might have found words to send a message of thanks to his conqueror, for the generous treatment of his wife and mother, who were then assuredly in his thoughts. Afterwards, men had no scruple in placing appropriate words in the mouth of the dying monarch. It is enough to believe that he had solace of a cup of water in his supreme moments, and thanked the Macedonian soldier by a sign. Alexander viewed the body, and was said to have thrown his own cloak over it in pity. It was part of his fair luck that he had found Darius dead, for if he had taken him alive, he would not have put him to death, and such a captive would have been a perpetual embarrassment. He sent the corpse with all honor to the queen mother, the last of the Achaemenian kings, buried with his forefathers at Persepolis. Section 12 spirit of alexander's policy as lord of asia before we follow alexander on his marches of conquest and discovery into the regions which were then in europeanized the far east we may pause to observe his attitudes as ruler and king for the months which passed between the battle of gaugamela and the death of darius were a critical period which witnessed a remarkable change in his conception of his duty and in his political aims from the very beginning he had shown to the conquered peoples a tolerance which was not only promoted by generosity but upon political wisdom he had not attempted to apply an artificial scheme to all countries but had permitted each country to retain its national institutions one general principle indeed he did adopt the division of power and this was a notable improvement on the persian method under the persian kingdom a satrap was usually sole governor controlling not only the civil administration, but the treasury and the troops. Alexander, in most cases, committed the internal administration to the governor, and appointed with him, and independent of his authority, a financial officer and military commander. This division of authority was a security against rebellion. We have already seen, in Egypt and Babylonia, that in manners of religion Alexander was, like all Greeks, broad-minded and tolerant. But the Macedonian king, the commander-in-chief of the Greek confederates, had set forth as a champion of Greeks against mere barbarians, as a leader of Europeans against effeminate Asiatics, as representative of a higher folk against beings lower in the human chain. All the Macedonians and Greeks who followed him regarded the East as a world to be plundered and rifled by their higher intelligence and courage, and considered the Orientals as inferior set by nature to be their own slaves. Slaves by nature they showed to the political wisdom by Aristotle himself, Alexander's teacher, and the victories of Issus and Gaugamela were calculated to confirm the Europeans in their sense of unmeasured superiority. But, as Alexander advanced, his view expanded, and he rose to a loftier conception of his own position and his relation to Asia. He began to transcend the familiar distinction of Greek and barbarian, and to see that, for all the truth it contained, it was not the last word that could be said. He formed the notion of an empire, both European and Asiatic, in which the Asiatics should not be dominated by the European invaders, but Europeans and Asiatics alike should be ruled on an equality by a monarch, indifferent to the distinction of Greek and barbarian, 
and looked upon as their own king by Persians as well as by Macedonians. The idea begins to show itself after the battle of Gaugamela. The Persian lords and satraps who submit are received with favor and confidence. Alexander learns to know and appreciate the fine qualities of the Iranian noblemen. Some of the eastern provinces are entrusted to Persian satraps, for example, Babylonian to Mizaius, and the court of Alexander ceases to be purely European. With Oriental courtiers, the forms of an Oriental court are also gradually introduced. The Asiatics prostrate themselves before the Lord of Asia, and presently Alexander adopts the dress of a Persian king at court ceremonies, in order to appear less a foreigner in the eyes of his eastern subjects. The idea which prompted this policy was new and bold, and it harmonized with the great work of Alexander, the breaking down of barriers between east and west. But it was accompanied by a certain imperious self-exaltation, which we do not find in the earlier part of Alexander's career, and it involved him in troubles with his own folk. The Macedonians strongly disapproved of their king's new path, they disliked the rival influence of the Asiatic nobles, and their prejudices were shocked at seeing Alexander occasionally assume Oriental robes. The Macedonian royalty was indeed inadequate for Alexander's imperial position, but it is unfortunate that he had no other model than the royalty of Persia, hedged round by forms which were so distasteful to the free spirit of Greece. The life of Alexander was spent in solving difficult problems political and military, and none was harder than this, to create a kingship which should conciliate the prejudices of the East without offending the prejudices of the West. End of chapter 17, section 10, 11, and 12. Chapter 18, part 1 of A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 2, by John Bagnell Burry. Chapter 18, Part 1. The Conquest of the Far East, Section 1. Hyrcania, Aria, Bactria, Sogdiana. The murderers of Darius fled, Bessus to Bactria, Narbazanes to Hyrcania, and the direction of their flight determined the course of Alexander's advance. He could not pursue Bessus while there was an enemy behind him in the Caspian region, and therefore his first movement was to cross the Elber's chain of mountains which separate the South Caspian shores from Parthia, and subdue the lands of the Tapuri and Mardi. The Persian officers who had retreated into these regions submitted, and were received with favor. The life of Nabarzanes was spared. The Greek mercenaries who had found refuge in the Tapurian mountains capitulated. All who had entered the Persian service, before the Sinedrian of Corinth, had pledged Greece to the cause of Macedon, were released. The rest were compelled to serve in the Macedonian army for the same pay which they had received from Darius. The importance of the well-wooded southern coast of the Caspian was understood by Alexander, and he sent orders to Parmenio to go forth from Ectabana and take possession of the Cadusian territory on the southwestern side of the sea. He himself could not tarry. Having rested a fortnight at Zadracarta and held athletic games, he marched eastward to Susia, a town in the north of Aria, and was met there by Stadabarzanes, governor of Aria, who had made his submission and was confirmed in his satrapy. Here the news arrived that Bessus had assumed the style of great king with the name of Artaxerxes, and was wearing his turban erect. Alexander started at once on the road to Bactria. His way would have lain by Merv in the wilds of Central Asia, the beaten ways of traffic remained the same for thousands of years. But he had not gone far when he was overtaken by the news that Stadabarzanes had revolted behind him. There was nothing to be done but to return and to secure the province of Aria. But this province did not stand alone. It would certainly be upheld in its hostility by the neighboring countries of Aracosia 
and Drangiana, which form the satrapy of Barzyntes, one of the murderers of Darius. Hurrying back in forced marches with a part of his army, Alexander appeared before Artokoana, the capital of Aria. In two days, Stadabarzanes galloped away to seek Bessus in Bactria, and his troops who fled to the mountains were pursued and overcome. There was no further resistance, and the conqueror marched southward to Drangiana. His road could hardly be doubtful, the road which leads by Herat into Saistan, and it is probable that Herat is the site of the city which Alexander founded to be capital and stronghold of the new province, Alexandria of the Arians. The submission of Drangiana was made without a blow. The satrap who had fled to the Indians was given up by them and put to death. At Prophthasia, the capital of the Drangian land, there befell a tragedy, whereof we know too little to judge the right and the wrongs of the case. It came to Alexander's ears that Philotus, the son of Parmenio, was conspiring against his life. The king called an assembly of the Macedonians and stated the charges against the general. Philotus admitted that he had known of a plot to murder Alexander and had said nothing about it, but this was only one of the charges against him. The Macedonians, although many of them were ill-content with the developments of their king's policy in the east, found Philotus guilty, and he was pierced by their javelins. The son dead, it seemed dangerous to let the father live, whether he was involved or not in the treasonable designs of Philotus. A messenger was dispatched with all speed to Media, bearing commands to some of the captains of Parmenio's army to put the old general to death. If the guilt of Philotus was assured, and we have no reason to doubt it, we can hardly, so far as Philotus is concerned, blame Alexander for his rigorous measures, which it might have been painful for him to adopt. A crime which might be pardoned in Macedonia could not be dealt gently with in a camp in distant lands, where not only success but safety depended on loyalty and discipline. But the death of Parmenio was an arbitrary act of precaution, against merely suspected disloyalty. There seemed to have been no proofs against him, and there was certainly no trial. In the meantime, Alexander had changed his plans. Instead of retracing his steps and following the route to Bactria, which he had originally intended to take, he resolved to fetch a circle, and marching through Afghanistan, subduing it as he went, he would cross the Hindu Kush mountains, and descend on the plain of the Oxus from the east. First he advanced southwards to secure Saistan, and the northwestern regions of Baluchistan, then known as Gedrosia. The Ariaspai, a peaceful and friendly people whom the Greeks called benefactors, dwelt in the south of Seistan. Alexander passed part of the winter among them, and gratified them by a small increase of territory, and made them free, subject to no satrap. The neighboring Gedrosians volunteered their submission, and a Gedrosian satrapy was constituted with its capital at Pura. When spring came, Alexander pushed northeastward up the valley of the Haumand to Kandahar, and in pronouncing the name of Kandahar, we are perhaps pronouncing the name of the great conqueror, for the chief city which he founded in Arikosia was probably on the site of Kandahar, which seems to be a corruption of its name, Alexandria. The way led over the mountains past Ghazni into the valley of the upper waters of the Kabul River, and Alexander came to the foot of the high range of the Hindu Kush. The whole massive complex of mountains which diverge from the roof of the world dividing southern from central, eastern from western Asia, the Pamirs, the Hindu Kush, and the Himalayas were grouped by the Greeks under the general name of Caucasus. But the Hindu Kush was distinguished by the special name of Peropanesus, while Himalayas were called the Imaos. At the foot of the Hindu Kush he spent the winter and founded another Alexandria to secure the region, somewhere to the north of Kabul. It was distinguished as Alexandria of the Caucasus. While he was in these parts, he learned that Sadi Barzanis was still abroad in Aria, inflaming a rebellion. Some forces were sent to crush him. A battle was fought, and Sadi Barzanis was killed. The crossing of the Caucasus, undertaken in the early spring, was an achievement which, for the difficulties overcome, and the hardship of the cold and want endured, seemed to have fallen little short of Hannibal's passage of the Alps. 
the soldiers had to content themselves with raw meat and the herb of Silphian as a substitute for bread. At length they reached Drapsaca, high up on the northern slope, the frontier fortress of Bactria. Having rested his way-worn army, Alexander went down by the stronghold of Aornus into the plain and marched through a poor country to Bactra, the chief city of the land, which has preserved its old site, but has changed its name to Balk. The pretender, Bessus Artaxerxes, had stripped and wasted eastern Bactria up to the foot of the mountains for the purpose of checking the progress of the invading army, but he fled across the Oxus when Alexander drew near, and his native cavalry deserted him. No man withstood the conqueror, and another province was added without a blow to the Macedonian Empire. Alexander lost no time in pursuing the fugitive into Sogdiana. This is a country which lies between the streams of the Oxus and the Jaxartes. It was called Sogdiana from the river Saugd, which flows through the land and, passing near the cities of Samarkand and Bukhara, loses itself in the sands of the desert before it approaches the waters of the Oxus. Bessus had burnt his boats, and when Alexander, after a weary march of two or three days through the hot desert, arrived at the banks of the Oxus, he was forced to transport his army by the primitive vehicle of skins, which the natives of Central Asia then used, and still use today. Alexander's soldiers, however, instead of inflating the sheepskins with air, stuffed them with rushes. They crossed the river at Kilif, where its banks contract to the width of about two-thirds of a mile, and advanced on the road to Marikanda, the chief city of the country, easily recognized as Samarkand. Bessus had no support north of the Oxus. He had some Sogdian allies, at the head of whom were Spitamines and Dataphernes, but these men had no intention of sacrificing their country to the cause of the pretender. Thinking that Alexander's only object was to capture Bessus, and that he would then withdraw from Sogdiana, and fix the Oxus as the northern boundary of his dominion, they sent a message to him offering the surrender of the usurper. The king sent Ptolemy, son of Lagus, with six thousand men to secure Bessus, who was then found in a walled village, deserted by his Sogdian friends. By Alexander's orders he was placed, naked and fettered, on the right side of the road by which the army was marching. Alexander halted as he passed the captive, and asked him why he had seized and murdered Darius, his king and benefactor. Bessus replied that he had acted in concert with other Persian nobles, in the hope of winning the conqueror's favor. He was scourged and sent to Bactra to await his doom. But Alexander did not arrest his march. He had made up his mind to annex Sogdiana. Not the Oxus, but the Jaxartes was to be the northern limit of his empire. The children of the Waste called this river the Tanius. It was said that the Greeks were deceived into imagining that it was the same river as the familiar Tanius which discharges its waters into the Maotic Lake, and hence regarded it as the boundary between Asia and Europe, and thought that the herdsmen of the north who dwelt beyond it were the Scythians of Europe but they can hardly have fallen into this air, for they imagine that the Caspian was a gulf of the ocean, and the two airs are inconsistent. Having seized and garrisoned Samarkand, the army pushed on northeastward by the unalterable road which nature has marked out, and occupied seven strongholds which the Sogdians had built as defenses against invaders from the north. The road reached the Jaxartes, where that river issues from the chilly vale of Fergana, and deflects its course to flow through the steppes. It was a point of the highest importance, for Fergana forms the vestibule of the great gate of communication between southwestern Asia and China. The pass over the Tian Shan Mountains, which descends on the other side into the land of Kashgar. Here Alexander, with strategic insight, resolved to fix the limit of his empire, and on the banks of the river he founded a new city, which is known as Alexandria the Ultimate. There is no doubt about the situation. It is the later called Gend. The conqueror, judging from the ease with which he had come and conquered Aracosia and Bactria, seems not to have conceived that it might be otherwise beyond the Oxus. But the chiefs of Sogdiana were not as the Persian grandees. They were ready to dare greatly for their freedom against the European invader. As he was designing his new city, Alexander, Alexander received the news that the land was up in arms behind him. 
Spitamines was the leader of the movement, and it was supported by Axiartes and other leading Sogdians. The few Macedonian soldiers left in the seven strongholds had been overpowered, and the garrison of Samarcand was besieged in the citadel. A message had gone forth into the western wastes, and the Masagete and other Scythian tribes were flocking to drive out the intruder. It was a dangerous moment for Alexander. He first returned to recover the fortresses, and in two days he had taken and burned five of them. Chiropolis, the largest and strongest, caused more trouble, but Alexander, with a few companions, contrived to creep under the wall by the bed of a dry stream, and threw open a gate to the troops. The resistance of the inhabitants was furious, and the king was wounded in the melee. The fall of Chiropolis was followed by the capitulation of the seventh town, and the remnant of the indwellers of all these places were led in chains to take part in peopling the new Alexandria. The next task should have been the relief of Samarcand, but Alexander found himself confronted by a new danger, and could send only a few thousand troops to succor the besieged garrison. The herdsmen of the north were pouring down to the banks of the Jaxartes, ready to cross the stream and harass the Macedonians in the rear. It was impossible to move until they had been repelled, and the passage of the river secured. The walls of Alexandria were hastily constructed of unburnt clay, and the place made fit for habitation in the short space of twenty days. Meanwhile, the northern bank was lined by the noisy and jeering hordes of the barbarians, and Alexander determined to cross the river. The offerings were not favorable. They betokened, said the seer, personal danger to the king, but Alexander would be mocked no longer. Bringing up his missile engines to the shore, he dismayed the shepherds, who, when stones and darts began to fall among them from such a distance, and unhorsed one of their champions, retreated some distance from the bank. The army seized the moment to cross. The Scythians were routed, and Alexander, at the head of his cavalry, pursued them far into the steppes. Parched by the intense summer heat, the king was tempted to drink of the foul water of the desert, and he fell dangerously ill. Thus was the presage of his offerings fulfilled. Luckily, Alexander soon recovered, for ill tidings came from the south. When the relieving force approached Maracanda, Spitamines had fled westward to the sound. Spitamines had fled westward to the town of Sogdiana, which probably answers to Bukhara. The Macedonians marched after him, hoping to drive him utterly out of the land, but they were indiscreet, and the whole detachment was cut off. Learning of this disaster, Alexander hurried to Samarcand with cavalry and light troops, covering the distance, it is said, in three days, a forced march of between fifty and sixty miles a day, which seems almost impossible for foot soldiers, however lightly equipped, in the heat of a Sogdian summer. At his coming, Spitamines, who had returned to the siege of Samarcand, again darted westward, and Alexander followed in pursuit. Visiting the spot where the unlucky corpse had been cut down on the banks of the Sogd, the king buried the dead. Then, crossing the river, he pursued the fugitive chieftain and his Scythian allies to the limits of the waste. He swept on to Sogdiana, ravaging the land, and, marching southwestward to the Oxus, he crossed into western Bactria and spent the winter at Zariaspa. The Bactrian cities of Zariaspa and Bactra bore somewhat the same relation to one another as the Sogdian cities of Maracanda and Sogdiana. At Zariaspa, Bessus was formally tried for the murder of Darius, and was condemned to have his nose and ears cut off, and to be taken to Ectabana to die on the cross. The Greeks, like ourselves, regarded mutilation as a barbarous punishment, and it is not pleasant to find Alexander violating this sentiment. But the adoption of Oriental punishments in dealing with Orientals must be judged along with the adoption of other Oriental customs. Every conqueror of an alien race finds himself in a grave embarrassment. Is he to offend his ideals and fall away from his convictions by acquiescing in outlandish usages antagonistic to his own? Or is he, stiff-necked and inflexibly true to his principles of his own civilization, to remain out of touch with his new subjects? Is he to adopt the policy which will be most effective in administering the conquered land, or is he to impose a policy which works and is approved of in his home country, but may be useless or fatal elsewhere? 
Alexander did not adopt the second method. It was the task of his life to spread Greek civilization in the East. But he saw that this could not be done by an outsider, a general of Hellas, or a Basileus of Macedonia. He must meet the Orientals on their own ground. He must become their king in their own way. The surest means of planting Hellenism in their midst was to begin by taking account sympathetically of their prejudices. Alexander therefore assumed the state of great king, surrounded himself with eastern forms of pomp, exacted self-abasement in his presence from oriental subjects, and adopted the maxim that the king's person was divine. He was the successor of Darius, and he regarded the murder of that monarch as a crime touching himself, insomuch as it was a crime against royalty. It was therefore an act of deliberate policy that he punished the kingslayer in eastern fashion, as an impressive example to his eastern subjects. The misfortune was that Alexander's assumption of oriental state, and the favor which he showed to the Persians, was highly unpopular with the Macedonians. It was hard always to preserve a double face, one for his companions, the other for his Persian ministers. Nor was it Alexander's policy to maintain this difference forever. He hoped ultimately to secure uniformity in the relations of Macedonians and Persians to their common king. Meanwhile, in the intervals of rest between military operations, discontent smoldered among the Macedonians. Though they were attached to their king, and proud of the conquests which they had helped him to achieve, they felt that he was no longer the same to them as when he had led them to victory at the Granicus. His exaltation over obescent Orientals had changed him, and the execution of his trusted general Parmenio was felt to be significant of the change. These feelings of discontent accidentally found a mouthpiece about this time. Rebellious movements in Sogdiana brought Alexander over the Oxus again before the winter was over, and he spent some time at Samarkand. One of the most unfortunate consequences of the long protracted sojourn in the regions of the Oxus was the increase of drunkenness in the army. The excessively dry atmosphere in summer produces an intolerable and frequent thirst, and it was inevitable that the Macedonians should slack it by wine, the strong wine of the country, if they would not sicken themselves by the brackish springs of the desert or the noisome water of the towns. Alexander's potations became deep and habitual from this time forth. One night in the fortress of Samarcand, the carouse lasted far into the night. Greek men of letters who accompanied the army sang the praises of Alexander, exalting him above the Dioscuri, whose feast he was celebrating on this day. Clytus, his foster brother, flushed with wine, suddenly sprang up to denounce the blasphemy, and once he had begun, the current of his feelings swept him on into a denunciation and disparagement of Alexander. It was to the Macedonians, he said, to men like Parmenio and Philotus, that Alexander owed his victories. He himself had saved Alexander's life at the Granicus. These were the two sharpest stings and they stirred Alexander's blood to fury. He started to his feet and called in Macedonian for his hypastus. None obeyed his drunken orders. Ptolemy and the other banqueters forced Clytus out of the hall, while others tried to restrain the king. But presently Clytus made his way back, and shouted from the doorway some insulting verses of Euripides, signifying that the army does the work, and the general reaps the glory. The king leapt up, snatched a spear from the hand of a guardsman, and rushed upon his foster brother. Drunk though he was, the aim was sure. Clytus sunk dead to the ground. An agony of remorse followed. For three days the murderer lay in his tent, without sleep or food, cursing himself as the assassin of his friends. The army sympathized with his grief. They tried the dead man, and resolved that he had been justly slain. The tragedy was attributed to the anger of Dionysus, because the day was his festival, and the Dioscuri had been celebrated instead. The tragic issue of this miserable drunken brawl is a lurid spot in Alexander's life, but it was a slight matter compared to the act which is said to have marked his invasion of Sogdiana. When we saw him first cross the Oxus in pursuit of Bessus, we did not pause to witness his treatment of a remarkable town which lay on his way. The Brachidae, who had charge of the temple and oracle of Apollo, twenty miles from Miletus, 
are charged with having betrayed the treasures of the sanctuary. Their lives were not safe from the anger of the Milesians, and Xerxes transported them into Central Asia, where no Greek vengeance could pursue them. They were established in Sogdiana, not far from the place where Alexander crossed, a solitary little settlement, which, though severed long, though severed so long from Hellas, preserved its Greek religion and Greek customs, and had not forgotten the Greek speech. It is easy to imagine what excitement was stirred there by the coming of a Greek army. The folk came forth joyously to bid Alexander welcome, and to offer him their fealty. But Alexander remembered only one thing. The ancestors of this people had committed a heinous crime against Apollo, and had sided with Persia against Greece. That crime had never been forgotten by the men of Miletus, and the king called upon the Milesians in his army to pronounce sentence upon the Brancandi. The Milesians could not agree, and Alexander himself decided the fate of the town. Having surrounded it with a cordon of soldiers, he caused all the inhabitants to be massacred and the place to be utterly demolished. Few of the children of the children's children of the original transgressors could still have been alive. Many of the victims belonged to the fifth degree of descent. We cannot imagine a fouler enforcement of the savage principle that the crimes of the fathers should be visited to distant generations. It is small wonder that Ptolemy and Aristobulus, if the story is true, omitted it from their records of the campaigns of their king. There are other deeds of Alexander which cannot be excused, but there is none so black, none so cruel as the murder of the Brancandi, none for which some extenuating circumstances cannot be urged. There were more hostilities in western Bactria and western Sogdiana, until at last, overawed by Alexander's success, the Scythians, in order to win his favor, slew Spitamines. With this chieftain, the resistance expired. It only remained to reduce the rugged southeastern regions of Sogdiana, which were called Paratykini. The Sogdian rock, which commands the pass into these regions, was occupied by Oxyartes, and a band of Macedonian soldiers captured it by an audacious night climb. Among the captives was Roxanne, the daughter of Axiartes, and the love of Alexander, who had always been indifferent to women, was attracted by the beauty and the manners of the Sogdian maiden. It was characteristic of him that, notwithstanding the adverse comment which such a condescension would excite among the proud Macedonians, he resolved to make her his wife and, on his return to Bactria, after subjugating other fortresses in Paratykini, he divided a loaf of bread with his bride according to the fashion of the country, and celebrated the nuptials. There was policy in his marriage as well as inclination. It was symbolic of the union of Asia and Europe, of the breaking down of the barrier between Barbarian and Hellene, and of Alexander's position as an Oriental king. About this time an attempt seems to have been made to render uniform the court ceremonial. The Persian nobles were not well pleased that, whereas they were compelled to abase themselves to the ground before the divinity of the king, the Macedonians and Greeks were excused from the obeisance. Most of the Greeks would have been pliant enough, but there was one prominent man of letters who stood against the usage and drew upon himself displeasure by the utterance of bold truths. This was Callisthenes, a nephew of Aristotle, he was composing a history of the campaigns of Alexander, whose exploits he ungrudgingly lauded. He had joined the army, he used to say, to make him famous, not to win fame himself. It is related that Hephaestion and a number of others arranged a plan for surprising the king's guests at a banquet into making the obeisance. Alexander, raising his golden cup, drank to each guest in order, first to some of those who were privy to the plan. Each arose and prostrated himself and was then kissed by the king. Callisthenes, when his turn came, drained the cup, and went to receive the kiss without doing the obeisance. Alexander would not kiss him, and he turned away, saying, I go the poorer by a kiss. Incidents of this kind created a coolness between the king and his historian. One of the duties of Callisthenes and the other philosophers and literary men who accompanied Alexander's progress was to educate the pages, the noble Macedonian youths who attended on the king's person, and over some of these Callisthenes had great influence. One day, at a boar hunt, a page named Hermolaus 
committed the indiscretion of forestalling the king in slaying the beast, and for this breach of etiquette he was flogged and deprived of his horse. Smarting under the dishonor, Hermolaus plotted with some of his comrades to slay Alexander in his sleep. But on the appointed night Alexander sat up, carousing till dawn, and on the next day the plot was betrayed. The conspirators were arrested and put to death by the sentence of the whole army. Callisthenes was also handfasted on the charge of being an accomplice, and was afterwards hanged. Hermolaus was indeed one of his warmest admirers, but it is not clear what the evidence against the historian was. On the one hand, Ptolemy and Aristobulus asserted independently that the pages declared under torture that the Callisthenes had incited them. On the other hand, Alexander is said to have stated in a letter that the torture had failed to elicit the name of any accomplice. The deeper cause may be that Alexander suspected Callisthenes as an agent of the anti-Macedonian party in Greece. Before the end of summer, Alexander bade farewell to Bactria and set forth to the conquest of India. Three years had passed since the death of Darius, three unique years in the annals of the world. In that time, the western conqueror, disarranging the cycles of Asiatic history, had subdued Afghanistan and cast his yoke over the herdsmen of the north as far as the river Jaxartes. He was the first and last western conqueror of Afghanistan. He was the first but not the last invader. He was the first European invader and conqueror of the regions beyond the Oxus, anticipating by more than two thousand years the conquests which had been achieved by an European power within the memory of the present generation. His next enterprise forestalled our own conquests of northwestern India, but England made her conquests from the south, Russia hers from the north. Alexander was the only European conqueror who marched straight from the west to the Indus and the Oxus. The Macedonian monarch's work in Bactria and Sogdiana was an unavoidable sequel of his succession to the Persian Empire. He had to set up a barrier against the unsettled races of the waste, who were a perpetual menace to the civilizations of the south. He founded a number of settlements in these regions, not only for the purpose of military garrisons, but also probably with the hope of gradually training the herdsmen to more settled ways of life. If so, it was a vain hope. History has shown that there was only one means of forcing the shepherd races to become reluctant tillers of the soil, not until they had been encompassed on all sides by civilization and driven within a narrow geographical area will they adopt, under the stress of necessity, the regular and laborious life of agriculture. The iron pressure of Russia's embrace is gradually narrowing the grounds of the nomads in Central Asia. In the days of Alexander they had endless space behind them, and an indefinite future before them. End of chapter 18, part 1. Chapter 18, part 2 of A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 2, by John Bagnall Burry. Chapter 18, Part 2. The Conquest of India. In returning to Afghanistan, Alexander seems to have followed the main road from Balkh to Kabul, crossing the Hindu Kush by a pass more westerly than that by which he had come. Reaching Alexandria in ten days, he went on to another town, which, if he had not refounded, he had at all events renamed Nicaea, and which is possibly to be salt in Kabul itself. Here he stayed till the middle of November, finding much to do, both in organizing the province and in preparing for further advance. He had left a large detachment of his army in Bactria, but he had enrolled a still larger force, 30,000 of the Asiatics of those regions, Bactrians, Sogdians, Dahai, and Sakai. The host with which he was now to descend upon India must have been at least twice as numerous as the army with which he had crossed the Hellespont seven years before. 
It had increased as it rolled on, and the augmentations far more than counterbalanced the reductions caused by leaving detachments in each new province, and the losses due to warfare or disease. During these years, Alexander's camp was his court and capital, the political center of his empire, a vast city rolling along over mountain and river through Central Asia. Men of all trades and callings were there, some indispensable for the needs of the king and his army, others drawn by the prospect of making profits by the spoiled laden soldiers. Craftsmen of every kind, engineers, physicians and seers, cheap men and money changers, literary men, poets, musicians, athletes, jesters, secretary, clerks, court attendants, a host of women and slaves. In many of the halting places, athletic and musical contests were held, serving both to cheer the Greeks by reminding them of their home country and to impress the imagination of the barbarians. A court diary was regularly kept, in imitation of the court journal of Persia, by Eumenes of Cardia, who conducted all the political correspondence of Alexander. Alexander had no notion of the shape or extent of the Indian peninsula, and his notion of the Indian conquest was probably confined to the basins of the Kofen and the Indus. He was not the first invader speaking an Aryan language who went down through the northwestern hills into the plains of India. Centuries and centuries before, Aryan herdsmen had flown down in successive waves and found an abiding home there. From Central Asia, from the regions of the Hindu Kush, bringing with them their old hymns, some of which we still possess, they came down into the lands of the Indus, the glorious giver of wealth, and turned to a settled agricultural life. Strangely different was the civilization which grew up in northern India among the men who called upon Dius Pitar, from that of their speech brethren who worshipped Zeus Pater on the shores of the Aegean, the castes of the Brahmins and the warriors, the inhuman asceticism of the Brahmin's life, the political influence of these religious men must have seemed repulsive and outlandish to the free and cheerful temper of the Greeks. The great Darius had partially annexed the lands of the Indus, and they constantly supplied troops to his successors. Skylax of Carianda had sailed down the Indus by his orders, and probably published an account of the voyage. The stories that were told about the wonders of India excited the curiosity of the Greek invaders. It was a land of righteous folks, of strange beasts and plants, of surpassing wealth in gold and gems. It was supposed to be the ultimate country on the eastern side of the world, bounded by ocean stream. At this time, northwestern India was occupied by a number of small, heterogeneous principalities and village communities. The northern districts of the land between the Indus and the Hydaspes, a stream which we now call the Jelum, was ruled by Amphis, a prince whose capital was at Taxila, near the Indus. His brother Abisares was the ruler of Hazara and the adjacent parts of Kashmir. Beyond the Hydaspes was the powerful kingdom of Porus, who held sway as far as the Asenes, or Dark Hued, which we know as the Shinab, and the next of the five rivers. East of the Shinab, in the lands of the Ravi and the Bayis, were other small principalities, and also free, kingless peoples who owned no master. These principalities and free communities differed much in manners and religion. They had no tendency to unity or combination. The free tribes feared and hated the princes. The princes strove with one another. And these states were not all of the same race. Most, perhaps, were Aryan, but some, like the Mali, belonged to the old Dravidian stock, whom, even in the Punjab, the Aryans had not entirely dispossessed or subdued. An invader, therefore, had no common resistance to fear. He had to deal with the states one by one, and he could be assured that many would welcome him out of hatred for their neighbors. The prince of Taxila hoped great things from the Macedonian conqueror, especially the downfall of his rival Porus. He visited Alexander at Nicaea, laid himself and his kingdom at the great emperor's feet, and promised his aid in subduing India. Other chiefs on the hither side of the Indus also made submission. Alexander's direct road from the high plain of Kabul into the Punjab lay along the right bank of the Kofin, or Kabul River, through the great gate of the Khyber Pass. But it was impossible to advance to the Indus without securing his communications, and for this purpose it was needful to subjugate the river valleys to the left of the Kabul, 
among the huge western spurs of the Himalaya mountains. It was perhaps not far from Jalalabad that the army came to a city, which was called Nysa. The name immediately awakened in the minds of all the Greeks the memory of their god Dionysus, for Mount Nysa was the mythical place which he had been nursed by nymphs when he was born from the thigh of Zeus. The mountain was commonly supposed to be in Thrace, but an old hymn placed it near the streams of the Nile. It had no place on the traveler's chart. But here was an actual Nysa, and close to the town was a hill whose name resembled Meros, the Greek word for thigh, and whose slopes were covered with the god's own ivy. Therefore Nysa, they said, was founded by Dionysus. The god had fared eastward to subdued India, and now Alexander was marching on his tracks. Everywhere, on their further march, the Greeks and Macedonians were alert to discover traces of the progress of the Bacchic god. For the purposes of this campaign, Alexander divided his army. Hephaestion, taking three regiments of the phalanx, half the Macedonian cavalry, all the mercenary cavalry, advanced by the Khyber Pass, with orders to construct a bridge across the Indus. The king, with the rest of his army, including the light troops, plunged into the difficult country north of the river, and the winter was spent in warfare with the hardy hill folks, especially the Aspasians and Asakins, and in capturing their impregnable fortresses in the district of the Kunar, in remote Chitral, and in the Pankjar and Swat valleys. It would be interesting to follow the exploits of the Macedonian army in these wilds, but we cannot identify the places with certainty. Masaga, of the Asakinian people, in the Swat Valley, was one of the most important strongholds that Alexander captured. We cannot point it out on the map, but Deirtra, another fortress of the same people, may be fairly sought in Deir. The most wonderful exploit of all was the scaling and taking of the rock of Aornus, which has been recognized in the hill of Mahaban, on the right bank of the Indus about sixty miles from the confluence of that river with the Kabul. When, by a miracle of boldness and patience, he captured this fortress, Alexander had to return on his steps as far as Deir to suppress a revolt of the Asakins. After this severe winter campaign, the army rested on the hither bank of the Indus until spring had begun, and then, with the solemnity of games and sacrifices, crossed the river, and marched a three days' journey eastward to Taxila, the rich country of these Aryan husbandmen was a striking and pleasant contrast to the barren abodes of the shepherds of Bactria and Sogdiana. The prince of Taxila met Alexander with obsequious pomp, and other lesser princes assembled at the city to do him homage. The administration of the recent conquests was now arranged. A new satrapy, embracing the lands west of the Indus, was established and entrusted to Philip, son of Machatus. Macedonian garrisons were placed in Taxila and some other places east of the Indus, and Philip was charged with the general command of these troops. This shows the drift of Alexander's policy. The Indus was to be the eastern boundary of his direct sway. Beyond the Indus, he proposed to create no new provinces, but only to form a system of protected states, over which the governor of the frontier province would have a general supervision. Alexander then marched by a southward road to the Hydaspes, where he was to meet the only power in the land which could hope to resist his progress. Prince Poros had sent a defiance, and having gathered an army from thirty to forty thousand strong, was encamped on the left bank of the river to contest the crossing. Moreover, Abisaris of Kashmir promised him aid, although he had set marks of homage to Alexander. The boats which had been constructed on the Indus for transporting the troops were, by Alexander's orders, sawn in two or three pieces according to their size, and conveyed on carts to the Hydaspes. After a march which was made slow and toilsome by the heavy tropical rain, the invaders encamped on the right bank of the river, near Jalalapur, and saw the lines of Porus on the opposite shore, protected by a multitude of elephants, his most formidable weapon of war. It was useless to think of crossing in the face of this host, for the horses, who could not endure the smell and noise of the elephants, would certainly have been drowned, and the men would have found it almost impossible to land amid showers of darts on the slimy, treacherous edge of the stream. All the fords in the neighborhood were watched. Alexander adopted various measures to deceive and puzzle the enemy. He collected large stores of corn, 
as if he had made up his mind to remain for many days where he was. He spread the rumor that he intended to wait till the season of rains was over, and he kept his troops in constant motion, sending detachments hither and thither. Then one night his trumpets blew, his cavalry rode down to the edge of the water, and to the eyes of the enemy it seemed that the whole army was about to cross. Porus moved his elephants up to the bank and set his host in array, but it proved to be a false alarm. The same feint was repeated again and again. Each night the Macedonian camp was in motion, as if for crossing. Each night the Indians stood long hours in the wind and rain. But when he saw that the noise was never followed by action, Porus became weary of these useless nightly watches, and disregarded the alarms of a faint-hearted foe. Alexander, meanwhile, was maturing a plan which he was able to carry out when he had put Porus off his guard. About sixteen miles upwards from the camp, the Hydaspes makes a bend, changing its course from south to westward, and opposite, the jutting angle, a thickly wooded island rose amid the stream, while a dense wood covered its right shore. Here Alexander determined to cross. He caused the boats to be conveyed thither, and remade in the shelter of the wood close to a deep ravine. He had prepared skins stuffed with straw, such as he had used in passing the Oxus. When the time came, he led a portion of his troops to the wooded promontory, marching at a considerable distance from the river, in order to avoid the observation of the enemy. A sufficient force was left in the camp, under the command of Craterus, with orders not to cross, unless Porus either moved his entire army from its present position, or was defeated and routed. Other forces were posted at points between the camp and the island, to cross and to help at the right moment. The king arrived at the appointed spot later in the evening, and throughout the wet, stormy night he directed the preparations for passing the swollen stream. Here, on the right bank, he posted the regiments of heavy infantry, which he had brought with him, a precaution, probably, against the possible arrival of Abisaris. The wind and rain, which had effectually concealed all the noise from the ears of hostile outposts on the bank, abated before dawn, and the passage began. Alexander led the way in a bark of thirty oars, and the island was safely passed, but land was hardly reached before they were descried by Indian scouts, who galloped off at full speed to warn their chieftain. The king, who was the first to leap ashore, waited until the cavalry had been disembarked and marshaled, but on advancing he discovered that he had landed not on the bank, but on an island which was parted from the bank by a small channel now swollen with rain. It was some time before a passage for wading could be found, and the water was breast high. At last the whole force was safely landed on the bank, and Alexander ordered his men for the coming battle, the third of the three great battles of his life. It was to be won without any heavy infantry. He had with him only six thousand hypastas, about four thousand light foot, five thousand cavalry, including one thousand Scythian archers. Taking all the cavalry with him, he rode rapidly forward towards the camp of Porus, leaving the infantry to follow. If the whole host of Porus should come out to meet him, he would wait for the infantry, but if the enemy showed symptoms of retreating, he would dash in among them with his superior cavalry. Presently he saw a troop coming. It was the son of Porus, at the head of one thousand horsemen and sixty war chariots, too late to impede the landing of the Macedonians. As soon as he perceived the small number of the foe, Alexander charged and easily drove them back, slaying the prince and four hundred of his men. But Porus himself was advancing with his main army, having left a small force to guard the river bank against Craterus. When he reached sandy ground, suitable for the movements of his cavalry and war chariots, he drew up his line in battle. In front of all he arranged two hundred elephants at intervals of one hundred feet, and at some distance behind them his infantry, who numbered twenty thousand if not more. On the wings he placed his cavalry, perhaps four thousand. Alexander waited for the Hypastus, and drew them up opposite to the elephants. It was impossible to attack in front, for neither horse nor foot could venture in between these beasts, which stood like towers of defense, the true strength of the Indian army. The only method was to begin by a cavalry attack on the flank, and Seleucus and the other captains of the infantry were bidden not to advance until they saw that both the horse and the foot of the foe were tumbled into confusion by the flank assault. Alexander determined to concentrate his attack on the left wing, perhaps because it was on the river side, 
and he would be within easier reach of his troops on the other bank. Accordingly he kept all his cavalry on his right wing. One body was entrusted to Coinus, who bore well to the right, and was ready to strike in the rear, and to deal with the body of horse stationed upon the enemy's right wing, in case they should come round to assist their comrades on the left. The mounted Scythian archers rode straight against the front of the enemy's cavalry, which was still in column formation, not having had time to open out, and harassed it with showers of arrows, while Alexander himself, with the rest of the heavy cavalry, led the charge upon the flank. Porus, who had committed the fatal mistake of allowing the enemy to take the offensive, brought up his remaining squadrons from the right wing as fast as he could. Then Coinus, who had ridden round close to the river bank, fell upon them in the rear. The Indians had now to form a double front against the double foe. Alexander seized the moment to press hard against the adverse squadrons. They swayed backwards and sought shelter behind the elephants. Then those elephant riders who were on this side of the army drove the beasts against the Macedonian horses, and at the same time the Macedonian footmen rushed forward and attacked the animals, which were now turned sideways towards them. But the other elephants of the line were driven into the ranks of the Hypastus and dealt destruction, trampling down and striking furiously. Heartened by the success of the elephants, the Indian cavalry rallied and charged, but beaten back by the Macedonian horse, who were now formed in a serried mass, they again sought shelter behind the elephantine wall. But many of the beasts were now furious with wounds and beyond control. Some had lost their riders, and in the melee they trampled on friends and foes alike. The Indians suffered most, for they were surrounded and confined to the space in which the animals raged, while the Macedonians could attack the animals on side or rear and then retreat into the open when they turned to charge. At length, when the elephants grew weary and their charges were feebler, Alexander closed in. He gave the order for the Hypastus to advance in close array, shield to shield, while he, reforming his squadrons, dashed in from the side. The enemy's cavalry, already weakened and dislocated, could not withstand the double shock and was cut to pieces. The Hypastus rolled on upon the enemy's infantry, who, though they had hitherto taken no serious part in the fight, soon broke and fled. Meanwhile the generals on the other side of the river, Craterus and the rest, discovering that fortune was declaring for Alexander, crossed the river without resistance, and arrived in time to consummate the victory by pursuing the fugitives. Porus, who had shown himself a mediocre general, but a most valiant soldier, when he saw most of his forces scattered, his elephants lying dead, or straying riderless, did not flee, as Darius had twice fled, but remained fighting, seated on an elephant of commanding height, until he was wounded in the right shoulder, the only part of his body unprotected by mail. Then he turned around and rode away. Alexander, struck with admiration at his prowess, sent messengers who overtook him and induced him to return. The victor, riding out to meet the old prince, was impressed by his stature and beauty, and asked him if he would fain be treated. "'Treat me like a king,' said Porus. "'For my own sake,' said Alexander, "'I will do that. Ask a boon for thy sake.' "'That,' replied Porus, "'containeth all.'" And Alexander treated his captive royally. He not only gave him back his kingdom, henceforward to be a protected state under Macedonian suzerainty, but largely increased its borders. This royal treatment, however, though it pleased the generous impulses of Alexander, was inspired by deep policy. He could rest the security of his rule beyond the Indus on no better base than the mutual jealousy of two moderately powerful princes. He had made the lord of Taxila as powerful as he was safe. The reinstatement of his rival Porus would be the best guarantee of his loyalty. But on the other side of the Hydaspes, close to the scene of the battle, two cities were founded, which would serve as garrisons in the subject land. On the right hand, the city of Bucephala, named after Alexander's steed, which had died here, probably shortly before the battle, of old age and weariness. On the left, Nicaea, the city of victory. Leaving Craterus to build the cities, Alexander marched northward to subdue the Glauci, a hill folk on the border of Kashmir, and, at the same time, to intimidate Abisares. 
Then, keeping near the skirts of the hills, he crossed the Acacines, more than a mile and a half broad, with great peril and some loss, into the territory of a namesake and nephew of Porus. This Porus was at enmity with his uncle, who probably claimed overlordship over him. He had sent messages of submission to Alexander before the battle, but, disappointed and frightened at the favor which the conqueror had shown his uncle, he fled eastward. Alexander himself hastened in pursuit, crossed the Hydriotis, which, unlike the Acacines, was easily passed, but he left Hephaestion to march southward and subdue the land of the younger Porus, as well as the free communities between the two rivers. All this northern portion of the Doab, or interfluvial tract, may be added to the realm of the elder Porus. The news that the Cathayans, a free and warlike people, whom Porus and Abisaris had, some time before, failed to conquer, were determined to give him battle, diverted Alexander from the pursuit. He advanced against their chief town, Sangala, strongly walled and protected on one side by a hill and on the other by a lake. It was probably near Amristar, to the northeast of Lahore. The Cathayans, supported by some neighboring tribes, had made a stockade with a triple line of wagons round the hill. After a severe struggle, the entrenchment was carried, and the defenders retreated into the city. They tried to escape through the lake, under the cover of night, but Alexander discovered the plan, and lined the shores with soldiers. Then the place was stormed and slighted. The neighboring people submitted, and all this land was likewise placed under the lordship of Porus. Thus, of the four river-bounded tracts which composed the Punjab, the largest, between Indus and Jelum, belonged to Umphis of Taxila, while the three others, between Jelum and Baas, were assigned to Porus. Alexander now advanced to the Hyphasis, or Baeus, and reached it higher up than the point where it joins the Sutlej to form the Katudru, or one hundred streams. It was destined to be the landmark of his utmost march. He wished to go farther and explore the lands of the Ganges, but an unlooked-for obstacle occurred. The Macedonians were worn out with years of hard campaigning, and weary of this endless rolling on into the unknown. Their numbers had dwindled, the remnant of them were battered and grown old before their time. The terrible rains which had beaten incessantly upon them since the crossing of the Indus, and had made their labors doubly laborious, were the last weight in the scale. Their gear was worn out, the hooves of their horses, as one of the campaigners described, were rubbed away by the long, rough journeys. Their arms were blunted and broken in hard combats. The bodies of the veterans were enveloped in Indian rags, for their Greek clothes were worn out. All yearned back for their homeland in the West. They had won glory enough. Why heap toil upon toil and peril upon peril? On the banks of the Hyphasis, the crisis came. The men resolved to go no farther, and their resolution was strengthened by the information that they would have to cross the Indian desert, a journey of eleven days, before they reached the fertile regions of the Ganges. At a meeting of the officers which Alexander summoned, Coinus was the spokesman of the general feeling. The king, not a little vexed, dismissed them, and summoning them on the morrow, declared that he had proposed to advance himself, but would constrain no man to follow him. Let the Macedonians go back to Macedonia, and tell how they abandoned their king in a hostile land. He retired to his tent, and for two days refused to see any of his companions, hoping that their hearts would be softened. But though his resentment made them unhappy, the Macedonians did not relent or go back from their purpose. On the third day, Alexander offered sacrifices, preliminary to crossing the river. But the victims, and this was assuredly no freak of chance, gave unfavorable signs. Then the king yielded, and signified to the obdurate army that he had decided to return. When his will was made known, the way-worn veterans burst into wild joy. The more part of them shed tears. They crowded round the royal tent, blessing the unconquered king, that he had permitted himself to be conquered for once by his Macedonians. On the banks of the Hyphasis, Alexander erected twelve towering altars to the twelve great gods of Olympus, as a thank-offering for having strewn his wonderful path with victories, and led him safely within reach of the world's end. Within reach of the world's end, and not to reach it, this was the disappointment which befell Alexander at the Hyphasis. 
To understand fully the measure of this disappointment, we must realize his geographical conceptions. Of the southern extension of Asia in the great Indian promontory, and further India with its huge islands, he knew nothing. Of the vastness of China, of the existence of Siberia, he had not the least suspicion. He supposed that the Ganges discharged its waters into the ocean which bounded the earth in the east, as the Atlantic bounded it on the west, and he imagined that this eastern sea, washing the base of the further slopes of the Hindu Kush and Pamir mountains, and rounding the northern slopes of Scythia, was continuous with the Caspian. And just as he planned to navigate the southern ocean, from the mouth of the Indus to the Arabian Gulf, or perhaps even round Libya, to the Pillars of Hercules, plans of which we shall presently speak, so he probably dreamed of navigating the eastern ocean, from the mouth of the Ganges, and winning round to the shores of Scythia and Hyrcania. On annexation, or effective conquest, beyond the Hyphasis, the mind of Alexander does not seem to have been bent. He had only a small army with him, for he had dropped large detachments on his way from the Jalum to the Bais, and he expected no hostilities from the tranquil dwellers of the Ganges. His expedition would have been, in the first instance, a journey of exploration. Circumstances might have made it into a march of conquest. Alexander is often represented as a madman, dazzled by wild and whirling visions of dominion and glory, impelled by an insatiable lust of conquest for conquest's sake. But, in judging his schemes, which in themselves seem wild to us, who know the configuration of the earth, we must contract our imagination to the compass of his false notions and imperfect knowledge. If the form and feature of the earth were what he pictured it to be, twenty years would have sufficed to make his empire contraminous with its limits. He might have ruled from the eastern to the western ocean, from the ultimate bounds of Scythia to the shores of Libya. He might have brought to pass in three continents and universal peace, and dotted the habitable globe with his Greek cities. Alexander was ambitious, but ambition did not blind him. He was perfectly capable of discerning shine from substance. The advance to the Indus was no mere wanton aggression, but was necessary to establish secure routes for Indian trade, which was at the mercy of the wild hill tribes, and the subjugation of the Punjab was a necessity for securing the Indus frontier. The solid interests of commerce underlay the ambitions of the Macedonian conqueror. It is not without significance that Phoenician merchants accompanied his army. Alexander retraced his steps to the Hydaspes, on his way picking up Hephaestion, who had founded a new city on the banks of the Icesenes. On the Hydaspes, Craterus had not only built the two cities at the scene of the great battle, but had also prepared a large fleet of transports, which was to carry part of the army down the river to reach the Indus and the ocean. The fleet was placed under the command of Nearchus, and the king's own ship was piloted by Onascritus, who afterwards wrote a book on Alexander's expedition. The rest of the army, divided into four parts, marched along either bank under Hephaestion and Craterus. As they advanced, they swept the southern portions of the Doabs, reducing the tribes which did not submit. The only formidable resistance that they encountered was from the free and warlike tribe of the Mali, whose territory stretched on both sides of the Ravi. Having routed a large host of these Indians on the southern bank of the river, Alexander pursued them to their chief city, which is probably to be sought at the site of the modern Multan. Since then the Ravi has changed its bed. In the days of Alexander it used to flow into the Shinab below Multan. Here he met with a grave adventure. The city had been easily taken, and the Indians had retreated into the citadel. Two ladders were brought to scale the earthen wall, but it was found hard to place them beneath the shadow of missiles from above. Impatient at the delay, Alexander seized a ladder and climbed up under the cover of his shield. Peucestus, who bore the sacred buckler from the temple of Ilion, and Leonatus followed, and Abraeus ascended the other ladder. When the king reached the battlement, he hurled down, or slew the Indians who were posted at that spot. The Hypasis, when they saw their king standing upon the wall, a mark for the whole garrison of the fortress, made a rush for the ladders, and both ladders broke under the weight of the crowd. Only these three, Peucestus, Leonatus, and Abraeus, reached the wall before the ladders broke. His friends implored Alexander to leap down. He answered their cries by leaping down among the enemy. He alighted on his feet, 
With his back to the wall he stood there alone, against the throng of foes who recognized the great king. With his sword he cut down their leader, and some others who ventured to rush at him. He felled two more with stones, and the rest, not daring to approach, pelted him with missiles. Meanwhile his three companions had cleared the wall of its defenders, and leapt down to help their king. Abreus fell slain by a dart. Then Alexander himself received a wound in the breast. For a space he stood and fought, but at last sank on his shield, fainting through loss of blood. Peocestus stood over him with the holy shield of Troy. Leonatus guarded him on the other side until rescue came. Having no ladders, the Macedonians had driven pegs into the wall, and a few had clambered up as best they could and flung themselves down into the fray. Some of these succeeded in opening one of the gates, and then the fort was taken. No man, woman, or child in the place was spared by the infuriated soldiers, who thought that their king was dead. But though the wound was grave, Alexander recovered. The rumor of his death reached the camp where the main army was waiting at the junction of the Ravi with the Shanab, and it produced deep consternation and despair. Reassuring letters were not believed, so Alexander caused himself to be carried to the banks of the Ravi and conveyed by water down to the camp. When he drew near, the canopy which sheltered his bed in the stern of the vessel was removed. The soldiers, still doubting, thought it was his corpse they saw, until the bark drew close to the bank and he waved his hand. Then the host shouted for joy. When he was carried ashore, he was lifted for a moment on horseback, that he might be better seen by all, and then he walked a few steps for their greater reassurance. This adventure is an extreme case of Alexander's besetting weakness which has been illustrated in many others of his actions. In the excitement of battle, amid the ring of arms, he was apt to forget his duties as a leader. Though one of the most consummate generals that the world has seen, he took a far keener delight in fighting in the thickest of the fray, or heading a charge of cavalry, than in maneuvering an army or contriving strategical operations. His eyes and ears were ever filled with the brilliance of battle, the bloom and the beauty, and the splendor of spears. He could not resist the temptations of danger, and he hardly conducted a single campaign in which he had not been wounded. Of the last and most flagrant occasion, when some of his intimate friends upbraided him for acting as a soldier instead of acting as a general, he was deeply hurt, for his conscience pricked him. To have endangered his own safety was a crime against the whole army. The Mali made a complete submission, and their example was followed by the Oxidraces their southern neighbors, who were also renowned for their warlike character. These lower parts of the Punjab were not added to the dominion of Porus, but were placed in direct dependence on the satrapy which had been committed to Philip. When Alexander had recovered from his wound, the fleet sailed downward, past the junction of the Hyphasis, and the Indian tribes submitted, presenting to the conqueror the characteristic products of India, gems, fine draperies, tame lions and tigers, at the place where the united stream of the four lesser rivers joins the mighty flow of the Indus, the foundations were laid of a new Alexandria, to be the great trade center between the Punjab and the territory of the lower Indus, and to be the bulwark of the southern frontier of the province of Philip. The next stage of the southward advance was the capital town of the Sagdi, which lay upon the river. Alexander refounded it as a Greek colony and built wharfs. It was known as the Sagdi and Alexandria, and was destined to be the residence of a southern satrapy, which was to extend to the seacoast. This province was committed to Peathon, the son of Agenor. The principalities of the rich and populous land of the Sindh were distinguished from the states of the north by the great political power enjoyed by the Brahmins. Under the influence of this caste, which was vehemently opposed to the intrusion of the outlanders, the princes either defied Alexander, or, if they submitted at first, speedily rebelled. The spring was spent in reducing these regions, and it was nearly midsummer when the king reached Patala at the vertex of the Indus Delta. On the tidings of an insurrection in Aracosia, he had dispatched Craterus with a considerable portion of the army to march through the Bolan Pass into southern Afghanistan and to put down the revolt. Alexander himself designed to march through Baluchistan, and Craterus was ordered to meet him in Kirman near the entrance of the Persian Gulf. Another division of the host was to go by sea to the mouth of the Tigris. The king fixed upon Patala to be for the Indian Empire what the most famous of his Alexandrias was for Egypt. 
he charged Hephaestion with the task of fortifying the citadel and building an ample harbor. Then he sailed southward himself to visit the southern ocean. It was the season at which the monsoons blow from the southwest, and the Macedonians, accustomed to the tideless Midland Sea, were at first sorely perplexed by the ebb and flow of the oceanic tide, at this time especially high and violent in the main arm of the river. Several ships were lost, but the sailors soon mastered the secret of the times and tides, and Alexander fared out into the open sea. He sacrificed to Poseidon. He poured drink offerings from a golden cup to the Nereids and Dioscori, and to Thetis, the mother of his ancestor Achilles, and then hurled the cup into the waves. This ceremony inaugurated his plan of opening a seaway for commerce between the West and the Far East. The enterprise of discovering this seaway was entrusted to Nearchus, an officer who was an intimate companion of his own and possessed the confidence of the troops. Alexander started on his land march in the early autumn, but Nearchus and the fleet were to wait until October in order to be helped forward by the eastern monsoons. End of chapter 18, part 2「Chapter 18, Parts 3, 4, and 5 of A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 2, by John Bagnall Bury. Chapter 18, Parts 3, 4, and 5 Part 3, Alexander's Return to Babylon No enterprise of Alexander was so useless, and none so fatal, as the journey through the desert of Gedrosia, the land which is now known as the Mekron. Of the inhospitable character of the country he must have had general information, but he had no idea of the hardships and terrors of the march which awaited him. His guiding motive in choosing this route was to make provisions for the safety of the fleet, to dig wells and store food at certain places along the coast. He also had in view the subjugation of the Oetai, a hardy, warlike people who dwelled in the mountains on the eastern limit of the wilderness. But if it had been only a matter of subduing the Oetais, this could easily have been accomplished by an expedition from Patala. The march through the Mequon and the voyage of Nearchus were interdependent parts of the same adventure, and so timid were the mariners of those days that the voyage into unknown waters seemed far more formidable than the journey through the waste. With perhaps thirty thousand men, Alexander passed the mountain wall which protects the Indus Delta, and crossing the river Arbis, he reduced the Oritai to subjection. He chose their chief village Rambachia for the foundation of a colony, the Oritai Alexandria. It was important to have stations on his projected ocean route. Then he descended into the waste of Gedrosia. No resistance met him here, for there was no folk to resent his intrusion, only a few miserable villages in the hills, or more miserable fishing hamlets on the coast. The army moved painfully through the desert of rocks and sand, waterless and barren, and part of the scanty provisions that the foragers obtained had to be stored on the shore for the coming of the fleet. It was often almost impossible to step through the deep sinking sand. The pitiless heat rendered night marches necessary, and those marches were frequently of undue length, owing to the need of reaching a spring of water. Alexander himself is said to have trudged on foot and shared all the hardships of the way. It was doubtless the non-combatants and camp followers who suffered most. At length the waste was crossed, and leaving the coast regions, the remnant of the army marched north to Pura, the residence of the satrapy of Gedrosia. It is said that the survivors, exhausted and dishevelled, were the smaller part of the army which had set forth from India two months before, and the losses of that terrible Gedrosian journey exceeded the losses of all Alexander's campaigns. But this is probably a heightened statement of the calamities of the march. Having rested at Pura, the king proceeded to Kerman, where he was joined by Craterus, who had suppressed the revolt in Aracosia. Presently news arrived that the fleet had reached the Kerman coast, 
and soon Nearchus arrived at the camp and relieved Alexander's anxiety. He too had a tale to tell of hardships and perils. The hostile attitude of the Indians, when Alexander's back was turned, had forced him to start a month before the season of the east winds, and contrary south winds kept him for twenty-four days in a haven at some distance to the west of the delta. Then a storm wrecked three of his ships near Kokala. During the rest of their voyage the seafarers were sore bestead by want of sweet water and provisions, but the king was overjoyed that they had arrived at all. Nearchus was dismissed to complete the voyage by sailing up the Persian Gulf on the Passer Tigris River to Susa. Hephaestion was sent to make his way thither along the coast, while Alexander himself marched through the hills by Persepolis and Pasargadae. It was high time for Alexander to return. There was hardly a satrap, Persian or Macedonian, in any land who had not oppressed his province by violence and rapacity, and some, in the expectation that the king would never come back from the far east, had formed plots for establishing independent principalities in Kerman, in Persis, and at Susa. The most pressing business of the king was to re-establish his authority by punishing without favour or mercy the governors and officers who were found guilty of treason and oppression. Many satraps were deposed or put to death. Atropates of Media was one of the few who had been faithful to his charge. But the military garrison of Media had not behaved so well, and none of Alexander's dooms at this juncture was more effective than the execution of two officers and six hundred soldiers for having plundered the temples and sepulchres of that province. Of all evil deeds, that perhaps which most vexed the king was the opening and plundering of the sepulchre of Cyrus at Pasargadae. It was more than a common sacrilege. It was an outrage against the majesty of kings. He tortured the Magians who were the guardians of the tomb, but did not discover the author of the outrage. One guilty minister fled at Alexander's approach. This was the treasurer Harpalus, who had once before been untrue to his charge, but had been forgiven and entrusted with the royal treasures of Persia. He squandered his master's money in riotous living at Babylon, and as the news of these scandals reached Alexander in India, he deemed it prudent to move westward. Taking a large sum of money, he went to Kilikia, and hiring a bodyguard of six thousand mercenaries, he lived in royal state at Tarsus with Glycera, an Athenian courtesan. On Alexander's return, Tarsus was not safe, and he fled to Greece, where we shall meet him presently. Having punished with a stern hand the misrule of his satraps, Macedonian and Persian alike, Alexander began to carry out schemes which he had formed for breaking down the barrier which divides the east from the west. He had unbarred and unveiled the Orient to the knowledge and commerce of these Mediterranean peoples. But his aim was to do much more than this. It was no less than to fuse Asia and Europe in, into a homogeneous unity. He devised various means for compassing this object. He proposed to transplant Greeks and Macedonians into Asia, and Asiatics into Europe, as permanent settlers. This plan had indeed been partly realized by the foundation of his numerous mixed cities in the Far East. The second means was the promotion of intermarriages between Persians and Macedonians, and this policy was inaugurated in magnificent fashion at Susa. The king himself espoused Statira, the daughter of Darius. His friend Hephaestion took her sister, and a large number of Macedonian officers wedded the daughters of Persian grandees. The nuptials were celebrated on the same day and according to the Persian fashion. Alexander is said to have feasted nine thousand guests. Of the general mass of the Macedonians, ten thousand are said to have followed the example of their officers and taken Asiatic wives. All those were liberally rewarded by Alexander. He looked forward to the offspring of these unions as a potent instrument for the further fusing of the races. It is to be noticed that Alexander, already wedded to the princess of Sogdiana, adopted the polygamous custom of Persia, and he even married another royal lady, Parisatis, daughter of Ochus. These marriages were purely dictated by policy. They were meant as an example, for Alexander never came under the influence of women. The bridles of Susa were a lesson in political marriages on a vast scale. But the most effective means for bringing the two races together was the institution of military service on a perfect equality. With this purpose in view, Alexander, not long after the death of Darius, 
had arranged that in all the eastern provinces the native youth should be drilled and disciplined in Macedonian fashion and taught how to use the Macedonian weapons. In fact, Hellenic military schools were established in every province, and at the end of five years an army of 30,000 Hellenized barbarians was at the great king's disposition. At his summons this army gathered at Susa, and its arrival created a natural, though unreasonable, feeling of discontent among the Macedonians, who divined that Alexander aimed at making himself independent of their services. His schemes for transforming the character of his army were also indicated by the enlistment of Persians, Bactrians, Arians, and other Orientals in the Macedonian cavalry regiments, and the enrolling of nine distinguished Persians in the royal Agema itself. The general dissatisfaction was not allayed by the king's liberality in defraying all the debts of the soldiers, amounting perhaps to two millions. Alexander left Susa for Ecbatana in spring. He sailed down the river Passa Tigris to the Persian Gulf, surveyed part of the coast, and sailed up the Tigris, removing the weirs which the Persians had constructed to hinder navigation. The army joined him on the way, and he halted at Opis. Here he held an assembly of the Macedonians and formally discharged all those, about ten thousand in number, whose old age or wounds had rendered unfit for warfare, promising to make them comfortable for life. He fondly thought that his words would be welcomed with delight, but he was disappointed. The smouldering discontent found a voice now. The cry was raised, Discharge us all, and some tauntedly added, Go and conquer with your father Ammon. The king may well have been taken aback. The men who on the banks of the Hephaestus had declared themselves worn out with war and toil and sick with yearning for their homes, were now indignant when he honourably discharged their veterans. Alexander leapt down from the platform into the shouting throng. He pointed out thirteen of the most forward rioters, and bade his herpaspists seize them and put them to death. The rest were cowed. Amid a deep silence the king remounted the platform, and in a bitter speech he discharged the whole army. Then he retired into his palace, and on the third day summoned the Persian and Median nobles, and appointed them to posts of honour and trust which had hitherto been built by Macedonians. The names of the Macedonian regiments were transferred to the new barbarian army. When they heard this, the Macedonians, who still lingered in their quarters, miserable and uncertain whether to go or stay, appeared before the gates of the palace. They laid down their arms submissively, and implored admission to the king's presence. Alexander came out, and there was a tearful reconciliation, which was sealed by sacrifice and feasts. This dramatic incident possesses no historical importance like the action of the troops on the Hephaestus, and it is only significant in so far as it marks the last futile explosion of Macedonian sentiment against the liberal policy of the king, the final protest of men who knew they would have to acquiesce in a new order of things. The veterans started for home under the leadership of Craterus and Polyperchon. They left behind the children whom Asiatic women had borne to them, the king promising to bring them up in Macedonian fashion. Craterus was to supersede Antipater as regent of Macedonia, and Antipater was to come out to Asia with a fresh supply of troops. This arrangement was desirable, on account of the estranged relations which existed between Antipater and the Queen Mother, whose letters to Alexander were always teeming with mutual accusations. The summer and the early winter were spent at the Median capital. Here a sorrow, the greatest that could befall him, befell Alexander. Three thousand professional players, or Dionysiac artists, as they were called, had arrived from Greece, and Ecbatana was festive with revels and dramatic exhibitions. In the midst of this gaiety, Hephaestus fell ill, languished for seven days, and died. Alexander was plunged into despair at losing the friend of his bosom, he fasted three days, and the whole empire went into mourning. It is said that he crucified the miserable physician whose skill had been found wanting. Inconsolable the lonely monarch might well be. He could have other boon companions, other faithful counsellors and devoted servants. But he knew that he would never find another to whom he would simply be, my friend Alexander, and not, my lord the king. The body was sent to Babylon to be burned. Ten thousand talents were set apart for a funeral of unsurpassed magnificence. Alexander set out for Babylon towards the end of the year, and on his way he enjoyed the excitement of hunting down the Cosseans, a hill folk of Luristan, who made brigandage their trade. The slaughter of these robbers, who were chased to their mountain nests, 
was described as an offering to the spirit of Hephaestion. As Alexander advanced to Babylon, ambassadors from far lands came to his camp. The Brutians, Lucanians, and Etruscans, the Carthaginians and the Phoenician colonies of Spain, Celts, Scythians of the Black Sea, Libyans and Ethiopians had all sent envoys to court the friendship of the monarch who seemed already to be lord of half the earth. A feeling of dread was beginning to quiver faintly through the western world that the conqueror of the east would presently turn the path of his progress to the west. Carthage might feel a tremor lest he should come against her as the champion of Hellenic Sicily and do unto her what he had done to the elder Tyre. But from the city of Italy, which was destined to destroy the power of Carthage and become the partial inheritor of Alexander's empire, no ambassador came. When Alexander approached within sight of Babylon, he was met by a deputation of priestly stargazers who counselled him not to enter the city, for their god Bel had revealed to them that it would not be for his profit. He replied to the Chaldeans with a verse of Euripides, The best seer he who guesseth well, and entered at the head of his army. One of his first cares was to take measures for the rebuilding of the temple of Bel, unduly retarded by the willful neglect of the Chaldean priests, who were unwilling to appropriate their revenues for the purpose. It had been thought that their attempt to divert the king from entering Babylon may have had a motive connected with their negligence. Section 4. Preparations for an Arabian Expedition. Alexander's Death. Ever since the successful voyage of Nearchus, the brain of Alexander was filled with maritime enterprises. He was bent on the exploration of the northern and the southern oceans. He had already sent Heraclides and a company of shipwrights to the Hyrcanian mountains to cut wood in the forests and build a fleet to navigate the Caspian Sea and discover its supposed communication with the eastern ocean. But his more immediate and serious enterprise was the circumnavigation and conquest of Arabia. His eastern empire was not complete so long as this peninsula lay outside it. He knew of the rich spice lands of Arabia Felix, but he had no conception of the vast extent of the desert which renders a land invasion so difficult and so unremunerative. The possession of this country of sand, however, was not his main object. It was only an incident in the grand range of his plans. His visit to India and the voyage of Nearchus had given him new ideas. He had risen to the conception of making the Southern Ocean another great commercial sea like the Mediterranean. He proposed to make the seaboard of the Persian Gulf a second Phoenicia, and he sent to the Syrian coast for seamen to colonize the shores of the mainland and the islands. He hoped to establish a regular trade route from the Indus to the Tigris and the Euphrates, and thence to the canals which connected the Nile with the Red Sea. If he had lived to accomplish this, he might have renewed the project of King Necho and hewn a welterway through the neck of the sewers. Mighty Babylon would then be in close connection with the new oceanic trade. Argosies from Alexandria or Patala could, could sail into her wharves. Alexander destined Babylon to be the capital of his empire, and doubtless it was a wise choice. But its character was now to be transformed. It was to become a naval station and a centre of maritime commerce. Alexander set about the digging of a great harbour, with room for a thousand keels, and designed the buildings of shipsteads. The fleet of Nearchus sailed up the Euphrates and met the king at Babylon, but this fleet was not sufficient for the approaching enterprise. Orders had been sent to Phoenicia for the building of new warships. Twelve triremes, three quadriremes, four quinquiremes, and thirty of the smaller thirty-oared barks. These were constructed in pieces, conveyed overland to Thapsacus on Euphrates, and there put together. Other ships, of cypress wood, were also built in Babylonia. The expedition was to set forth in the summer, and the king occupied part of the intervening time in a voyage down the Euphrates to visit the Palacopas Canal. The snows of winter, melting in the late springtide on the north slopes of the Armenian mountains, used to swell the waters of the Euphrates and force it to overflow its banks in the Babylonian plain. About ninety miles below Babylon a canal had been dug to drain the superfluous waters into the marshes which stretched for leagues and leagues southwestward. In the autumn the canal was closed by a sluice to prevent the water leaving its bed. But the sluice was out of working order, and Alexander devised a better place, 
connecting the canal with the river at a different point. He sailed up the canal, lost his way for a while among the swamps, and selected a new site for a new city, whose building was immediately begun. We may guess that the city was meant to be the first of a string of fortresses stretching across the desert from Babylonia to the Red Sea. On his return to Babylon, he found some new western troops which had arrived from Caria and Lydia, and a body of twenty thousand Persians who had been recruited by Pucestus. He proceeded to carry out a sweeping military reform, at which his mind must have been working for some time past. It was nothing less than a complete transformation of his father's phalanx, in fact, of the Hellenic hoplity system. Alexander had done much with the well-drilled phalanx, but his experience had taught him that it was far from being the ideal infantry. The advantages of its sheer weight and solid strength were more than counterbalanced by its want of mobility. Alexander invented a means of increasing the mobility with as little as possible diminution of the weight. He inserted the fresh body of 20,000 Persians into the Macedonian phalanx in the following way. The old depth of the file, namely 16 men, was retained, but of these only four were Macedonian pikemen the men of the first three ranks and the hindmost man of all. The twelve intervening places, the fourth to the fifteenth ranks, were filled by Persians lightly armed with their native bows and javelins. This new phalanx required a new kind of tactics, which must have consisted in opening out the ranks, so as to allow the archers and javelin men to deploy into their intervals and discharge their missiles, and then closing up again, in order to advance in a serried mass, each file bristling with three, no longer with five spear-points. It was a thoroughly original idea, this combination of heavy and light troops into a tactical unity, but it would need all the skill of the great master to bring it to perfection. The strange thing is to find Alexander introducing this new system, which implied a complete change in the drill, on the very eve of his setting forth on the Arabian expedition. We are tempted to think that he had already made experiments, perhaps with that army of 30,000 Orientals, drilled in Macedonian fashion, which had come to him at Susa. The tactical reform had also its political bearings. It was another step in the direction of fusing the Macedonian and Persian together, and marrying Europe with Asia. There was one thing, very near to the king's heart, still to be accomplished before he set out, the funeral of Hephaestion. The oracle of Ammon had been consulted touching the honours which should be paid to the dead man, and had ordained that he might be honoured as a hero. In accordance therewith, Alexander ordered that chapels should be erected to Hephaestion in Egyptian Alexandria and other cities. Never were obsequies so magnificent as those which were held at Babylon. The funeral pyre, splendidly decked with offerings, towered to the height of two hundred feet. All was in readiness at length for the expedition to the south. On a day in early June, a royal banquet was given in honour of Nearchus and his seamen, shortly about to start on their oceanic voyage. As Alexander was retiring to his chamber at a late hour, a friend named Medius carried him off to spend the rest of the night in a bout of hard drinking. On the morrow he slept long. In the evening he dined with Medius, and another carousal followed. After a bath and a meal in the early hours of the morning, he fell into a feverish sleep. On awakening, he insisted upon preparing the daily sacrifices according to his wont, but the fever was still on him. He could not walk, and was carried to the altar on a couch. He spent the day in bed, actively engaged with Nearchus in discussing the expedition, which he fixed for four days hence. In the cool of the evening he was conveyed to the river and rowed across to a garden villa at the other side. For six days he lay here in high fever, but regularly performing the sacrifices, and daily perforce deferring the departure of the expedition for another and yet another day. Then his condition grew worse, and he was carried back to the palace, where he won a little sleep, but the fever did not abate. When his officers came to him they found him speechless. The disease became more violent and a rumour spread among the Macedonian soldiers that Alexander was dead. They rushed clamouring to the door of the palace, and the bodyguards were forced to admit them. One by one they filed past the bed of their young king, but he could not speak to them. He could only greet each by slightly raising his head and signing with his eyes. 
Pucestus and some others of the companions passed the night in the temple of Serapis, and asked the god whether they should convey the sick man into the temple, if haply he might be cured there by divine help. A voice warned them not to bring him, but to let him remain where he lay. He died on a June evening, before the thirty-third year of his age was fully told. Such is the punctilious and authentic account of the last illness of Alexander, as it was recorded in the court diary. But it is not sufficient to enable us to discover the precise nature of the fatal disease. The untimely deaths of sovereigns at particular junctures have often exercised an appreciable influence on the course of events. But no such accident has diverted the paths of history so manifestly and utterly as the death of Alexander. Twelve years had sufficed him to conquer Western Asia, and to leave an impress upon it which centuries would not obliterate, and yet his work had only been begun. Many plans for the political transformation of his Asiatic empire had been initiated, plans which reveal his originality of conception, his breadth of grasp, his firm hold of facts, his faculty for organization, his wonderful brain power. But all these schemes and lines of policy needed still many years of development under the master's shaping and guiding hand. The unity of the realm, which was an essential part of Alexander's conception, disappeared upon his death. The empire was broken up among a number of hard-headed Macedonians, capable and practical rulers, but without the higher qualities of the founder's genius. They maintained the tolerant Hellenism which he had initiated, his lessons had not been lost upon them, and thus his work was not futile. The toils of even those twelve marvellous years smoothed the path for Roman sway in the east, and prepared the ground for the spread of an universal religion. It is impossible to write the history of Alexander so as to produce a true impression of his work, because in the records which we have, the general and soldier fills the whole stage, and the statesman is, as it were, hustled out. The details of administrative organization are lost amidst the sounding of trumpets and the clashing of spears. But it is the details of administration and political organization which the historical inquirer craves to know and especially the constitution of the various new-founded cities in the Far East, those novel experiments which set the Macedonian, Greek, and Oriental inhabitants side by side. By their silence on these matters, the companions of Alexander, who wrote memoirs about him, unwittingly did him a wrong, and thence there has largely prevailed an unjust notion that he only knew and only cared how to conquer. It is hardly open to question that this brilliant lord of well-trained myriads would have advanced to the conquest of the West, nor can we affect to doubt that, succeeding where one of his successors failed, he would have annexed Sicily and the great Hellas, conquered Carthage, and overrun the Italian peninsula. To apprehend what his death meant for Europe, we need not travel farther in our speculations. To the Indies he would certainly have returned and carried out with fresh troops that project of visiting the valley of the Ganges which had been frustrated by his weary army. As it was, he had left no lasting impression upon Indian civilization and his successors soon abandoned their hold upon the Punjab. It is needless to add that if Alexander had lived another quarter of a century, he would have widened the limits of geographical knowledge. The true nature of the Caspian Sea would have been determined, the southern extent of the Indian peninsula would have been discovered, and an attempt would have been made to repeat the Phoenician circumnavigation of Africa. Nor could Alexander have failed, in his advanced position on the Jaxartes, to have learned some facts about the vast extension of the Asiatic continent to the east and north, and the curiosities of Chinese civilization. His sudden death was no freak of fate or fortune. It was a natural consequence of his character and deeds. Into thirteen years he had compressed the energies of many lifetimes. If he had been content with the duties of a general and a statesman, laborious and wearing though those duties would have been both to body and to brain, his singularly strong constitution would probably have lasted him for many a long year. But the very qualities of his brilliant temper which most endeared him to his fellows, a warrior's valour and a love of good fellowship, were ruinous to his health. He was covered with scars, and he had probably never recovered from that terrible wound which had been the price of his escapade at Multan. Sparing of himself neither in battle nor at the symposium, he was doomed to die young. Section 5. Greece under Macedonia. The tide of the world's history swept us away from the shores of Greece, and, borne breathlessly along from conquest to conquest in the triumphant train of the Macedonian, we could not pause to see what was happening in the little states which were looking with mixed emotions at the spectacle of their own civilization making its way over the earth. 
Alexander's victory at the gates of Issus and his ensuing supremacy by sea had taught many of the Greeks the lesson of caution. The confederacy of the Isthmus had sent congratulations and a golden crown to the conqueror, and when, a twelve month later, the Spartan king Aegis, a resolute man without any military ability, renewed the war against Macedonia, he got no help or countenance outside the Peloponnesus. Some hot spirits at Athens proposed to support the movement, but the people were discreetly restrained not only by Phocion and Demades, but by Demosthenes himself. Aegis induced the Arcadians, except Megalopolis, the Achaeans, except Pellini and the Eleans, to join him, and having mercenary troops besides, he got together a considerable army. It was easy to gain a few successes before the regent of Macedonia, then occupied with a rising in Thrace, had time to descend upon the Peloponnesus. The chief object of the Allies was to capture Megalopolis, and the federal capital of Arcadia was in the strange position of being besieged by the Arcadian federates. Antipater, as soon as the situation in Thrace set him free, marched southward to the relief of Megalopolis, and easily crushed the Allies in a battle fought hard by. Aegis fell fighting, and there was no further resistance. Sparta sent up hostages to Alexander, who accorded the conquered Greeks easy terms. So long as Darius lived, many of the Greeks cherished secret hopes that that fortune might yet turn against Alexander, and maintained clandestine intrigues with Persia. But on the news of his death such hopes expired, and tranquillity prevailed in Hellas. It was not till Alexander's return from India that anything happened to trouble the peace, and in the meantime Greece was experiencing a relief which she had needed for two generations. A field had been opened to her superfluous children, who were pouring by thousands or rather tens of thousands, into Asia, to find careers, if not permanent homes. For Athens, the twelve years between the fall of Thebes and the death of Alexander were an interval of singular well-being. The conduct of public affairs was in the hands of the two most honourable statesmen of the day, Phocion and Lycurgus. Supported by the orator Demades, Phocion was able to dissuade the people from embarking in any foolhardy enterprises, and Demosthenes was sufficiently clear-sighted not to embarrass, but when needful to support the policy of peace. Phocion probably did not grudge him the signal triumph which he won over his old rival, Aeschines, for this triumph had only a personal and not a political significance. Shortly before Philip's death, Ctesiphon had proposed to honour Demosthenes, both for his general services to the state and especially for his liberality in contributing from his private purse towards the repair of the city walls, by crowning him publicly in the theatre with a crown of gold. The council had passed a resolution to this effect, but Eschines lodged an accusation against the proposer, whose motion technically exposed him to the graphi paranomon, and consequently the council's resolution was not brought before the people. The matter remained in abeyance for about six years, neither party venturing to bring it to an issue, as Chines by following up his indictment of Ctesiphon by forcing him to bring it into court. The collapse of the attempt of Aegis to defy Macedonia probably encouraged Eschines to face his rival at last. In a speech of the highest ability, Eschines reviewed the public career of Demosthenes to prove that he was a traitor and responsible for all the disasters of Athens. The reply of Demosthenes, a masterpiece of splendid oratory, captivated the judges, and Aeschines, not winning one-fifth part of their votes, left Athens and disappeared from politics. It is not unfair to say that it was Demosthenes the orator, not Demosthenes the statesman, who convinced the Athenian judges. Apart from his speech on the crown, which has been described as the funeral oration on Greek freedom, Demosthenes fell almost silent during these years. He saw that public action on his part would be useless, but perhaps he worked underground. In these two speeches, in the matter of the crown, the most interesting passage is where Aeschines reflects on the changes which had recently come to pass over the face of the earth. We want to know what the Greeks thought of these startling changes, what they felt as they saw the fashion of the world passing, and the things which had seemed of great weight and worth in Hellas becoming of small account. Aeschines thus utters their surprise. All manner of strange events, utterly unforeseen, have befallen in our lifetime. Our extraordinary experiences will seem to those who come after us like a curious tale of marvels. The king of the Persians, who dug the canal through Athos, who bridged the Hellespont, who demanded earth and water from the Greeks, who dared in his letters to declare, 
I am the Lord of all the world from the rising to the setting of the sun, is at this moment struggling not for dominion over other men, but to save his own life and limb. Thebes, even Thebes our neighbour, has been snatched in the space of a single day, out of the midst of Hellas, justly, for her policy was false. But assuredly she was rather blinded by a heaven-sent infatuation than misled by human perversity. And the poor Lacedaemonians, who once lifted themselves up to be leaders of the Greeks, must now go up to Alexander as hostages and throw themselves upon the mercy of the potentate whom they wronged. Our own city, once the asylum of the Greek world, whither all men looked for help, has now ceased to strive for the leadership of the Greeks, for the very ground of her home is in danger. The Macedonian Empire had not yet lasted long enough to turn the traffic of the Mediterranean into new channels, and Athens still enjoyed great commercial prosperity. She sent a colony to some unknown place on the Hadriatic seaboard to be a base of protection against the Etruscan rovers, the big menacing eyes of whose pirate crafts were a constant terror to traders in those seas and although peace was her professed policy, she did not neglect to make provision for war, in case a favourable opportunity should come round, in the revolution of circumstance, for regaining her sovereignty on sea. Money was spent on the navy, which is said to have been increased to well nigh four hundred galleys, and on new ship-sheds. The handsome marble storehouse for the hanging ship-gear, designed by the architect Philo, was completed at the harbour of Zea. It was expressly provided that the cases which lined the walls and pillars of the cool triple-isled arcade should be open, in order that those who pass through may be able to see all the gear that is in the gear store. The man who was mainly responsible for this naval expenditure was Lycurgus. It is significant of the spirit of Athens at this time that while Phocion and Demades were the most influential men in the assembly, the finances were in the charge of a statesman who had been so signally hostile to Macedonia that Alexander had demanded his surrender. In recent years considerable changes had been made in the constitution of the financial offices. Eubulus had administered as the president of the Theoric Fund, but now we find the control of the expenditure in the hands of a minister of the public revenue, who was elected by the people and held office for four years, from one Panatheniac festival to another. Lycurgus was entrusted with this post for twelve years. For the first period in his own name, for the two succeeding periods, his activity was cloaked under the names of his son and another nominal minister. He acted, of course, in conjunction with the council, but the influence of the more permanent and experienced minister upon that annual body was inevitably very great. The new system, it is evident, was a distinct improvement on the old. It was much better that the administration of the revenue should be managed by one competent statesman, unhampered by colleagues, and that his tenure of office should not be limited to a year. The post practically included the functions of a minister of public works, and the ministry of Lycurgus was distinguished by building enterprises. He constructed the Panatheniac Stadion on the southern bank of the Ilissus. He rebuilt the Lycian Gymnasium, where in these years the philosopher Aristotle used to take his morning and evening walks, teaching his peripatetic disciples. It lay somewhere to the east of the city, under Mount Lycabetus. But the most memorable work of Lycurgus was the reconstruction of the theatre of Dionysus. It was he who built the rows of marble benches, climbing up the steep side of the Acropolis as we see them today, and his original stage buildings can be distinguished amidst the ruins from the mass of later additions and improvements. He canonized, as it were, the three great tragic poets, Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides, by setting up their statues in the theatre and by carrying a measure that, that copies of their work should be officially prepared and preserved by the state. In connection with the prosperity of Athens and her large public outlay, it is important to observe that the silver mines of Laurium, which had been closed when the Spartans occupied Decelea and had been neglected, for want of capital and enterprise, throughout the whole first half of the fourth century, had been reopened and were working vigorously. They seem to have been managed largely on a new principle, namely by private companies. The historian Xenophon had written a pamphlet on the subject of the mines as a neglected source of revenue, and it would be interesting to know whether the revival of the industry is to be ascribed directly or indirectly to the influence of its exhortations. No sign of the times which followed the defeat of Chaeronea is more striking than the framing of a new system for drilling the young burghers of Athens in the duties of military life. The training began when the youth, having completed his eighteenth year, came of age and was enrolled in the register of his deem and it lasted for two years. 
During these two years the young citizen was known as an ephibos, and might not appear either as a prosecutor or defendant in the law courts except for a few cases expressly specified. The general supervision over all the Attic ephibi was committed to a marshal, Cosmites, who was elected by the Athenian assembly, and under him were ten masters of discipline, Sophronistae, one for each tribe. The institution had a religious consecration. The first act in the service of the Ephibi was solemnly to go round the temples under the conduct of the masters. Then they served for a year on duty in the guardhouses at Munichia and along the coast, receiving regular military instruction from special drill masters who trained them in the exercises of the hoplites and taught them how to shoot with bow and javelin and to handle artillery. The Ephibi at each tribe ate together at barrack messes which were managed by the masters of discipline. At the end of the first year, they appeared before an assembly in the theatre, and when they had made a public display of their proficiency in the art of warfare, each received from the city a shield and a spear. The second year was spent in patrolling the frontiers of the land and guarding the prisons. The garrison and patrol duties had always devolved upon the young men of Attica, but they were now organized into a new and thorough scheme of discipline. A mild Attic approach to the stern system of Sparta, it almost strikes one as a conscious effort to arrest the decline of the citizen army in the face of the encroachments of the mercenary system. The Ephibi, in their characteristic dress, the dark mantle and broad-brimmed hat, are a graceful feature of Athenian life and art from this time forward. It is significant that the whole revival, stimulated by the disaster of Chaeronea, was marked by a religious character. Lycurgus, who belonged to the priestly family of the Aetiobutads, was a sincerely pious man, and impressed upon his administration the stamp of his own devotion. Never for a hundred years had there been seen at Athens such a manifestation of zealous public concern for the worship of the gods. The two chief monuments of the Lycurgan epoch, the Panathenaic Stadion and the Theatre of Dionysus, were, it must always be remembered, religious, not secular buildings. Thus Athens discreetly attended to her material well-being, and courted the favour of the gods, and the only distress which befell her was the dearth of corn. But on the return of Alexander to Susa, two things happened which imperiled the tranquillity of Greece. Alexander promised the Greek exiles, there were more than twenty thousand of them, to procure their return to their native cities. He sent Nicanor to the great congregation of Hellas at the Olympian festival, to order the states to receive back their banished citizens. A general reconciliation of parties was a just and politic measure, but it could be objected that, by the terms of the Confederation of Corinth, the Macedonian king had no power to dictate orders to the confederates in the management of the domestic affairs. Only two states objected, Athens and Aetolia, and they objected because, if the edict were enforced, they would be robbed of ill-gotten gains. The Aetolians had possessed themselves of Oenidae and driven out its Acarnian owners. By Alexander's edict, the rightful inhabitants would now return to their own city and the intruders be dislodged. The position of Athens in Samos was similar. The Samians would now be restored to their own lands and the Athenian settlers would have to go. Both Athens and Aetolia were prepared to resist. Another desire was expressed by Alexander at the same time, which was readily acquiesced in. He demanded that the Greeks should recognize his divinity. Sparta is reported to have replied indifferently. We allow Alexander to call himself a god, if he likes. There was not a sensible man at Athens who would have thought of objecting. Even the bitterest patriots would have allowed him to be the son of Zeus or Poseidon, or whomever he chose. If the Greeks of Corinth looked up to Alexander as their chieftain and protector, and this was actually their position in regard to him, there was no incongruity in the idea of officially acknowledging his divinity. Ever since the days in which an Homeric king was honoured as a god by the people, there was nothing offensive or outlandish to a Greek ear in predicating godhood of a revered sovereign or master. Divine honours had been paid to Lysander, and the Greeks, in complying with Alexander's desire, did not commit themselves more than the pupil of the academy who erected an altar to his master Plato. End of chapter 18, part 3, 4 and 5「Chapter 18, Parts 6 and 7 of A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 2, by John Bagnall Bury. Chapter 18, Part 6. Section 6. The Episode of Harpalus and the Greek Revolt. Meanwhile, an incident had happened which might induce some of the patriots to hope that Alexander's empire rested on slippery foundations. Harpalus had arrived off the coast of Attica with five thousand talents, a body of mercenaries, and thirty ships. He had come to excite a revolt against his master. A gift of corn had formerly secured him the citizenship of Athens, but the Athenians prudently refused to harbour him, coming in this guise. He sailed away to Cape Toneron, always a refuge of adventurers, and leaving his men and ships there, returned to Athens with a sum of about seven hundred talents. He was now received, since he did not come with an armed array, but after a while messages arrived both from Macedonia and from Philoxenus, Alexander's financial minister in Western Asia, demanding his surrender. It would have been an act of war to protect the runaway treasurer and his stolen monies, but the Athenians, on the proposal of Demosthenes, adopted a clever device. They arrested Harpalus, seizing his treasure, and said that they would surrender him to officers expressly sent by Alexander, but declined to give him up to Philoxenus or Antipater. It was not long before Harpalus escaped. He returned to Tenaron, and was shortly afterwards murdered by one of his fellow adventurers. The stolen money was deposited in the Acropolis, under the charge of specially appointed commissioners, of whom Demosthenes was one. It was known by report that the sum was about seven hundred talents, but Demosthenes and his fellows had strangely admitted to make any official entry or report of the amount. Suddenly it was discovered that only three hundred and fifty talents were actually in the Acropolis. Charges immediately circulated against the influential politicians that the other three hundred and fifty talents had been received in bribes by them before the money was deposited in the citadel. Men of opposite sides were suspected, Demades, for example, as well as Demosthenes. But apart from the suspicion of bribery, manifest blame rested upon Demosthenes for having grossly neglected his duty. He was responsible for the custody of the treasure, for which Athens was responsible to Alexander. He was bound to demand an investigation, and on his motion the people directed the council of Areopagus to hold an inquiry. Philoxenus furnished the account-book of Harpalus, which had come into his hands. By this evidence it was proved that seven hundred talents had been delivered for safekeeping in the Acropolis. The entries seized at this point. It was also shown that certain Athenians had previously been bribed, but Demosthenes was not among them. Other evidence was necessary to show how the missing half of the seven hundred talents had disappeared. We know not what this evidence was, but the court of Areopagus satisfied themselves that a number of leading statesmen had received considerable sums. Demosthenes appeared in their report as the recipient of twenty talents. The proofs against him were irrefutable, for he confessed the misdemeanour himself, and sought to excuse it by the paltry and transparent subterfuge that he had taken it to repay himself for twenty talents which he had advanced to the Theoric Fund. But why should he repay himself, without any authorization? out of Alexander's money, for a debt owed him by the Athenian state. There can be little doubt that Demosthenes took the money not for personal gratifications, but for the good of his party. It was all the more necessary for his party to clear themselves from implication in such corrupt transactions. We therefore find Hyperides coming forward as a public prosecutor of Demosthenes. We possess considerable portions of his speech, and we have in its complete form another speech, written for one of the other prosecutors by a miserable hack named Dinarchus. The charges against Demosthenes were twofold. He had taken money, and he had culpably omitted to report the amount of the deposit and the neglect of those who were set to guard it. For the second offence alone he deserved a severe sentence. The judges were not excessively severe, if we consider that his behaviour had placed the city in a most embarrassing position towards Alexander. He was condemned to pay a fine of fifty talents. Unable to pay it, he was imprisoned, but presently effected his escape. It was a venial offence in the eyes of Greece for a statesman to take a bribe, 
provided he did not take it to injure his country. And in the view of public opinion, the moral character of Demosthenes was little damaged by this torturous transaction. He was not on a level with men like Nicias and Phocion, whom millions would not have tempted, but then nobody ever supposed that he was incorruptible. Yet there were two circumstances which aggravated the case. The money of which Demosthenes partook was stolen money, which Athens was about to sequester for Alexander, and he was himself a commissioner responsible for its safety. It was far from being an ordinary case of corruption. If Alexander had lived, the Athenians might have persuaded him to let them remain in occupation of Samos, for he was always disposed to be lenient to Athens. When the tidings of his death came, men almost refused to credit it. The orator Demades forcibly said, if he were indeed dead, the whole world would have smelled of his corpse. The patriots had been building on the slender hopes of some disaster, and the greatest disaster of all had befallen. It had been recognized as madness to defy the power of Alexander, but it did not seem rash to strike for freedom in the unsettled condition of things after his death. Athens revolted from Macedonia. She was joined by Aetolia and many states in northern Greece and she secured the services of a band of eight thousand discharged mercenaries, who had just returned from Alexander's army. One of their captains, the Athenian Leosthenes, occupied Thermopylae, and near that pass the united Greeks gained a slight advantage over Antipater, who had marched southward as soon as he could gather his troops together. The Thessalian cavalry had deserted him, and no state in northern Greece, except Boeotia, remained true to Macedonia. The regent shut himself in the strong hill city of Lamia, which stands over against the pass of Thermopylae under a spur of Othrys, and here he was besieged during the winter by Leosthenes. These successes had gained some adherence to the cause in the Peloponnesus, and, if the Greeks had been stronger at sea, that cause might have triumphed, at least for a while. But the strange thing was, that notwithstanding the improvements of recent years in her naval establishment, Athens seemed to have been able to set afloat no more than a hundred and seventy warships against two hundred and forty of Macedon. The brave general, Leosthenes, was hampered by a council of war, in which the various allies were represented, reminding us of the days of the Persian invasion. Yet, if a fatal stone had not put an end to his life during the beleaguerment, more would probably have been effected for the cause of the allies. In spring, the arrival of Leonatus, governor of Hellespontine Phrygia, at the head of an army, raised the siege of Lamia. The Greeks marched into Thessaly to meet the new army before it united with Antipater. A battle was fought in which the Greeks had the upper hand, and Leonatus was wounded to death. Antipater arrived the next day, and, joining forces with the defeated army, withdrew into Macedonia to await Craterus, who was approaching from the east. When Craterus arrived, they entered Thessaly together, and in an engagement at Cranon, in which the losses on both sides were light, the Macedonians had a slight advantage. This battle apparently decided the war, but the true cause which hindered the Greeks from continuing the struggle was not the insignificant defeat at Cranon, but the want of unity among themselves, the want of a leader whom they entirely trusted. They were forced to make terms singly, each state on its own behoof. Hyperides pronounced a funeral oration distinguished by that lucidity of which he was a perfect master, over those who had fallen in this hopeless war, and gave his due. It is not for us to say that he gave more than his due, to Leosthenes, who succeeded in what he undertook, but not in escaping fate. There is a fine passage which distorts indeed the historical perspective, but well displays the spirit of the patriots. In the dark underworld, suffer us to ask, who are they that will stretch forth a right hand to the captain of our dead? May we not deem that Leosthenes will be granted with welcome and with wonder by those half-gods who bore arms against Troy? Aye, and there I deem will be Miltiades and Themistocles, and those others who made Hellas free to the glory of their names. Athens submitted when Antipater advanced into Boeotia and prepared to invade Attica. She paid dearly for her attempt to win back her power. Antipater was not like Alexander. He was an able man, warmly devoted to the royal house of Macedon, but he did not share in Alexander's sympathies with the Greek culture. He had no soft place in his heart for the memories and traditions of Athens. He saw only that, 
unless strong and stern measures were taken, Macedonia would not be safe against a repetition of the rising which he had suppressed. He therefore imposed three conditions, which Phocion and Demades were obliged to accept. That the democratic constitution should be modified by a property qualification, that a Macedonian garrison should be lodged in Runicia, and that the agitators, Demosthenes, Hyperides, and their friends, should be surrendered. Demosthenes had exerted eloquence in gaining support for the cause of the allies in the Peloponnesus, and his efforts had been rewarded by his recall to Athens. As soon as the city had submitted, he and the other orators fled. Hyperades, with two companions, sought refuge in the temple of Iacus at Aegina, whence they were taken to Antipater and put to death. Demosthenes fled to the temple of Poseidon in the island of Caloria. When the messengers of Antipater appeared and summoned him forth, he swallowed poison, which he had concealed, according to one story, in a pen, and was thus delivered from falling into the hands of the executioner. The constitutional change which was carried out at the direction of the Macedonian general would have been judged by Aristotle an improvement. The institutions were not changed, but the democracy was converted into a polity, or limited democracy, such as Theramenes had striven for, by a restriction of the franchise. All citizens whose property amounted to less than two thousand drachmae were deprived of their civic rights. It is said that this measure erased twelve thousand names from the burgher lists, and that nine thousand citizens remained. A large number of the poorer people thus disfranchised left Attica and settled in Thrace, where Antipater gave them land. Perhaps these settlers included some of the outdwellers of Samos, who were now turned adrift, being obliged to quit the island and make way for the rightful possessors. Section 7. Aristotle and Alexander It was through an accident that Alexander was brought into contact with the one other man of his time whose genius was destined to move the world. Aristotle's father had been court physician of Amintas II, and Aristotle was meant to follow his father's profession. At the age of seventeen he went to Athens, where he was under the guardianship of a certain Proxenus, to whose son Nicanor, the same Nicanor who made public Alexander's edict at Olympia, he afterwards betrothed his only daughter. At first Aristotle studied in the school of Isocrates, but when Plato returned from Sicily he came under the influence of that philosopher's idealism, and this decided him for the life of speculation, which he regards, and it is the deliberate judgment of his mature years, as the only life that is perfectly happy. After Plato's death he spent some years on the northeastern coast of the Aegean, at Assos and Mytilene, and then received the call from Philip to undertake the education of the crown prince. As yet he had won no eminent reputation for wisdom or learning, and Philip probably chose him because his father had been connected with the Macedonian court. The instruction which Aristotle imparted to Alexander was perhaps chiefly literary and philological. He came as a tutor, not as a philosopher. We know nothing of the mutual relations between the brilliant master and his brilliant pupil. They were men of different and hardly sympathetic tempers. We may suspect that Aristotle was fainer to curb than spur the ardent straining spirit of Alexander. Certainly the episode led to no such maintenance of intimacy afterwards as it might have led to if Plato had been the teacher. On his return to Athens, Aristotle founded his school of philosophy, and the Lyceum soon took the place formerly occupied by the Academy, which ever since the discomforting adventures in Sicily had withdrawn itself more and more from the public attention. He taught for twelve or thirteen years, and these were doubtless the time of his most effective philosophical activity and died not long after the death of Alexander. Never were there more wonderful years than these, in which the brains of Alexander and Aristotle were ceaselessly working. It is not an overstatement to say that there is no one to whom Europe owes a greater debt for the higher education of her peoples than to Aristotle. The science of the laws of thought is still taught mainly as he first worked it out. There are no better introductions to ethical and political speculation than his fundamental treatises on ethical and political science. Nor was it a small thing that his system controlled the acutest minds of the Middle Ages, whose reasoning faculties, though cabined by the imminence of a narrowly interpreted theology, were amazingly powerful and subtle. But Aristotle, supreme as he was in abstract reasoning, 
zealous as he was in collecting and appreciating concrete facts, was not without prejudices. As a boy, in the narrow self-satisfied community of little remote Stagira, he had imbibed the dislike which was openly or secretly felt towards Athens in all the Chalcidian regions. And though he established his abode at Athens, he never overcame this distrust. He always remained a citizen of Stagira and lived in Athens as a stranger. This initial prejudice prevented him from ever judging with perfect impartiality the Athenian institutions, which he took as the type of democracy. He was also prejudiced against Macedonia. The Chalcidians looked upon their Macedonian neighbours as far below themselves in civilization, and Aristotle's experience of the court of Pella, where he must have been a spectator of the scandalous quarrels between Philip and Olympias, did not create a favourable impression. He was thus disposed to hold his sympathies entirely aloof from the enterprises of Alexander. But not only did he not sympathise, he disapproved, for he was wedded to the idea of the small Greek Republic. He condemned the larger state. Moreover, he held firmly to the Hellenic conviction that Hellenes were superior by nature to peoples of other race. And he was thus opposed to the most original and enlightened feature of Alexander's policy, the ruling of Greeks and barbarians on an equality. Owing to this attitude of coldness and distrust towards the Macedonians, he missed a great opportunity. Alexander's expedition threw open to science a new field of discovery in natural history, and we can imagine what endless pains the king would have given himself if Aristotle's urged him to collect extensive observations on the animal and vegetable kingdoms in the various countries and climates through which he passed. It is a strange sensation to pass from the view of the state which Alexander was fashioning to the sketch of an ideal state which was drawn by the most thoughtful of men at the same time. Aristotle desires a little north country city, situated in a compact, defensible territory, close to the sea and yet not on the coast, having a harbour within easy reach, but quite disconnected, so that the precincts of the city may not be contaminated and its indwellers troubled by the presence of a motley crowd of outlanders, cheapmen and mariners, such as throng a seaport's quays. He will not have his city a centre of trade. It is to import and export only for the purposes of its own strict needs. It is to be a tiny city, the number of the burghers so limited that each one may be able to know all about each of the others. The burghers are to have equal rights. Their early manhood is to be spent on military duties. When they come to middle life they are to be eligible for political offices. In their old age they are to act as priests. Subject to the citizen aristocracy, but entirely excluded from the franchise, are to be the artisans and merchants. Part of the land is to be public the yields to be devoted to maintaining the worship of the gods and providing the public meals of the city. Part is to be the private property of the citizens, and the fields are to be tilled by slaves or labourers of non-Hellenic race. Such was the little exclusive community which Aristotle designed, while his former pupil was settling in motion schemes for worldwide commerce, shattering the barriers which sundered nation from nation, building an empire which should include millions, founding cities composed of men of diverse races, hewing his way through a maze of new political problems which were beyond Aristotle's horizon. The Republic of Aristotle's wish is not quickened like Plato's by striking original ideas. It is a commonplace Greek aristocracy with its claws cut, carefully trimmed and pruned, refined by a punctilious education without any expensive vitality, and like Sparta leaving no room for the free development of the individual citizens. If the cities of Hellas had been moulded and fashioned on the model of the city of the philosopher's wish, they would hardly have done what they did for European civilization. We may wonder whether Aristotle divined before his death that the Hellenic cities were not to have the last word in the history of men. More probably the untimely end of Alexander reassured him that the old fashion of things would soon go on again as before. The brilliant day of the Greek city-states had indeed drawn to a close, so suddenly that they could not be expected to grasp the fact, and no people that has ever borne the torch of civilization has been willing, or even able, to recognize that the hour of relinquishing sovereignty has come. The Greeks may well be excused if they were reluctant to acquiesce in the vicissitude which forced them to sink into a subordinate place, but it is thus that the austere laws of history reward the meritorious. The republics of Greece had performed an imperishable work. They had shown mankind many things, and above all, the most precious thing in the world, 
fearless freedom of thought. End of chapter 18, part 7 End of A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 2, by John Bagnall Bury